The story begins with Siolhui, who is badly injured, contemplating the need for power as he observes his teammates preparing for a fight. He urges them to run away and leave him behind. Zhang Miangi, the master of the Mount Hua sect, arrives and attacks both of them, ultimately killing them. The boy desires immense power, the kind that no one could defeat, as he watches Zhang Miangi approaching. He acknowledges Zhang Yonggi as the most powerful warrior he knows, realizing he stands no chance against him. Despite joining the demon cult and undergoing intense training for the past few years, he finds it unfair to be injured and doesn't want to die. Thoughts of wanting better techniques or advantages cross his mind as he feels the unfairness of his impending demise. Desperately, he attempts to check his status window but sees nothing. The realization that he might be hallucinating hits him as he encounters a message offering three options, continue, load save point, and restart. Meanwhile, he attempts to restart and reflects as his mind fades away. As his eyes begin to close, he keeps repeating to himself that he doesn't want to die and wishes to live. He ponders over the writing he sees. A notification informs him that he has chosen to restart. Contemplating its meaning, he checks the notification details, revealing that he is now returning to the private meeting with the Lord of the Great Imperial Pavilion at the start of the chain of events. He acknowledges that he had no clue at that time. Sialhui regains consciousness in a dungeon, stating his name. He hopes to learn demonic martial arts even if it means a shorter life as he had joined the demon cult. Reflecting on his past, he notes that instead of studying martial arts, he spent the last few years on scouting or recon missions, and now he finds himself dead. He exclaims that life is so unfair while exhaling deeply as he wakes up in bed, looks around, and thinks, wait a minute, isn't this the training camp? Contemplating the situation, he believes he is dead as he recalls all the incidents involving his fights with Zhang Myung-gi. Attempting to walk out, he wonders if he dreamt the whole thing it felt so real. He believes it's all his fault, blaming Guai Sama, the lord of the Great Imperial Pavilion. Remembering Guai Sama's instructions to scout out the area, with the deputy commander leading the mission, he questions what is happening. Chixin and Captain Jiak Myung follow him, and Captain Jiak Myung asks if this is where he has been hiding, questioning what is going on. Seol Hui looks at him and thinks that Chixin is a member of the Black Moon Company, which is under the direct command of Guai Sama. Sialhui punches him and throws him away. Chixin apologizes, stating that his hand slipped. He then leans in and questions Lieutenant Xiaohui, asking if he is still half asleep and has forgotten who he is talking to. Chixin introduces Captain Jiakmyung, saying this is Captain Jiakmyung of the Black Moon Company. He acknowledges this information, remembering the situation, which is even more shocking than the pain in his gut. Recalling the incident, he thinks, wait, didn't this already happen before? If he remembers correctly, the next thing he says is about lacking skills. Chixin responds, saying that if Xiaohui doesn't have the skills, he should at least learn to show some respect. Captain Jiakmyung approaches and remarks that he has some nerve. Xiaohui inquires about the reason for his visit, addressing him as six. Captain Jiakmyung replies that Lord Guai Sama is looking for him, instructing him to go see Guai Sama. As Captain Jiakmyung turns and walks out, he adds one more thing. Siolhui is very lucky. Chixin laughs at him and teases him while he attempts to get up, and then he verbally abuses him. He believes he outranks him, but acknowledges that he can't do anything to him with Captain Jiakmyung present. He swears to himself, thinking that someday he'll get back at Chixin, but he pauses when he observes their lifelines. Chixin has one life and Captain Jiakmyung has two lives. Walking with them, he experiences goosebumps all over his body. He expresses disbelief, stating that this can't be happening and that it doesn't make any sense. Reflecting on the events, he notes that everything unfolded exactly as he remembered and struggles to understand what is happening. He wonders if he was really dreaming or if he somehow glimpsed the future, concluding that no, it was definitely real, or at least it felt that way. He stands in front of Guai Sama, greeting him and stating this is Lieutenant Sialhui of the Flying Company, officially requesting an audience. He reflects on the moment, feeling like he has gone back to before he died, recalling his restart option notification and his severe condition. He identifies Guai Sama, who is enjoying tea, as the one responsible for his death. Looking at Guai Sama, the lord of the great imperial pavilion, he attributes all of it to him, saying he was informed that Guai Sama wished to speak with him. He recalls that Cho and Dang, the lord of the tumultuous sky pavilion, is also present, just as he remembered. 
he contemplates that the headquarters of the demon cult is a place known as the Crimson Demon Palace, overseeing five pavilions under its command. He reflects on each lord being a great martial art master, and Guai Sama, the lord of the Great Imperial Pavilion, is a master of the fire mass demon style. He recalls that even a slight exposure to its heat is sufficient to melt bones, and Guai Sama also has a notorious temper. He believes that if he does anything to irritate him, Guai Sama will slaughter him like an animal. Despite his lack of trust while looking at Guai Sama, he acknowledges that he has no other choice but to obey him. Guai Sama identifies him as the boy he was mentioning, stating that his name is Xiaohui. Cho In Dang takes a sip of tea and inquires if that is correct. Guai Samba remarks that Xiaohui must be quite talented, although he doesn't bow very low to his elders. Meanwhile, Xiaohui bows down in front of them, apologizing for his carelessness. He mentions that Lord Guai Sama instructed him to nod when entering the office. Lord Guai Sama clarifies that he didn't intend for him to bow and laugh, advising him not to be too hard on the boy. He explains that if they treat him coldly like that, Xiaohui might think he has to greet him in the same manner every time he enters the office. Not certain about how formal to be around Lord Cho and Dang, Lord Guai Sama acknowledges that it's a bit confusing. Xiaohui, still bowing down, thinks to himself about his contradictory instructions, recalling that Guai Sama had clearly stated to greet him in that manner just four days ago. Despite his confusion, Lord Guai Sama tells him to get up. Xiaohui feels like they are enjoying humiliating him as he rises. Lord Guai Sama takes another sip of his drink and says anyway, enough about that. Lord Guai Sama inquires if Xiaohui would be interested in working as a secretary in the Heavenly Sun Archive. Xiaohui, curious about what the Heavenly Sun Archive entails, thinks that Guai Sama seems to be finally getting to the point. Guai Sama mentions that Xiaohui appears eager to learn martial arts, so he decided to offer this opportunity specifically for him. Xiaohui recalls how he was tricked before, thinking about the Heavenly Sun Archive where they store hundreds of thousands of martial art tomes. Lord Guai Sama states that if he wants the job, he'll have to earn it. He presents a mission for him, explaining that he needs him to go on a reconnaissance mission in the Mount Hua Sex territory. Xiaohui believes this could be a second chance from the gods and contemplates making up an excuse to avoid the mission, determined not to die again this time. Xiaohui announces that he has something to say as he checks the status window, which displays several options. Firstly, he will gladly accept any mission they have for him. Secondly, he would prefer a different mission. And thirdly, he is willing to cut off his right arm for them, accompanied by a set of numerical codes. Perplexed, he wonders about the situation, unable to move, and observes the surroundings freezing. He contemplates the peculiar occurrence, realizing that time has stopped, confirming it's not a dream, and concluding that he has truly died and returned to the past. Puzzled by a flashing thing, he questions if it's a counter, noticing it's decreasing. Examining his status window, he determines it to be a timer or a mechanism compelling him to make a choice. Recognizing that time is running out, he realizes he must make a decision soon. Examining the options once more, he realizes that he cannot cut off his right arm, and if he accepts Lord Guai Sama's mission, he will die. Consequently, he chooses the second option, expressing his desire for a different mission. As he makes this decision, a bright light appears, capturing the attention of Lord Guai Sama and Cho In Dang. Xiaohui, surprised, vocalizes that he would like a different mission, unintentionally putting his hand on his mouth. Lord Guai Sama, standing up and growing angry, demands to know what Xiaohui just said. He expresses frustration, stating that he didn't even reveal the details of the mission, yet Xiaohui dares to request a different one. Enraged, Lord Guai Sama employs his fire skill on Xiaohui, who becomes frightened, realizing the unbearable heat of the legendary fire mass demon style. The intensity feels suffocating, and he senses a monstrous bite on his neck. Recognizing the urgency, he understands that he needs to act soon as he observes the demonic eyes of Lord Guai Sama. Suddenly, Hyukbai arrives and attempts to stab Xiaohui, but Lord Guai Sama intervenes, freezing her in place. Xiaohui reflects on where she came from, grateful that Guai Sama stopped her just in time. He considers that a second later, she would have taken his head right off, leaving him with no time to react. As Hyukbai retrieves her sword, Xiaohui gazes at her, realizing that she is his bodyguard. Lord Guai Sama resumes his seat and declares that they should first hear what Xiaohui has to say, and then he'll decide whether or not to kill him. 
he bowed down again and explains that there seemed to be a misunderstanding regarding his request for a different mission. He did not mean to come across as picky. Lord Guai Sama questions why he requested the first place. Xiao Hui responds, stating that he has heard recent rumors about members of the Mount Hua sect gathering in the Hanum borderland. Meanwhile, he contemplates that the only way Lord Guai Sama will permit him to live is by complying with his desires, which typically involve eliminating adversaries in the Mount Hua sect. He wonders if this is considered the demon cult's sacred duty. He thinks that Lord Guai Sama is just listening, and he reiterates that he was hoping to seize this opportunity, highlighting that the Flying Hand Company is specially trained for reconnaissance and scouting. He proposes that if Lord Guai Sama informs him about the deployment of the demon cult's top fighters, he will willingly join them on their mission. Lord Guai Sama listens attentively, and Xiao Hui hopes that his proposal is enticing. Meanwhile, Cho In Dang takes a sip of tea and laughs, suggesting that it appears the Plum Spring Pavilion may have leaked some information. Otherwise, how would a mere lieutenant have heard rumors about that? Lord Guai Sama turns toward Xiao Hui and remarks on the coincidence, stating that the mission he was about to assign aligns precisely with his proposal. He reiterates that the deputy commander himself will be present, emphasizing the need for someone to scout out the area, specifically at the Hamgok Pass. The goal is to gather information on who is there and understand the terrain. Lord Guai Sama instructs Xiao Hui to go, inspect the surroundings, and report back to the leader of the Flying Hand Company. Xiao Hui agrees, and Lord Guai Samba replies now to get going while taking a sip of tea. He exhales, acknowledging that he wasn't killed, and walks out, passing near Hukbai. He looks at her status screen and notices the number above her head again, realizing that she has four lives. After a while, Xiao Hui arrives at a river, splashing water on his face as he reflects on what just happened. Despite finding it hard to believe, he acknowledges that he has to accept the reality of the situation. As he gazes at his reflection in the water, he wonders about the inexplicable events unfolding around him. Contemplating the mysterious circumstances, he notes that he only has one coin, signifying his last chance. Getting up, he walks away, recalling Lord Guai Sama's instructions to scout out the Hamgok Pass, assess the terrain, and report back to the leader of the Flying Hand Company. He remembers that this was the same directive from the last time, but no one else showed up, and even their retreat was blocked, leading to a devastating outcome. Considering his options, he wonders if he should run away to the Central Plains. However, he dismisses the idea, realizing it won't work. Despite the challenges, he acknowledges that he has already studied the demonic martial arts, leaving him with a sense of inevitability about the situation. He contemplates that he can't conceal the dark, sinister energy within him, recognizing that trained members of the demon cult could easily sense it from miles away. Acknowledging that he wouldn't last long if exposed to the outside world, he envisions being hunted down and killed eventually. Feeling doomed, he walks forward, uncertain about what to do and sensing that his fate is sealed, no matter the choices he makes. Chixin notices him and remarks on hearing about his significant mission, attributing it to his fault for snooping around Lord Guai Sama's office. He suggests he should have been more careful and laughs, mentioning he was talking to himself. Xiao Hui, overhearing, adds one more life to his count and walks away. Recalling Lord Guai Sama's potential threat to kill him, he also remembers that Hukbai has four lives. He Xiao Hui responds negatively, stating that he needs to check something, to which Chixin irritably asks what he wants to check. Xiao Hui swiftly runs toward him, drawing his sword, ready to attack. Chixin also unsheathes his sword, blocking his initial strike. Questioning his actions, Chixin pushes him back, but he persists, launching repeated attacks. In the course of their exchange, he manages to land a cut on his thigh, causing him to bleed. Angrily, Chixin asks why he went through Lord Guai Sama's office, and he explains that he hoped to find something to help him become stronger. Expressing frustration that no one is providing him with answers, Xiao Hui continues to attack Chixin, who blocks each strike. During the confrontation, Xiao Hui contemplates the third basic technique of black demon swordsmanship, feeling a twinge of fear. Chixin questions if he has lost his mind and wonders if he believes he can get away with such actions. Meanwhile, he indifferent to the consequences, decides to attack again. Despite his determination, Chixin manages to block his assault. Xiao Hui reflects on his hard work to reach this point and is unwilling to let it end like this. He resolves to find a way to survive, recalling a past severe injury and refusing to face death again. Xiao Hui launches another attack, 
kicking him away, and he cries out in pain. Siolhui realizes that the writing above his head indicates he has one life. Considering this as a means of survival, he is certain that it has to be the way. As they both prepare for another round of attacks, Chixin starts trembling and expresses concern about Captain Jiaknyong finding out about the situation. Xiaohui stabs him, and a crow witnesses the entire scene before flying away. Chixin's sword falls, and he collapses. Xiaohui remembers Chixin's irritating smile and acknowledges that he has killed him, confirming it as he looks at Chixin. Xiaohui realizes there's no turning back now. He wraps Chixin's body, ties it with a large stone, and throws it into the river. Upon Chixin's death, the words above his head disappear. However, nothing about Siolhui seems to have changed until he sees his reflection in the river. He tries to observe his reflection, confirming that he now has one coin and one last chance. His status updates show that he has two coins, giving him two chances. Excitedly, he exclaims look at that, it's changed now. Siolhui and other participants sit in a boat, traveling to an undisclosed location. As he observes the surroundings, he thinks that the rapid and steep cliffs make it an ideal place to travel in secret. Recalling Lord Guai Sama's directive to scout the Hamgok Pass and report back to the leader of the Flying Hand Company, Siolhui realizes he is back in this situation. Reflecting on the past, he acknowledges that even if he had stayed behind, Jiokmyong would have killed him. Upon reaching their destination and disembarking from the boat, Siolhui gazes at his reflection in the water. Noticing that he now has two coins, signifying two life chances, he acknowledges the presence of the writing above his head. The inscription changed after Chixin died, but he couldn't comprehend its meaning. Meanwhile, Su Jin Chiao, the commander of the Flying Hand Company, addresses Lieutenant Xiaohui and approaches him. Xiaohui responds with a respectful yes, commander, and bows down. She informs him that there are members of the Mount Hua sect in the vicinity and instructs him to stay vigilant. Su Jin Chiol emphasizes that once he determines the number of enemies and the terrain, he should return promptly. Siolhui contemplates that Su Jin Chiol is the commander responsible for three squads of the Flying Hand Company, yet she is not leading the reconnaissance mission herself. She urges him to stop standing around and to get moving. Siolhui then instructs the other participants to follow him, and they all run into the woods, leaving Su Jin Chiol behind. Reflecting on the situation, Siolhui realizes that everything happened quickly the last time, and upon closer consideration, he senses that something is not right. He entertains two possible explanations for the discrepancy. Siolhui contemplates whether Lord Guai Sama gave Su Jin Chiu special orders, or if she is secretly collaborating with the Mount Hua sect. Meanwhile, he directs his teammates, saying let's head down to the right. Confused, his teammates inquire about his instructions. Xiaohui shouts back, clarifying that they are indeed going down, urging them to move. One of the girls questions if they are supposed to go left, and another confirms this, expressing curiosity about his decision. Xiaohui recalls the previous attempt when the Mount Hua sect ambushed them, realizing it seemed like they knew about their arrival. He is determined not to be slaughtered like a wild animal, emphasizing that this is not why he joined the demon cult. Reflecting on the past when they brought many logs at once, too heavy for anyone to carry, he becomes resolute in his determination. Contemplating his two coins and two chances, Sialhui wonders whether this signifies two chances or if it implies this is his second to last opportunity. As they approach a house, he issues a command to halt, and they all conceal themselves behind the bushes to observe the dwelling. A person with yellow hair inquires about their next move, while another suggests that someone might be keeping an eye on them. Siolhui curses his bad timing, realizing that running past the guard post would arouse suspicion among the other squad members. He decides to personally check the guard post and instructs the others to alert him immediately if they hear anything. Concerned about the possibility that the building might be a lookout post, he acknowledges that an ordinary lookout can be easily defeated by a first-rate martial artist, but if the lookout is a warrior wielding a powerful sword like Arua, he would be in trouble. Hoping that the house is empty, they reach it and peer inside through the windows. Meanwhile, the man with yellow hair announces that there is no one present, prompting Xiaohui to ponder his next move. He contemplates whether he should head for the Central Plains, acknowledging that returning to the demon cult after killing Chixin is not an option. A girl quietly mentions that Lieutenant Xiaohui is acting strangely today, with her teammate agreeing and noting that he appears preoccupied. 
the yellow-haired individual suggests that whoever is guarding the place will likely return soon, proposing that they inspect the terrain and report back to Commander Sujin Chiol. However, Siolhui remains silent. The man calls him Lieutenant Siolhui again, while he reflects on the squad members bombarding him with questions, unable to provide any answers. As his status window notifies him of an enemy's appearance and prompts him to decide on a course of action, he considers his options. Fighting the enemy, attempting to talk to them first, or escaping since they are no match. He has ten seconds to make a decision. He contemplates the need for another choice, questioning why and for what reason. He wonders when an enemy appears, not seeing any adversaries in his vicinity. Realizing he didn't hear any sounds, he acknowledges the urgency of the situation, recognizing the need to decide as time rapidly elapses. Siolhui ponders whether there truly is an enemy nearby. He concludes that if it's someone he didn't even hear approaching, they wouldn't stand a chance against him anyway. He opts to select let's try talking to them first and proceeds with that choice. The yellow-haired person once again calls out to him, instructing him to reveal himself while they cover each other and prepare for a potential confrontation. Siolhui confidently affirms that he knew there wasn't anyone around, remarking that someone is quite observant. After a while, Zhang Myong-gi intervenes, positioning himself between them. Siolhui wonders how he, the most powerful warrior in the vicinity, got involved. Recognizing Zhang Myong-gi as the ultimate master of the Mihua sword technique and the leader of the Mount Hua sect, Siolhui contemplates his unexpected presence. Zhang Myong-gi comments on their recognition of him, referring to himself as the demon cult's number one threat. Perplexed, Siolhui questions his presence and the deviation from their mission's intended path. Siolhui inquires about what's happening and how he knew they were in the area. He denies understanding Siolhui's inquiry, asserting that they were the ones who walked into the area he was patrolling. Siolhui questions the concept of patrolling and seeks clarification from Zhang Myong-gi, wondering why he claims to have been patrolling the area. He dismisses further conversation, stating that regardless of his purpose, the demon cult members are all dead. He unsheathes his sword, prompting him and his teammates to prepare for a fight. Siolhui reflects that, deep down, a part of him might have sensed this outcome. Despite knowing that his life may not change, whether he dies now or later, he still harbors a glimmer of hope. Recalling the previous time when they all perished because of Zhang Myong-gi, Siolhui anticipates a similar outcome. Despite the challenges he has faced, he holds on to the hope that things might improve someday, remembering the struggles from the last encounter. He approaches him, and Siolhui, realizing he doesn't want to die, urges everybody to run. Siolhui and his teammates scramble away, with Zhang Myong-gi in pursuit. He comments on their slow pace, hurls his sword towards him, and impales him, simultaneously dispatching the other teammates. Closing in on Siolhui, he berates him, questioning his leadership abilities and deeming him pathetic. Siolhui inquires about how he knew he was their leader, Zhang Myong-gi feigns ignorance, grabbing his hair and drawing nearer, demanding an explanation. Siolhui insists that he must have known they were coming, providing the only plausible explanation. He presses him to reveal how he knew Siolhui was there, forcefully demanding an answer. Siolhui reflects on how obvious it seemed, acknowledging that he tracked them down too quickly, suggesting he knew exactly when they would arrive. He concludes that Zhang Myong-gi couldn't have found them otherwise. Meanwhile, Zhang Myong-gi states that he guesses he might as well tell him since he's already done for. He suggests thinking about it, mentioning that one of them gets to add a few more kills to their record, and the other gets rid of someone who was becoming a nuisance a good deal for both sides. He comments that he sure is something else, imagining a member of the demon cult disobeying his superior. Siolhui starts trembling and bleeding profusely as Zhang Myong-gi asks him what this is and remarks, look at that, a disciple of the demon cult crying like a baby. Zhang Myong-gi insists that Siolhui should be thanking him, as he gave him a nice little boost to his kill count. He stands up, waves his sword in the air, and declares well, so long, Lieutenant Siolhui, preparing to attack. He thinks desperately, pleading that he can't die like this and that it's too unfair. He wishes for just one more chance, begging in front of him. However, Zhang Myong-gi doesn't listen and proceeds to attack and kill him. After a while, Siolhui wakes up again in another place and receives a message that he still has one chance remaining. He wants to decide whether to continue, load save points or restart. He still has a countdown of 10 seconds and time starts to go down. He thinks he can't start over again from the beginning, so he clicks on the restart option. He thinks that even if he goes back, 
there's no guarantee it will be any different this time. He looks at the load save point option and asks about it. He checks the save point's details, moments from his life stored in an empty save point. He receives another message stating that he doesn't have any data saved, returning to the previous screen. He wonders what all this means and thinks he's running out of time. He says he has chosen to continue but finds himself unable to do so. The system warns him that he can't continue either when his opponent completely overpowers him or when they can't be persuaded verbally. He receives another notification stating that Zhang Yongdi, the master of the Mount Hua sect, his opponent, has six types of attacks. While he acknowledges that someone is quite observant, he sees. He also checks his status screen, revealing that he is lieutenant of the Flying Hand Company, Xiaohui, and he has only two types of attacks. The system notifies him that he can't defeat this opponent, now returning to the home screen. He thinks that he doesn't have a choice and can only restart. This is his only option. The system notifies him again that he is now returning to the private meeting with the Lord of the Great Imperial Pavilion at the start of the chain of events. After a while, he wakes up in his bed at the training camp again, laughs and asks if he is being possessed or something. He says he almost wishes he were if that meant he could stay alive. He thinks he can't stay here because those two will be here any minute now and quickly runs out. Chixin and Jiakmyong reach there, with Chixin saying he thought he was there, looking around, and asking where did he go. Siolhui hides there, listening to them, and he thinks he's not sure if it's because he already killed him once, but the writing above Chixin's head is gone. He thinks he guesses that means he can only get lives from people once. If that's the case, then he only has one life left now, noticing he has one coin and a last chance again. He thinks he needs to get stronger, bunches his hand with full force, and thinks he's going to get as strong as he possibly can. He recalls Zhang Yonggi, Lord Guai Sama, Cho In Dang, and Jiak Myung and thinks he's going to stay alive, no matter what it takes. The system notifies him that it's now restarting. Siolhui runs out from the training camp barefooted. When he goes far away, he takes a break, breathing heavily, and looks in a shop window mirror. He sees that he has only one coin and a last chance of survival. He asks himself what he is going to do now, thinking he's surrounded by enemies. He has to fight an opponent that he can't avoid or defeat, and he needs to think of something. He starts running again and reaches in front of Lord Guai Sama and Cho In Dang. He bows down in front of them, greets them, and says he is Lieutenant Xiaohui of the Flying Hand Company. He was told that they wanted to speak with him. He thinks all this began with that screen that appeared, which notifies him that he is now returning to the private meeting with the Lord of the Great Imperial Pavilion at the start of this chain of events. He thinks there must be a clue in there somewhere, and he's not running away. Meanwhile, Lord Guai Sama identifies the boy he recently mentioned, introducing him as Xiaohui. Cho and Dang inquires if that's correct, noting that he appears very promising. Lord Guai Sama chuckles, expressing his satisfaction with Cho and Dang's positive impression. Xiaohui observes the interaction, considering that it differs from the last encounter. He wonders if it's because he bowed first this time and Lord Guai Sama refrained from criticism. Lord Guai Sama, taking a sip of tea, raises the topic once again, asking Xiaohui if he would be interested in working as a secretary in the Heavenly Sun Archive. Xiaohui becomes irritated, recognizing the repetition of the offer from the previous encounter. Despite his irritation, he bows again, apologizing and expressing that such an honor is too great for someone like him, as he doesn't deserve such a privilege. Lord Guai Sama, unfazed, takes another sip of tea and inquires about Xiaohui's reluctance, stating that he has a mission for him. He promptly responds that he has something to tell Lord Guai Sama and realizes he has been anticipating this moment. The system notifies him of three options, he wants to accept any mission, he would like a different mission, or he'll cut off his right arm. He contemplates his choices, acknowledging that the first two options are dead ends based on his past experiences. Consequently, he decides to choose the only remaining option to cut off his right arm for Lord Guai Sama. Xiaohui informs Lord Guai Sama of his willingness to sacrifice his right arm, recognizing it as his sole option at the moment. Lord Guai Sama reacts with surprise, questioning the origin of this decision. Xiaohui acknowledges that there's no way around it and expresses his curiosity about the outcome. He further explains that he has been reflecting on his previous arrogance in seeking to learn advanced techniques before being adequately prepared, recalling an instance when he browsed a bookshelf. He admits that he was so desperate to learn that he even searched Lord Guai Sama's office without permission, 
and that's why he wants to make this sacrifice. Bowing down once again, he expresses that he doesn't deserve to live and wishes to demonstrate his loyalty. Cho In Dang remarks that he is even more amusing than described. Meanwhile, Lord Guai Sama taps on the table with his fingers lost in thought. Suddenly, he pauses, throws a dagger in front of him, and invites him to proceed. Xiao Hui takes the dagger, thinking that if he can get through this just once, he'll find a way to survive. Placing the dagger at his shoulder, he attempts to cut his arm, yelling in pain and starting to bleed. Lord Guai Sama interrupts, stating that it's enough. Hukbai arrives, throwing the dagger away. Siolhui wonders if she stopped him before he could finish cutting off his arm, feeling relieved as he sees her four lives status window. Siolhui realizes that at least he still has his arm, but he can't move it as he bleeds profusely. Lord Guai Sama laughs, asking Cho and Dang to witness this, and inquires if he wants to see something else. Chuckling, he expresses his amusement at Siolhui's spirit, stating that he has never seen anyone like him in all his years in the demon cult. Lord Guai Samba rises from his place, presenting Xiaohui with a badge of the Heavenly Sun Archive. He reminds Xiaohui that he previously expressed a desire to work in the Heavenly Sun Archive and encourages him to head over there. Xiaohui takes the badge, realizing that this is the option he chose among the three. Bowing down, he expresses gratitude, promising never to forget the graciousness bestowed upon him. Lord Guai Sama confirms, warning him not to forget, while Siolhui thinks the last option is likely the only way for him to survive. He gets up and walks out, bidding them farewell as they both laugh at him. After a while, he reflects on how he now knows for sure that the options always contain a way to stay alive, vowing never to forget this lesson. With a hand on his wound, he walks out, expressing frustration and hurling abuses at both of them. He arrives at the Heavenly Sun Archive and presents the badge, Du Hong at the archive asks for his name. He responds that his name is Xiaohui, revealing his age as 27. Du Hong inquires about his experience, and Xiaohui states he spent eight years in the Flying Hand Company. Reviewing his documents, Du Hong notes that he ranked 12th among 1,000 trainees at Skyward Basic Training Camp. Xiaohui wonders why a high ranking warrior like him is in a place like this. Du Hong then questions him about his arm, to which Xiaohui replies that it was due to a little accident. Du Hong further asks how such an accident could happen, noticing the recommendation from Lord Guai Sama. He rises from his seat, thinking that it's none of his business, and instructs him to accompany him. They descend the stairs, and he informs Xiaohui that this is where he will be working, responsible for managing the books. Xiaohui casually remarks, wow, that's an easy job. Du Hong clarifies that his task involves sorting and shelving the books, emphasizing that if any books get damaged, he will be held responsible. Du Hong notices his silence and questions if there is a problem. Xiaohui quickly denies any issue. Du Hong continues, explaining that his first task is to sort the books by category. Xiaohui contemplates that Guai Sama and Cho In Dang probably have no clue, as most of these martial arts tomes are basic guides or useless books. He doubts that they would store tomes on truly advanced martial arts in a place like this. Xiaohui, however, is not interested in anything too advanced. He just wants to find a tome that will teach him how to defeat Guai Sama. Observing his status, he notes the addition of one life, thinking that even if this life doesn't end well, he can always try again in the next one. Curious about his strength, he calls out to him, and Du Hong turns his face toward him. Xiaohui gazes at Du Hong, contemplating whether he could defeat him. With his right arm rendered useless, he swiftly thrusts his sword towards Du Hong. Du Hong reacts by berating him, questioning if he has lost his mind. Xiaohui examines the situation and thinks he didn't stab hard enough, surmising that Du Hong is likely as strong as Chixin. Preparing for a fight, Du Hong brandishes his dagger and demands to know what Xiaohui thinks he's doing. Xiaohui recognizes the urgency of ending this confrontation swiftly. Slashing his sword through the air, he believes that prolonging the fight would only worsen his situation. Initiating an attack, he aims for Du Hong, who manages to evade his strikes and advances, seizing Xiaohui around the waist. Realizing the disadvantage of his incapacitated right arm, they both tumble to the ground, and Du Hong exploits the opportunity to press on his wound and stab him with his dagger. Meanwhile, he emerges from his imagination, recognizing that in his current condition, there's no assurance that he can surpass him. Du Hong turns his face towards him and inquires about what it is and what he wants to say. 
Siolhui responds that he simply wanted to express his anticipation of working together and presents some tokens. He mentions the cooling weather and Du Hong's apparent hard work, expressing gratitude with a small token. Du Hong interrupts, asking if this is what he thinks it is. Siolhui wonders if he doesn't accept bribes. Du Hong commends him for being quick and predicts success in his role. He advises Siolhui to avoid drawing too much attention if he intends to stay around for a while. He adds a caution about monsters roaming the area before stepping out. After a while, Siolhui contemplates that in order to escape this place and seek revenge on them, he needs extra lives. He reminisces about Lord Guai Sama and Cho and Deng, then begins gathering books. However, he ponders how he can defeat Du Hong with his arm in its current state. Despite sorting books for hours, there are still mountains of them left. He picks up a book, looks inside and questions what the term deep inside is supposed to mean. While flipping through the pages, he discreetly hides the book inside his shirt, expressing understanding. The system then notifies him about which type of martial art he would like to learn, prompting him to question why it's asking him that all of a sudden. He notices a shining book, takes it, and contemplates that he can move through time, realizing that time didn't stop. He inquires about a guide to Samsuan and receives a message asking which type of martial art he would like to learn. The options include the Sohui school, which is available, the Jiaksu school, which is unavailable, and the Chojuk school, which is also not available. Pondering these choices, he believes that the Chojuk school is connected to the Sama school, specifically the fire mass demon style that Guai Sama mastered. Considering the Jiaksu school's reputation, especially since former deputy commander Yomgi Gao learned it, he laughs and settles on one martial art tome. However, he wonders why some of these options are unavailable and questions the consequences of choosing the Chojuk school. The system notifies him that he cannot learn the Chojuk school technique due to an injured right arm. Undeterred, he reassures himself that there is still one option remaining the Sohui school. Although unsure of what it entails, he assumes it must be powerful since it is listed alongside other famous techniques. The system then informs him that he has selected the Sohui school and prompts him to choose a style from the available options. Sword technique, hand technique, and foot technique. Contemplating the possibility of learning all the techniques, he concludes that there isn't much to ponder and decides to initiate his learning journey with the sword technique. The system informs him that he has chosen the sword technique and will now be presented with a video. Curious about the content of the video, he observes a warrior's shadow in front of him and questions if it is indeed a shadow. He reflects on the sudden appearance of this shadow, noting that it doesn't merely move around but rather demonstrates the starting position and guides him on using his feet as pivots. Accompanied by a frosty breath, the shadow instructs him on the correct breathing technique and reveals the natural trajectory of the sword. Step by step, the shadow systematically imparts each fundamental technique of the Sohui school of martial art, demonstrating various martial arts moves in the process. Siolhui begins the practice of martial arts with the shadow person, while a mouse looks on. He laughs, commenting this is the Sohui martial art. Look how strong he is with just one arm, and proceeds to make a hole in the wall. Anticipating that he will become an expert after a month of rigorous practice, he reflects on his training. Following the learning of the sword technique, mastering the hand and foot techniques proves much easier. However, despite various attempts, he cannot seem to master the grand ship sword technique. He examines the explanation and comprehends the part about the left hand, checking the details about indications that guide him for reference forward, backward, up, down, down to the right, down to the right, a means right hand, B means left hand, C means right foot, and D means left foot. Meanwhile, he contemplates, but he struggles to make sense of the directions. He expresses a desire to learn the grand ship sword technique while eating something and glancing at his status window. Reflecting on this unexpected turn of events, he realizes he has acquired a martial arts style he never dreamed of before. He considers the possibility that he may be unable to defeat someone, recalling Du Hong. He laughs, shakes his head, and decides to finish sorting the books just in case, expressing frustration with the seemingly endless task. As he works, someone enters behind him. He continues to focus on the books and decides to take a look at some basic guides, hoping to find something that will help him understand the guide to Samsuan. Ilgibu approaches him and remarks that he didn't know there was someone else there, asking what is it, while Siolhui turns his face to look at him. Ilgibu then inquires if he has something on his face. 
After a while, Siolhui recalls that Du Hong had given him a piece of advice. To avoid drawing too much attention if he wants to stay around for a while. He thinks Du Hong is right as he looks at Il Gibu, considering this person standing before him as a beast. He checks the person's lifelines and notices that he has ten lives. Siolhui quickly gets up, approaches him, bows down and says no, not at all, while Il Gibu laughs and mentions there's no need for such formality. He then asks for his name, to which he replies Siolhui. Siolhui reflects that even Guai Sama's bodyguard Hukbai was only worth four lives, and the idea that this person is worth ten lives makes him imagine the immense power potential. Ilgibu asks him why he is there, and he responds that he was instructed to sort out the books. Ilgibu agrees, and then proceeds to ask him something. Siolhui bows again and says, yes, please ask away. Ilgibu mentions that he's searching for one of his favorite books called The Guide to Samsuan and asks if he has seen it. Siolhui starts sweating and looks at the book in his hand, receiving a message from the system that prompts him to select one of the options below. The first option is to deny having seen the book, and the second is to admit that he learned the martial arts style from it. Feeling irritated, Siolhui realizes he has another crucial choice to make and reminds himself to focus, as saying the wrong thing could lead to serious consequences. He wonders why Ilgibu is looking for this particular book and questions the significance of these options. He acknowledges that he can't admit to learning the martial arts style from the book, but that also means he can't choose any of the available options. Feeling pressed for time, he anxiously watches the timer counting down from 10 seconds. Realizing he needs to make a choice with no alternative, he acknowledges that he'll have to opt for the lesser of two evils. The system notifies him that he has selected the option of claiming he hasn't seen the book, and he proceeds, stating to Ilgibu that he hasn't seen that book. Ilgibu inquires if that is correct, then walks towards the shelf, asking where Siolhui put it. Siolhui, questioning if he made the right choice, decides to join the search, stating he'll have a look too. Ilgibu smiles and requests if he minds, explaining that he can't recall where he last left it, and he continues searching while walking out. Siolhui lets out a breath. Suddenly, Ilgibu stops and recalls where he put the book. Siolhui, filled with fear, asks where it is, and Ilgibu turns towards him, stating he's holding it. Siolhui tightens his grip on the book and exclaims he got caught. Siolhui wonders if he chose the wrong option as Ilgibu walks towards him and approaches him closely. Concerned about what might happen next, he contemplates the impossibility of escaping from a formidable individual like Ilgibu. He considers pretending not to know he had the book, saying the thing is. However, Ilgibu shakes his head, laughs and apologizes, calling it a mean joke. Siolhui, uncertain about what to do, asks him for guidance. Ilgibu responds that he just started working there and introduces himself as Ilgibu, offering a smile and expressing pleasure at meeting him. Ilgibu explains that he came to browse the archive a bit. Siolhui, uneasy about Ilgibu's smile and finding it challenging to discern the intention behind his behavior, wonders about the identity of this person as he gazes at him. Meanwhile, two mice arrive and begin eating Siolhui's food. After a short while, Ilgibu starts speaking, having quietly examined the books. He takes a book from the shelf and mentions, hearing that Siolhui got the job on the recommendation of Lord Gmi Sama. Siolhui confirms this, saying it's true. Ilgibu remarks that it's surprising, considering the old man isn't the type to do anyone favors. Siolhui, thinking about the old man, laughs and mentions that he's always been quite kind to him. Ilgibu questions if that's the case, wondering why the old man made Siolhui cut his own arm. Siolhui ponders about Ilgibu and apologizes, stating that he didn't mean to pry into his past, he was just curious to learn more about a new face. Siolhui adds, while flipping the page of a book, that at least Ilgibu wasn't made to cut his own throat. Ilgibu responds, saying that as tough as life can be at times, it still beats death, although he guesses this means he'll have to give up on mastering the demonic martial art. Siolhui contemplates that it seems like this person is trying to get under his skin, wondering who in the world he is. He speculates that referring to Guai Sama as that old man indicates this person's high rank. Ilgibu asks him if it surprises him, and Siolhui inquires about the meaning. He clarifies that he meant someone like him, who can refer to Lord Gmi Sama as that old man. Siolhui is shocked, wondering if he can read his mind or possess some extraordinary power. Siolhui denies having any impertinent thoughts and assures Ilgibu that he wouldn't dare. 
Ilgi Bu puts the book back on the shelf and reassures Xiao Hui that it's right, considering it is natural. He then asks Xiao Hui about the Sohui martial art and how much he has learned. Xiao Hui reflects that it's as if this person already knows the answer to everything. He apologizes and states that he's not sure what Ilgi Bu means by those words, revealing that he is unable to use his right arm. Ilgi Bu places his hand on Xiao Hui's shoulder, questioning how he can possibly learn any martial art in his current state. Ilgi Bu laughs and reassures him, stating that there's no need to look so worried. However, he warns him that if it isn't true, and he has taken him for a fool, then he should be concerned. He filled with fear, sweats profusely. Ilgi Bu walks away, informing Xiao Hui that he can get back to work. As Ilgi Bu leaves, Xiao Hui feels a sense of relief. However, he wonders why Ilgi Bu isn't leaving and becomes anxious as Ilgi Bu stops at the gate. The system notifies Xiao Hui that he needs to choose one of the options below. First, to confirm if he is Ganem, the fourth disciple of Chen Mei. Second, to admit if he actually learned the Sohui martial art from the book he was looking for. And third, to acknowledge if he seems to be in more or less the same situation as Ilgi Bu. Xiao Hui reflects on the meaning of being the disciple of Chen Ma and wonders who the fourth disciple of Chen Ma is. He recalls rumors about the disciple being 30th in the demon cult's hierarchy with almost transcendental martial arts abilities. Xiao Hui can't believe that the formidable figure is standing right in front of him. Contemplating his options, he decides he cannot choose the second option, as admitting to learning the Sohui martial art would likely be deemed a lie in response. Considering the third option, he dismisses it as not even worth considering. As he looks at the second option, he thinks there's no way he can choose it, making the decision straightforward. Turning his attention to the first option, he realizes it's the only viable choice, so he selects it and proceeds with the continuation process. Ilgi Bu turns his face towards Xiao Hui and praises him, saying he's very impressive. Xiao Hui wonders about the meaning behind Ilgi Bu's words. In response, he acknowledges that he's unsure how Ilgi Bu figured that out, but it doesn't really change anything. He states that he's just another person caught up in the power struggle. Xiao Hui bows down in front of Ilgi Bu, asking for forgiveness and expressing regret for asking something so improper. Xiao Hui inwardly thanks his lucky stars, realizing that this option appears to have saved him. Meanwhile, Xiao Hui ponders further on whether there was a reason Ganma wanted to maintain a hidden identity, realizing it could have been a disaster. Ilgi Bu instructs him to carry on with his work and resumes walking, pausing once again. Xiao Hui receives another notification, presenting the remaining two options. He wonders why this keeps happening, frustrated that he just made a choice and now has to choose again. The system notifies him that he has selected the option of actually learning the Sohui martial art from the book he was looking for. Xiao Hui admits to him that he indeed learned the Sohui martial art from the book. Ilgi Bu questions him, asking if he's saying he has taken him for a fool. Turning towards Xiao Hui, Ilgi Bu declares that it means he'll have to kill him now, drawing his sword and rushing towards him. Xiao Hui becomes scared as the system once again notifies him to select the last option within the next five minutes. Ilgi Bu freezes while he is on the verge of attacking him, and the countdown begins. At this point, Xiao Hui feels he doesn't have a choice, it seems like the system is forcing him to choose the worst option. He glances at the status window as time rapidly decreases. Then, he realizes that the time limit is different this time, now with three digits. This seems to give him time to figure out the reason behind this option. Xiao Hui thinks there must be a way to survive in a situation like this, implying that this option may be the best one, not the worst. Based on his past experiences, the best case scenario always turns out to be the chosen option. Even with Chen Ma's disciple pointing a sword at him, Xiao Hui believes there must be a way to persuade Ilgi Bu. He recalls Ilgi Bu mentioning that surprising, that old man isn't the type to do anyone favors. Observing the way this person talked about Guai Sama, Xiao Hui infers that Ganma doesn't seem to harbor much liking for him. Recalling Ilgi Bu's statement that he's unsure how Xiao Hui figured that out and is merely caught up in the struggle for power, Xiao Hui wonders if Ganma truly doesn't care about such matters. Considering it further, Xiao Hui realizes that this option could also be interpreted as meaning that Ganma is in the same position as him. As he contemplates the third option, Xiao Hui believes he understands better than anyone what it feels like to desire power. He squeezes his hand, contemplating if there's a way to calm Ganma down and potentially offer him more power. 
recalling his words about one of them adding a few more kills to their record while the other rid themselves of a nuisance, Seolhui notices the timer reaching 66 seconds. Zhang Myung-gu questions how Seolhui knew, and Seolhui thinks about a senior member of the demon cult conspiring with someone from the Mount Hua sect. Meanwhile, he contemplates that this might be it, hoping he's right about his decision. The system notifies him that he has selected the option stating that he seems to be in more or less the same situation as Ilgi Bu. Ilgi Bu unfreezes, steps on the floor, and questions what that was, asking what he just said. Xiaohui asserts that he knows Ganma, explaining that no matter how hard Ganma tried, there was no way for him to compete with Chen Ma's other disciples when he was chosen. He adds that the other disciples already had strong support backing them, emphasizing that there was nothing Ganma could do. Xiaohui urges Ilgi Bu not to change the subject. However, Ilgi Bu points the sword towards him again, demanding to know what he is trying to say. Seolhui thinks that it's working, considering that Ganma could have easily killed him just now. He believes that Ganma is curious to hear what he has to say and speculates that Ganma might try to rally the support of Guai Sama, the lord of the Great Imperial Pavilion. Seolhui observes a subtle change in the expression on Ganma's face. He bows down again and mentions that the Great Imperial Pavilion is the central branch of the Crimson Demon Palace. If Ganma can secure the support of the Great Imperial Pavilion, he could gain the backing of the Crimson Demon Palace, which serves as the main headquarters of the demon cult. He asks if that's the reason Ganma came to see him. Standing up, Seolhui asserts that he didn't come for the guide to Samsuan. Otherwise, he would have taken the book and left. He questions why a disciple of Chinma would come here in the first place and why Ganma keeps talking to him. He realizes he's nobody in the demon cult. But upon reflection, he comes to see him, or more precisely, someone who might know something about Lord Guai Sama's weakness. Ilgi Bu queries what makes him think that, and Seolhui replies by referencing the mission that Lord Guai Sama was going to assign to the Flying Hand Company, which he is a part of the mission to scout out the Hamgok Pass. Seolhui notes that he has been at the Heavenly Sun Archive for a month now and suggests it's an interesting coincidence that he was the only one who didn't participate in that mission. Meanwhile, Seolhui considers that if the mission unfolded as he recalls, the entire Flying Hand Company would probably be dead by now, and Ganma must have heard rumors about it. Seolhui mentions that he figured that from his perspective. This implies there would be no reason for Ganma to come to see him in the first place. Even if he happened to be here by chance, there's no reason to show so much interest in him. Ilgi Bu comments that he probably seemed somewhat unusual to him and laughs. Seolhui believes Ganma must be after something. Ilgi Bu acknowledges that Seolhui is amusing and understands why old Guai Sama doesn't like him. He agrees to suppose that Seolhui is right, then asks if Seolhui is suggesting he could take advantage of Guai Sama's weakness. Seolhui confirms this, prompting Ilgi Bu to inquire about the specifics of his plan. He thinks about it, and as Ilgi Bu presses him further, he contemplates if he can't come up with anything after all his grand talk. After a moment, Seolhui responds that he wants to know something, and if he gets Ilgi Bu what he wants, he asks what he will get in return. Ilgi Bu inquires about his statement, and Seolhui clarifies that his life is at stake, and he needs to know if there will be any benefits for him. Ilgi Bu questions if Seolhui knows his life isn't worth much, and Seolhui acknowledges that he does. However, he argues that if he can save his time and effort or create a good opportunity for him, it should be worth something. Ilgi Bu probes if Seolhui believes he can save time and effort, to which Seolhui affirms. Ilgi Bu turns and gazes at him, contemplating something. He eventually agrees, stating that if the information Seolhui provides is valuable, he promises to reward him accordingly, and he sheathes his sword. Seolhui then reveals that Lord Guai Sama's weakness is his connection to Zhang Myonggu of the Mount Hua sect. Ilgi Bu questions if he has any proof that they've been in contact. He responds that Lord Guai Sama isn't one to leave behind evidence of something like that. Ilgi Bu questions if it's just a hunch, and he replies that it may be just a hunch to him, but he might be able to do something about it. He reflects that Ganma has an advantage he doesn't, and when there's only one person to focus on, it's not that hard to confirm whether or not a hunch is true. He considers the many people under Ganma's command including those who could reveal the truth behind the conspiracy, like the mysterious higher-ups in the demon cult. He believes it's definitely possible, and Ilgi Bu agrees with him. He wonders if that's a yes, and he asks for Seolhui's name again. 
he answers and Ilgi Boo kneels on one leg and sits in front of him, stating that he'll look into it, but first, he needs Xiaohui to do something for him. Xiaohui asks what he has in mind, and Ilgi Boo replies that. He wants him to kill Jiakmyong. He asks what's wrong, and Ilgi Boo questions if he doesn't want to do it. He clarifies that it's not like that. He was just wondering why Ilgi Boo wants this. Ilgi Boo explains that, for him to trust him, he needs some confirmation. He asks if he can do it. Xiaohui thinks it's not a question of whether or not he can do it. He has to do it. He clenches his fist and declares that he, Xiaohui, lieutenant of the Flying Hand Company, will kill Jiakmyong and show him that he can be trusted. Xiaohui rises and prepares, taking his sword. Ilgi Bu informs him that he'll be on the twelfth floor at the top of the Heavenly Sun Archive and asks him to come see him after he kills Jiakmyong. Xiaohui contemplates that Ganma probably doesn't believe he'll be able to kill Jiakmyong. He reflects that to one of Chenma's disciples, they probably all look the same as he checks his status window. Xiaohui acknowledges that Jiakmyong is on an entirely different level than him. The status window notifies him that his name is Xiaohui, lieutenant of the low-level unit, and his body is unable to use the right arm with restricted movement. His health value is 105, and his Kai value is 240. His skills include Demonic Sword Technique, Black Demon Swordsmanship, and Sohui School, with his attack skill listed as Weak Sword Blast. He also checks Jiakmyong's details, who is the captain of a unit under the command of a higher-level officer. Jiakmyong's body is normal, with a health value of 1404 and a Kai value of 1560. His skills encompass Shadowless Technique, Leg Speed Boost, Ghost Shadow Walk, and attack skills such as Sword Blast, Hosian Blast, and Leg Blast, along with the defense skill of Cloud Walk. Meanwhile, Xiaohui contemplates that there's only one way for him to overcome this huge difference and survive the Sohui School. He walks out into the street, thinking about when people let their guard down while eating, meeting their lover, or sleeping. As he reaches an outhouse, he further considers that people tend to be vulnerable when on the toilet. He opens the outhouse door and enters, reflecting on how Jiakmyong used to beat him whenever he was bored or simply didn't like the look of him. Inside, Xiaohui thinks about how to kill Jiakmyong in this situation. He believes Jiakmyong takes a long time in the bathroom, making it the moment when he lets his guard down the most. Xiaohui plans to climb under the toilet and strike from below, acknowledging that it's disgusting and smelly, but he convinces himself it's just this once. Covering his face, he psyches himself up, expressing determination to survive no matter what. He believes that someday, he'll tower over all of them. He hears the sound of steps and thinks he's here. He always comes here at the same time, just as he expected, while looking at him. He jumps inside the bathroom and thinks what a relief, it's clean, they must have just cleaned it out, while Jiakmyong reaches there as well and removes his trousers. Xiaohui thinks just one shot, that's all he needs and gets ready to attack. Jiakmyong sits there for poop, and Xiaohui runs to attack him while he poops on him, but he quickly escapes. The system notifies him that he uses the Grand Ship Sword technique, presenting a golden opportunity because he has found an enemy's weakness. This is a chance to deal significant damage. He thinks what this is, his body's moving on its own. He waves his sword and attacks him while he tries to look back, and a blast occurs in the outhouse. Jiakmyong comes out, shouting due to pain, and the system notifies him that it's a critical strike. His opponent has taken 1404 damage and died. Meanwhile, his gaze fixes upon his lifeless body as well as the status window, pondering the origin of the sword aura. He proceeds to the river, disrobes and cleanses his face. Subsequently, he scrutinizes his reflection in the water, discovering the possession of three coins, signifying three opportunities. Reflecting on the status window, he observes a chart detailing Sohui sword techniques, with the Grand Ship sword technique as the first and the Indications technique as the second. Contemplating how he activated the Grand Ship sword technique without a depletion in Kai, he examines his Ik value, which remains at 240. Considering the possibility of harnessing such power at will, he envisions the potential for even greater strength. After a while, he slowly touches his right arm wound and contemplates the fact that he has already lost the use of his right arm in this life. Moreover, once people discover that he killed Jiakmyong, he will be in even bigger trouble. Considering his impaired arm, he sees no way to become stronger in this life. In that case, it's time to plan out his next life. He wonders if he should go see Ganma but decides against it. 
He needs to carefully consider the situation, as he can't trust Ganma yet, or rather, he still hasn't figured out what exactly Ganma is after. Getting up, he takes his clothes and walks away. Upon reaching the training camp, he bows down in front of Lord Guai Sama and expresses his desire to request an audience with his lordship. However, Lord Guai Sama questions if he has lost his mind, daring to enter his study without permission. Furthermore, he remarks on the unpleasant smell emanating from him. He responds that he has no choice. Lord Guai Sama then asks what he means. He explains that he had no other option if he wanted to kill Captain Jiakmyong of the Black Moon Company. Coming closer, Lord Guai Sama expresses curiosity about the exact manner in which he killed him, insisting that he first disclose the information. Moving even closer, Seol Hui feels as if he can't breathe, suspecting that this must be the first mass demon style. Kneeling before him, Lord Guai Sama pulls his hair and inquires if he has spoken to someone. Confused, Seol Hui asks what he means. Lord Guai Sama warns him not to look away and threatens consequences if he attempts to lie, asserting that he is dead. Seol Hui states that it doesn't matter who he meets, emphasizing that the real question is what he's hiding. He demands to know what happened to him in the Heavenly Sun archive, insisting that he answer right away as if he has completely lost his composure. Seol Hui, urging honesty, suggests that he has always wanted to kill him. He asks if he really wants to know and reveals that he met Ganma, who sent him here. He considers that Seol Hui is likely lying, but he deems it inconsequential if the truth is revealed because what he needs to know is far more important. Lord Guai Sama inquires if Ganma is assisting him and instructs him to stand, acknowledging that he can understand why he killed Jiakmyon. He then asks what Ganma wants to know. Seol Hui explains that Ganma instructed him to inquire about the time and location of a secret meeting with Zhang Myung Gu of the Mount Hua sect. Seol Hui contemplates the gravity of conspiring with an enemy sect, a serious offense in the demon cult, irrespective of the reason. Meanwhile, he turns and walks away. He asks if that's the case, to which Seol Hui affirms. Lord Guai Sama inquires if there's anything else. Seol Hui responds that Ganma wants to know the details of when and where he plans to meet him next, contemplating whether he should apply more pressure. He adds that Ganma has been contemplating this for a long time and urges him to truthfully disclose information about Mount Hwang Ga. Lord Guai Sama reveals that they will be meeting on Mount Hwang Ga during the crescent moon at the beginning of next month. Seol Hui believes he took the bait and notices a flash on the floor. Puzzled, he wonders what it is and realizes there's nothing visible. Kneeling, he attempts to look at the screen. The system notifies him that he has obtained Yoji Du, the secret map of the Lord of the Great Imperial Pavilion. Seol Hui wonders about Yoji Du, and the status screen offers more information, prompting him to eagerly seek further details. Upon checking the specifics of Yoji Du, he discovers that it is a book containing Lord Guai Sama's favorite places in the Central Plains. The book includes a rough map of Mount Hwang Ga, where he first met Zhang Myung Gu of the Mount Hua sect, and they hold secret meetings there every three months. Additionally, the book contains a rough map of the Central Plains. Impressed, he thinks wow, he hasn't seen anything like this before. The system notifies him that a toolbox has been created containing medicinal herbs, red bean jelly, and a secret book named Yoji Du. He contemplates the contents, wondering about their significance. Meanwhile, Lord Guai Sama interjects, asking when the fourth disciple taught him how to fight. Seol Hui, taken aback, replies a few days ago. Lord Guai Sama follows up by questioning when he first met Ganma, specifically on the day he left to work at the Heavenly Sun Archive. Lord Guai Sama confirms this information and then expresses skepticism. He questions whether Ganma, within just a few days of meeting him, trusted him enough to teach him and instruct him to kill Jiakmyong. As he walks towards him, Lord Guai Sama suggests that he was sent there to gather information. He affirms this. In response, Lord Guai Sama stabs him, questioning if he takes him for a complete fool. Siolhua is badly injured and bleeding severely as he contemplates why he was born and how he ended up living in this situation. Falling into Lord Guai Sama's arms, he reflects on why it doesn't bother him to kill people and why he is so focused on becoming stronger. All of his questions begin with why, leading him to ponder why he must obey people simply because they are stronger than him, even if it means incurring his wrath. He questions if Siolhua knows where he went wrong pointing out that Ganma never teaches anyone martial arts but instead uses techniques learned from their master. 
He laughs while he stares at him, calling him a fool. Sialhua is asked if he has any clue, to which Guai Salma responds with confusion. Sialhua asserts that he has already lost to him. Guai Salma becomes angry, abuses him, and stabs him again, causing severe bleeding. The system window notifies that a restart is imminent. After a while, he awakens and realizes he is back again. Feeling more vital, he notes that his arm is now fully healed. He acknowledges having only two lives left and proceeds to check his status window. The system window notifies that he is Sialhui, a lieutenant of a low-level unit, describing his body as one unable to use his right arm with restricted movement. His health value is 118 over 120, and his Kai is 250 over 250. The system window also informs him of his main demonic sword techniques, which include black demon swordsmanship and his weak attack skill, sword blasts. Reflecting on the improvements, he observes that his arm is now back to normal, and both his health and Kai have increased slightly. However, he notes the absence of the Sohui school and mentions that he still remembers it. The system window then notifies him that he has acquired the Sohui school. The system window provides details about the main skills of the Sohui school. Siolhui thinks that it seems to display whatever he remembers. The system window then presents information about new tools, medicinal herbs, red bean jelly, and yoji do. Siolhui contemplates these new tools and considers how he can utilize them. He focuses on Yoji Du and the system window notifies him of an option to load it, to which he responds affirmatively. A scroll appears in his hand, and he remarks on its usefulness, expressing a desire to take a look. Chuckling, he discovers that it's a map of Mount Hwanga, the place Guai Sama mentioned. Seol Hui inquires about the other items. The system window provides information about the medicinal herb, describing it as an ordinary herb that grows everywhere and indicating its effects of boosting health by two. It also notifies him about the red bean jelly tool, with the description explaining that it is a snack made by boiling red beans, running them through a wooden sieve, and mixing them with flour and honey. The effects of the red bean jelly include boosting health by three. Now contemplating red bean jelly and its nature, he retrieves a chocolate, unwraps it, and indulges. Pleased, he expresses how delicious it is. The system window notifies that he has regained one health point, bringing his health to 119 out of 120. Reflecting, he calculates that he would gain three health points if he consumes the entire chocolate. However, he decides to save it and contemplates how to put it away. The system window prompts him, asking if he would like to place it in his toolbox. Swishing it, he complies, and the system window confirms the safe storage of the item in his toolbox. Content, he declares all right then and stands up, asserting that it's time to get moving. He eventually reaches the Heavenly Sun Archive on the 12th floor. He greets Lord Ganma and introduces himself as Lieutenant Sialhui of the Flying Hand Company, expressing his official request for an audience. Ilgibu inquires about his identity, and Siolhui clarifies that he is the lieutenant of a low-level unit in the Great Imperial Pavilion, associated with the Flying Hand Company. Ilgibu questions why he wishes to see Lord Ganma. Siolhui explains that he possesses information that could significantly aid in realizing his ambitions. Upon this revelation, Lord Ganma orders him to come inside. Siolhui opens the door and enters, standing behind Lord Ganma. With a smile, he expresses his attention and asks about the information that could help him achieve his ambitions. Sialhui then presents him with a scroll. Ilgibu inquires about the content of the scroll. Sialhui urges him to take a look. Ilgibu accepts the scroll, opens it, and examines its contents. He questions him, asking if he is absolutely sure that the information is accurate. Sialhui perceives a change in Ilgibu's tone and emphatically swears on his life. Ilgibu then asks about his identity, to which Siolhui responds that he is just a lowly lieutenant reaching out in a quest for strength. After contemplating for a while, Ilgibu walks toward him and states that if the information is indeed accurate, he is willing to offer anything he desires. Siolhui reflects on the three hours since Ganma went out to check the map, expressing hope for a positive outcome. He acknowledges a sudden anxiety and reflects on the complex hierarchy of the demon cult, admitting his lack of knowledge about political relations within the organization. However, he is certain that Guai Sama and Ganma, the fourth disciple, are not on excellent terms. He reflects on serving Salma, the first disciple while recalling Lord Guai Sama. Listening to approaching steps, he discerns that Ilgibu is behind him, contemplating his presence. 
Ilgi Bu questions if his assumption is correct, and he affirms it. Sialhui wonders about the consequences if he were to make a mistake and contemplates his options in his next life. The system window notifies him, asking if he would like to create a save point. It presents empty save points repeatedly. Sialhui wonders about the purpose of this notification. The system notifies him about the 95th year of the Heavenly Calendar, Chapter 2 and 3 options presented by Ganma, displaying an empty save point again. Finally, the system window notifies him that it's saved. Ilgi Bu informs him that he will present three choices. The system window provides the following options. The first is to become Ganma's foot soldier, enter the martial arts academy, and return as Ganma's servant with a difficulty rating of two stars. The second option is to become Ganma's bodyguard, receive private lessons from Elder Jiang Guan Nok, and work as Ganma's personal bodyguard with a difficulty rating of three stars. The third option is to become Ganma's secret assassin, eliminating a powerful target with a difficulty rating of five stars. Contemplating the new set of options, he wonders how he is supposed to make a choice. Each of them, he believes, would lead to a completely different life from what he has experienced so far. Reflecting on the difficulty level of the third option being five stars, he considers the information displayed below each option. The system window once again notifies him about the three options. Ilgi Bu states that he will present Sialhui with three choices. Sialhui reflects on the first option presented by the system window, considering that the Martial Arts Academy is the demon cult's primary training school overseen directly by the head of the cult. He acknowledges that each year, the Academy aims to transform a few of the hundred trainees into elite warriors, foreseeing that it could significantly enhance his Kai and martial arts skills. However, he remains uncertain about his ability to endure the rigorous training. His thoughts then turn to Elder Jiang Guan Nak, the 94th ranking elder in the demon cult. He believes that his demonic martial arts skills are guaranteed to improve if he studies with Elder Jiang Guan Nak. The system window then notifies him about the second option. Reflecting on this, he considers that the only drawback is Elder Jiang Guan Nak's nasty temper, which could potentially lead to severe injuries. Now contemplating the last option, he acknowledges that he doesn't even know the identity of the person he is supposed to kill. The system window notifies him about the third option, but considering the higher difficulty level and having a bad feeling about it, he hesitates. Recalling Lord Guai-sama, he entertains the thought that the person he is supposed to kill might be Guai-sama. He acknowledges the political implications and the required skills but continues to think about it. The system eventually notifies him that he has chosen to become Ganma's foot soldier, opting for the easiest option. Ilgi Bu congratulates him with a well done. Siolhui contemplates that regardless of his choice, survival remains his top priority, especially if he can secure extra lives. He believes that having additional lives will provide him with the flexibility to change the situation as needed. Ilgi Bu informs him that there are still six days until he can enter the academy. He adds that Siolhui can wait in the underground storehouse and he will inform the director on the first floor about it. Siolhui expresses gratitude, bowing down and thanking him. Ilgi Bu responds with a casual don't mention it and mentions the presence of a book called The Guide to Samsuan in the Storehouse, suggesting that Sialhui can learn valuable techniques from it. Ilgi Bu inquires if Sialhui has seen The Guide to Samsuan. Sialhui reflects on Ganma's search for that book, realizing its significance. Ilgi Bu notes that Sialhui has only six days to prepare and instructs him to come back. Sialhui acknowledges the instructions with an understood and agrees to return. After some time, he descends the stairs, contemplating the guide to Samsuan and wonders if it will work this time. Reflecting, he acknowledges there were two other schools he couldn't learn before. He receives a message presenting two school options, Jiaksu School and Chojuk School, both located in the basement of the Heavenly Sun Archive. Determined, he searches for the book, thinking it is around there somewhere. Eventually, he finds the book. The system window notifies him that Sohui school is learned and both Jiaksu school and Chojuk school are now available. He examines their availability options and expresses satisfaction, deeming it perfect. He contemplates the existence of the Jiaksu school, which the former deputy commander learned, and Guai Sama's Chojuk school. Examining the book, he concludes that he can now learn both of them, choosing to start with the Jiaksu school. The system window then notifies him of the incendiary field of Jiaksu school. He remarks that there are no options this time, speculating that he only used his hands for this one. 
The system window informs him that he will now be shown a video. As the system starts the video, it presents a shadow. Seol Hui laughs, noting the reappearance of that shadow. However, when the shadow unleashes a blast, he becomes startled. He closes the book, realizing that this is the Jiaxu school, acknowledging its powerful nature, and contemplating the severe damage he could inflict with it. Closing the book, he remarks now, it's time for the next step. The system window then notifies him about the explosive field of the Chojuk school. Reflecting, he recognizes this as Guai Sama's primary style of martial arts and one of the most renowned schools in the demon cult. He acknowledges that he couldn't have imagined possessing such power in his previous lives. Eager to try it out, he feels happiness and marvels at the ability to learn techniques like these. Determined he thinks alright, let him give it a shot, with six days remaining. Ready for training, he takes out his sword and begins his practice. In the course of his training, he smashes things, and some items fall down. The system window once again notifies him about the schools and their imitations. He reflects on having learned all three, but still being unable to generate as much power as the shadow. The system window then notifies him of his Kai, currently at 80 out of 250. He speculates that the lack of Kai might be the reason, and anticipates that once he has enough Kai, he'll be able to unleash more power with these techniques. Determined to continue, he declares all right, now it's time to keep going and start practicing again. Recalling the first day of training at the Martial Arts Academy, Jiawan approaches him. He expresses readiness, and when asked who he is, he introduces himself as Jiawan. Ganma instructs Jiawan to take him to the academy. Seol Hui expresses pleasure in meeting him. Jiawan then gives him something, and the system window notifies him that he has received a Kai pill to boost his Kai. Jiawan explains that it's a booster pill, and with just one of these, he can enhance his Kai equivalent to about 10 years worth of training. Contemplating, he considers that a single sexagenary cycle is equivalent to a year of Kai, and at present, he only possesses about three years worth of Kai. Upon receiving the pill, he expresses gratitude, thanking him for it. Puzzled by the generosity, he questions why he is receiving something so valuable. The giver responds that he trusts him, and this is the least he will need to survive in the academy. He then proceeds to swallow the pill. Following this, the system window notifies him that his stats have significantly increased, with his health rising by 85% and his Kai increasing by 2,000%. Now he feels more solid and robust. He marvels at his incredible luck, noting that while his health increased only slightly, his Kai saw a remarkable increase of 2,000%. The system window then notifies him about the passive skill he has acquired, mind reading. Describing mind reading, the system window explains that it allows him to see other people's stats and enhances his vision, speculating that this occurs due to the rise in his Kai. He surmises that he automatically acquires new skills when he meets specific requirements. The system window further notifies him that, now having learned mind reading, he may view his status window. Revealing the stats of Jiwon, the system window notes that he is Ganma's bodyguard, and his body is normal. Seolhui believes that he can now see some of his status details as well. Astonished, he exclaims, no way, he's Ganma's bodyguard. After a while, the system window again notifies of the details of Jiwon. It displays his hostility, warning that it's 77%, indicating that he works for Chinmei as his first disciple and is a secret agent spy for him. Seolhui ponders whether Jiwon is truly a secret agent as they walk toward the academy. The system window issues another warning, making him consider the possibility that if a secret agent can deceive Ganma, it could provide him with an advantage. Convinced of the potential advantage, Seolhui believes he is not mistaken. Jiwon comes to a stop pointing out the academy and informing him that they have reached their destination. He directs him to continue the rest of the way by himself as he heads back. After some contemplation, Sialhui starts moving towards the academy again. The system window further notifies him about receiving another Kai pill from Ganma and presents him with options. The first option indicates that there is something he wants to tell him, while the second option suggests a facial expression, specifically laughing, with a timer of 10 seconds. Considering that he already received one pill, Seolhui contemplates the second option related to facial expression, deciding that he doesn't need to inquire about it. As the timer quickly counts down, the system window notifies him that he has selected the first option and proceeds. Seolhui poses the same question to him, inquiring if there's something he wishes to tell him. However, Ganma remains silent, offering no response. 
Ilgi Bu inquires what that is supposed to mean. Seol Hui explains that he was just curious. Ilgi Bu further questions curious about what. Seol Hui responds that the academy trains the best fighters in the land, and Ganma is well aware of his abilities. He suggests that the fact that Ganma gave him the pill indicates that surviving in this place will be challenging. Seol Hui asks him if he is sure he is ready to enter, and if a slight Kai boost is sufficient to keep him alive. Ganma acknowledges that it won't be easy, and then hands Seol Hui a sword, instructing him to take it. The system window notifies him about the shadow slicing sword weapon, detailing its health plus 2, attacks plus 5, and speed plus 2. It also mentions that its features make the user feel unusually happy. Seol Hui takes the sword and smiles. Jio Wan informs him that only individuals chosen by the leaders of the central branch can enter the academy. Seol Hui is given the opportunity to study the best martial arts tomes and techniques offered by the demon cult. Jio Wan advises him to be grateful that Ganma has provided him with this opportunity. He advises Seol Hui never to forget about that. He acknowledges and reaches the gate of the academy, examining it. Subsequently, he enters the academy. As he looks at his sword, he comments that it appears to be a really good one, deciding it would be better to put it in his toolbox just in case. He considers the possibility of it being confiscated when he goes inside or someone attempting to steal it. The system window notifies him about the toolbox once again, revealing various tools inside. A medicinal herb plus one, red bean jelly plus one which he consumes, yoji do plus one, and shadow slicing sword plus one a new addition to his toolbox. The system window confirms that the item has been safely stored in his toolbox. Seol Hui states, all right, now it's time to go, and proceeds towards the training supervisor. He reflects that the training supervisor oversees all tests at the academy and holds a position just below the Lord of the Great Imperial Pavilion. They work directly for the leaders of the demon cult, ensuring that no one dares to disrespect them. The supervisor questions Seol Hui, asking if he is indeed him, and he confirms his identity. The supervisor presents four covers labeled Shin, Ino, Seo, and Pan, instructing him to choose one. Seol Hui considers the meanings of each. Shin signifies body, Eon represents speech, Seo is associated with writing, and Pan denotes judgment. He surmises that the type of test depends on the cover he chooses, speculating that the body test involves physical activities, the speech test involves speaking, and the writing test involves written tasks. However, he is uncertain about the meaning of the judgment test, wondering if it assesses decision-making abilities. The supervisor advises him to eventually complete all the tests. After contemplating for a while, Seol Hui decides not to overthink it and chooses one, stating that he will go with that option. The supervisor informs him that it's Shin and explains that he has collected six bamboo sticks with Shin written on them. He adds that Seol Hui has one day, and if he is still alive by this time tomorrow, he will have completed the test. The supervisor directs him to go through the door on the far right behind him, emphasizing that it is the same door he will return through. He mentions the variety of items inside, such as martial arts tomes, treasures and weapons, suggesting that he can find something he likes. Seol Hui sets off, and the supervisor observes him. While running, Seol Hui speculates that there are likely others undergoing the Sama test simultaneously, and the training supervisor instructed him to gather six bamboo sticks from them. He realizes that this implies he is expected to eliminate them. Contemplating the various buildings around him, Seol Hui believes that the more he explores, the better chance he has of discovering valuable items. Despite the potential danger of exposing himself, he acknowledges that if he desires something, he must put in the effort to obtain it. Determined to survive and grow stronger, he ponders the unusual quietness and realizes he is the first person present, not hearing anyone else nearby. Deciding to head to a nearby building quickly and quietly, he reflects on the need to avoid being seen. While running, he attempts to assess the situation, confirming that there is no one else in the vicinity. The system window notifies him of a warning, indicating that an unidentified enemy has detected his weakness and prompts him to choose a response. After some thought, Seol Hui considers his options, fighting back, defending himself, or making a strategic retreat. Caught off guard, Seol Hui contemplates the unfamiliar options before him, uncertain of the best course of action. With time running out, he wonders what he should do next. The system window notifies him that he has opted to run away. As he leaps from one building to another, a sudden flash occurs, and he realizes his body reacts instinctively. Startled, he is attacked from behind, 
prompting him to shout. The assailant remarks that it's unfortunate, noting that Xiaohui seemed unaware of the impending threat. The system window provides details on his body state, indicating normal conditions with health at 680 out of 685 and Kai at 470 out of 550. The system window provides another update on Xiaohui's status, stating that the lieutenant of the low-level unit has a normal body condition. It notes a decrease in health from 102 to an unspecified value and a decrease in Kai from 1030. Engaged in combat, Xiaohui sustains injuries, causing his health to deteriorate further. Grateful that he didn't kill his opponent, he acknowledges the severity of his own wounds. The enemy suggests ending the confrontation, and Xiaohui agrees. Uncertain of the opponent's strength, he considers the significant difference in Kai levels. The system window once again displays information about Xiaohui's level, unit health, and Kai. Recognizing his advantage in Kai, Xiaohui becomes confident. The enemy challenges him to attack, and he believes he can defeat him. Charging forward, he initiates an attack, and the enemy successfully blocks it. Reflecting on the So in Sohui school, Xiaohui notes the significance of the term, associating it with cold as evidenced by the white frost forming around his mouth when he breathes. The enemy exclaims, questioning why he can't move and starting to tremble. Xiaohui observes that the cold air has also slowed down his opponent, Engaging in combat, they exchange attacks, and Xiaohui declares that it's his turn to strike. Ultimately, he defeats his opponent. Han reflects on his progress with the Sohui school, acknowledging that he may not have fully mastered it yet. However, he notices a significant improvement compared to before, feeling faster and stronger. Upon checking the status window, he observes a slight decrease in both health and Kai. While having access to his current status is beneficial, he acknowledges that it also makes him more aware of the proximity to death. The system window notifies him of a health decrease by 2 points and a Kai decrease by 20 points. He expresses uncertainty about whether it's a good thing or not. Noticing that he has one of those shin bamboo sticks as he suspected, he raises it. The system window notifies him that he has obtained a healing potion. He describes it as a potion capable of healing wounds, finds it sweet, and smiles. Wrapping a cloth around his wound to stop the bleeding, he sits on the floor. The system window provides information about his health, which continues to decline. He reflects on the fact that his health is steadily decreasing, appreciating that he managed to stop the bleeding at least. He verbalizes concern that if he doesn't take action soon, he is destined to fail. He acknowledges the desire to use the healing potion, but emphasizes the need to think carefully before doing so. He is determined not to waste the potion in case he encounters someone stronger. Recalling Lord Guai Sama and Cho and Dang, he affirms his refusal to succumb until he has avenged himself against those individuals at least once. The system window informs him of the toolbox again, indicating a new tool, a healing potion plus one. He questions whether it's okay to use this. The system window notifies him that he has used medicinal herbs. The system window updates him on his health, which has increased by two points, and the effect is the cessation of bleeding damage. He comments that it is indeed easy to use. He examines his wound, rises, and attempts to peer inside the house, asking if the person inside is Chiako. Reflecting on the fact that the Great Imperial Pavilion comprises seven companies Earth, Sun, Moon, Fire, Water, Wood and Metal companies, all starting with the word Black, he observes Chiako sitting beside a deceased person, gripping his armor. Meanwhile, he gazes at Chiako and contemplates that Chiako is the leader of the Black Fire Company. Jiakmyong, the individual who frequently harassed him, serves as the captain of the Black Moon Company. He speculates that he is likely formidable too. Acknowledging that he is much stronger than him, he acknowledges that if he intends to defeat him, it must be done swiftly in a single strike. Recalling the appearance of the Sama window when he killed Jiakmyong, the system notifies him of a golden opportunity. He has identified an enemy's weakness, presenting a chance to inflict significant damage. He wonders if he can employ that move again, but is uncertain about how to activate it, realizing that he has unintentionally lowered his guard. He wonders why that window hasn't appeared yet and ponders if he needs to wait for a better chance to attack. Chiako expresses disbelief at the quality of the item he was wearing. Xiaohui contemplates that he can't wait any longer, despite potential injuries, he genuinely needs better equipment. The system window once again informs him of a golden opportunity and presence options. Attack, use martial arts or use a tool, along with a 10-second timer. 
He acknowledges that something has finally appeared, but he doesn't recognize these options and struggles to decide which one to choose. As the timer quickly counts down, the system notifies him that he has opted to attack, and he will now return to three seconds ago to act immediately. He decides to go with the safest option, muttering just three seconds ago, and expresses disbelief at the quality of the item Chiako is wearing. Sialhui, noticing Chiako attempting to wear the armor, tells him he understands and swiftly moves to attack, stabbing Chiako. He coughs, bleeds, and cries in pain. The system notifies him that Chiako's health points have reached zero after the attack. Sialhui laughs, feeling triumphant, and discovers five bamboo sticks in his clothes. That's not all, upon a thorough search, the system notifies him again that he has obtained heavenly silver armor, a fragrant moon dagger, three healing potions, and a poison antidote. Impressed, he exclaims wow as he places all the acquired items in his toolbox and receives a notification confirming their safe storage. He appreciates the automatic sorting feature and having a specific reason for organizing everything in his toolbox. The system then notifies him that he has used a healing potion resulting in an increase of 107 health points. Pleased with the efficiency of the process, he reflects on the fact that placing items in and taking them out of his toolbox makes them instantly functional. Delighted that the pain has completely disappeared, he decides to put on the heavenly silver armor. Chuckling, he wonders if he can equip it immediately and feels the armor's powers. Laughing, he notes that he can put on the armor right away, even though it seems invisible. Realizing the usefulness of the toolbox, he remarks this toolbox is really going to come in handy. Suddenly, a warning notification pops up, informing him that an unidentified enemy has discovered his weakness. Presented with options to fight back, defend himself, or run away, he contemplates the situation. Regretting his oversight of neglecting to watch out for enemies, he deliberates on the best course of action. Considering the potential risks of fighting back or attempting to run away without the knowledge of the opponent, he opts to defend himself. The system then notifies him that he has chosen to defend himself and will now be provided with information about the enemy's position. He focuses his attention accordingly. Meanwhile, he contemplates the enemy's position as he approaches Chiako's lifeless body. Unbeknownst to him, Oma stealthily approaches from behind and attempts to attack Sialhui. As he turns to look, Oma successfully strikes him, hurling him away. Sialhui sustains injuries and begins coughing up blood. A notification informs him that his health points are rapidly decreasing by 166. He reflects on narrowly blocking the attack, realizing it was a closer call than when he opted to flee. He believes he would have defeated the enemy if the attack had come a second earlier, appreciating that wearing armor allowed him to both defend himself and observe the enemy's position. As Oma approaches, he remarks that Sialhui is tougher than he thought, expressing surprise that his sword didn't penetrate through him. Oma acknowledges his gear, recognizing him as a formidable opponent. The system then notifies Sialhui that Oma is the commander of the Suration Company at the Crimson Demon Palace, with a normal body, health points totaling 4,505, and Kai points amounting to 6,020. Sialhui considers Oma more formidable than anyone he has encountered before. Sialhui contemplates let's talk about bad timing. He observes that he possesses significantly higher health and Kai than Oma, and he doubts that even Jiakmyong and Chiako combined could defeat him. As he examines Oma's life coins on his head, he discovers that Oma only has one life. He wonders why someone so strong is only worth one extra life. Oma inquires about what Sialhui is looking at, confidently stating that he's as good as dead. He responds, expressing his genuine thoughts that he believed he did his best this time. He mumbles about the unfairness of the situation, prompting Oma to ask what he is mumbling about. He replies that it just seems so unfair and mentions that, after experiencing numerous deaths before, he genuinely tried to stay alive this time. Sialhui adds that even with extra chances like this, he questions why he always finds himself so far behind, it just feels incredibly unfair, that's all. Meanwhile, Oma inquires if Sialhui has completely lost his mind. Sialhui draws his sword and affirms that indeed, if he's going to face death, he's out of his mind. He proceeds to berate Oma, declaring that he'll put up a good fight at least. Employing Sohui school techniques, Sialhui attacks, but Oma successfully blocks the assault. A blast occurs, causing them both to step back and point their swords at each other. The system notifies Sialhui that his health points have decreased by 450, and his Kai has also diminished by 640. 
Oma, puzzled, asks what just happened. Sialhui reflects, thinking that they barely exchanged sword blows, yet the damage inflicted is significant. He contemplates the possibility that he might actually have a chance in this confrontation. He contemplates the existence of a martial art known as the Soso School, which utilizes extremely cold yin energy. This form is so potent that only the elders of the demon cult are capable of employing it. He reflects that, due to its reliance on yin energy, women tend to be more proficient in these techniques than men. However, because of its strength and the desire of men and demon warriors to learn it, several martial art styles were created. It occurs to him that the Sohui school might be one of those styles. Otherwise, how could he effortlessly wield it while gazing at his gleaming sword? He realizes that he lacks yin energy and has never practiced such techniques before. Oma glares at him in anger. Meanwhile, Xiaohui receives a message indicating that his Kai points have decreased by 310, signaling that the attack was successful. However, he finds himself not exactly in great shape either. Omer rushes to attack him, but he adeptly steps back and evades the assault. He reflects that keeping up with Oma is challenging, but he can follow his movements and runs to avoid further attacks. Both engage in attempts to defeat each other, successfully blocking each other's attacks. Oma warns him not to mess with him while launching an attack. Sialhui moves backward and receives a message that his health points have decreased by 17. Oma notes that Sialhui has managed to last quite a while with his little tricks, while thinking that he's still strong enough to beat him. The system notifies Sialhui that the Sohui school has leveled up to the imitation beginner level. He wonders what beginner level means and what implications it carries. He observes that it doesn't appear that his strength or health has increased and ponders if this means his fighting skills have improved. He contemplates letting him just try whatever he can and once again charges to attack him, inflicting cuts. Oma sustains injuries as Sialhui reflects that he's much faster than before, deeming it precisely what he needed. They engage in another round of attacks, blocking each other's sword strikes and hurling one another away. Oma, perplexed, asks how Sialhui managed to do that as his sword cracks. The system notifies Sialhui that he has discovered the weakness of Serration Company Commander Oma and inquires how he would like to respond. Three options are presented. Attack, use martial arts, and use a tool. Sialhui thinks about it, realizing that if he chooses to attack, he's uncertain if he can kill Oma. The system notifies him once more that he has opted to use martial arts, presenting a list below. So Huey School is unavailable, Jiaxu School is available, and Chojuk School is also unavailable. Meanwhile, he contemplates that three options have appeared, but he couldn't choose So Huey or Chojuk, probably due to insufficient Kai. In that case, he decides to push Oma's back. The system notifies them that he is now using the incendiary field and attacks Oma, burning him. A message arrives, indicating that Oma's health points have reached zero, resulting in his demise. Additionally, Sialhui receives a notification that his health has decreased by 9 points and his Kai has diminished by 882. He sweats profusely, acknowledging that he succeeded and remarks that he's completely out of health and Kai. He recognizes that it was a close call and admits he couldn't have done it without the window that popped up. Getting up and walking away, he acknowledges that he'd better keep moving, as any other enemies that appear now could pose a real threat. The system notifies him that he has obtained a special pill blue lotus pill, a physical boost pill, and a tome of invisibility. The next morning, Sialhui reflects on using a healing potion to recover some health and wonders if it's finally morning. He contemplates having hidden in the forest without venturing anywhere with the six bamboo sticks, realizing he possesses everything needed to pass the test. Attempting to store the sticks obtained from Oma in his toolbox for the next life, he finds it wouldn't allow him. The system notifies him that he can't put shin body sticks in his toolbox, leading him to conclude that he's not allowed to save anything that might impact his next life. The system provides information about the description of the physical boost pill and blue lotus pill. He initially considered using them, but realized he needed a more concrete plan. In the case of special pills, his health and Kai return to normal whenever he dies. Using them at the wrong time would be akin to throwing them away. However, unlike special pills, some items remain with him even after use. He contemplates these tomes while looking at the status window, which informs him about the Tome of Invisibility. It reveals that the cloaking skill was used by the training master who guarded the head of the demon cult 120 years ago. 
the higher his training level, the stronger his cloaking ability becomes, and it has no restrictions. He decides to move to deactivate it. Reflecting on the learning process, he notes that once he learns a new technique, it stays in his memory and never fades away. The system notifies him that he has learned cloaking from the Tome of Invisibility. He thinks that as soon as he confirmed his desire to learn the skill, everything was planted right in his mind, without even needing to breathe or practice using it. He believes that making good use of these tomes and the status window that appeared when he killed Oma could be a huge advantage for him. He gets up and walks away thinking that every time he comes back to life, he becomes more certain. He believes he needs to take full advantage of every opportunity that comes his way if he can just learn how to maximize all these benefits. He believes he could even reach the level he has always wanted. As he nears the academy gate, a bright flash falls on his face. He notes that the light is not natural and senses something strange about it. Wondering what's going on, he tries to find his way in that bright light. The system notifies him whether he would like to create a save point. He thinks he knows it, and the system provides three options. Year 95 of the Heavenly Calendar, Chapter 2, and three options presented by Ganma to empty the save point. He closes his eyes and receives a notification that says not to save, as he has no regrets. He thinks there's no telling when he might get another opportunity like this, or whether this might even be his last chance, but he'd prefer not to save this decision. He believes there are still lots of treasures to be found here, and he'll be back in his next life. He believes there are still lots of treasures to be found here, and he'll be back in his next life. Siolhui enters the academy and hands Shin to the training supervisor. The supervisor looks at it while Siolhui asks if something is wrong. The supervisor instructs him to choose the next test and shows him three scrolls. Siolhui believes he has to do them all anyway and decides there's no point in overthinking it, choosing one of the scrolls. The supervisor selects Eon, and Siolhui bows down in front of him, and then steps away. As he does, Siolhui wonders why he doesn't see anyone else around. Though he knows this isn't the only entrance to the test center, he expects to run into at least a few other people. However, there's no one else, and he descends the stairs. Thinking that as long as he passes the test, it doesn't matter, he reaches a door. He wonders about the nature of the test, this time opens the gate, and is dismayed to see someone sitting there. He exclaims God damn it, noting that the person exudes an intense and intimidating vibe, making him feel sick. He perceives that this individual means business and wonders about its significance. Attempting to check his lives, he finds himself unable to do so. Meanwhile, the person asks what Siolhui is looking at. Siolhui bows down in front of him and explains that he's here for the Martial Arts Academy's test. The person becomes agitated, insisting that he said he's here for the test. In response, the person threatens to kill Siolhui if he opens his mouth again. Siolhui, feeling terrified, contemplates what he should do. Trembling, he wonders if this is part of the test as well. Trying to assess the situation, he throws a punch while scanning his surroundings. He realizes there's nothing in the room, but there must be some kind of clue about the test. While scanning, he notices a paper in a bowl and wonders what it is. He walks over to it, questioning if the person doesn't care about his actions and takes the piece of paper. The system notifies him that this is question number one. He reads that he's on a secret mission to kill Central Plains tribesmen by order of a superior. While passing through a dense, overgrown forest, he comes across an abandoned house, and three of the tribesmen he was looking for are hiding there. The system notifies him that the three of them are preparing to leave, each possessing martial arts skills greater than, similar to, or inferior to him, respectively. His superior is not nearby, and the system asks how he would respond. He wonders if this is the test, and the system notifies him of the options. Try to catch the enemies by surprise and kill them, pretend to be a martial arts master and try talking to them, wait outside the house until his superior arrives, or choose none of the above. He contemplates the options, considering that not choosing anything seems unclear. A surprise attack would be reckless, and talking to them is too risky. The system notifies him that he has chosen to wait outside the house until his superior arrives. Siolhui believes the best thing to do is to wait for help, prioritizing safety. However, the person says something, leaving Siolhui puzzled. He asks what the hell the person just said, and in response, the person quickly gets up from his place and cuts his neck. Meanwhile, Siolhui thinks come on and attempts to say something, but the system notifies him that he is now returning to year 95 of the Heavenly Calendar, Chapter 2. 
he finds himself in front of Ilgibu, who states he'll give him three choices. Sialhui thinks that he's back again, and the system notifies him that he has chosen to become Ganma's foot soldier. Ilgibu responds very well, and Sialhui reflects that it's the same choice as in his last life. Everything from the tone of voice to the facial expressions and gestures remains the same as before. He notes that the guide to Samsuan is mentioned again, and then Ganma leaves. Sialhui recalls the incident when that person cuts his neck, rubs his neck, and thinks that he got killed before he even had time to react. He realizes he's still too weak, and if he's to stay alive, he'll need to prepare even better. He checks his toolbox and confirms that, as expected, the items in his toolbox stay there forever. He turns and walks away, contemplating that if he steals something from Ganma's room and puts it in his toolbox, it won't disappear the next time he's revived. He acknowledges the need to find things, initiating a search for something that could help him in his next life. As he looks into a mirror, he notices he has two coins and two chances. With the extra life gained from killing Oma, he now has two lives left, reassuring himself that he's still fine. He kneels and encourages himself, saying, hang in there. After looking around for over an hour without finding anything useful, he checks a cupboard and discovers some clothes, thinking that he at least needs something. Observing a crack in the wall, he asks about it, and the system notifies him that he has obtained an advanced tome, specifically the wind technique, one of the four elemental techniques. He receives details about the four elemental techniques, which were taught directly by Chen Ma to his disciples, and the tome contains a summary of the essence of the demonic martial art from the last 200 years. Siolhui learns that the four elemental techniques are divided into earth, water, fire, and wind, with Ganma having been taught the wind technique. He contemplates the techniques taught by Chen Mei, acknowledging them as the strongest ones in the demon cult. Running, he reaches the basement of the Heavenly Sun archive, breathing heavily. The system notifies him about his toolbox, indicating that he has obtained advanced tomes for the four elemental techniques, specifically wind. Excitement wells up within him, and he questions whether he's dreaming. Feeling goosebumps all over his body, he expresses disbelief that this is truly one of the four elemental techniques. Lying down on the floor, he bursts into laughter. Sitting on the floor, he checks his status window once again. His health points are at 118 and his chi points are at 250. Recognizing that his stats are terrible, he decides he'd better ask Jioan for another one of those chi pills this time, having learned from dying so pathetically in his last life. He contemplates that playing it safe doesn't always yield the most significant rewards, and getting his hands on those treasures in the academy could have a huge impact on his destiny. Believing that to defeat more advanced fighters, he needs to be prepared and get stronger, no matter what it takes. The system notifies him about the special pills, Physical Boost Pill and Blue Lotus Pill, both increasing by one. Thinking that he might as well use up the special pills in his toolbox, he proceeds to do so. The system notifies him that he has used the physical boost pill, resulting in a 1000 increase in health points and 10 in chi points. Another notification informs him that he has used the blue lotus pill, leading to a 200 increase in health points and a 1040 increase in chi points. Reflecting on the outcome, he thinks it was even better than he expected as he looks at his muscular body. He notes that it didn't just boost his stats, it even changed his body, making his muscles bigger, and he believes he's even taller now too. He receives a notification indicating that he has learned wind, one of the four elemental techniques. He believes that finally, he has acquired the ultimate technique and envisions being able to knock down a whole building with just one finger using it. Eager to try it out, he receives another notification stating that he can't use it while he is in a meditation pose. The system informs him that he cannot use it because he must have at least 30,000 health and 50,000 chi. He acknowledges that he can't use it, yet since he needs 30,000 health and 50,000 chi, and he's not even close to that. Nevertheless, he believes that even in his current state, there must be some way to leverage the advantages he has and get through this. Checking his status window, he sees a chart of Sohui sword techniques, grand ship sword techniques, and indications techniques. He thinks that the indications technique creates a super powerful sword aura without depleting any of his kai, considering it the best skill he has learned so far. Taking out his sword, he realizes he needs to learn its secrets. The scene shifts to the first day at the Martial Arts Academy, where Jiowan introduces himself, stating that his name is Jiowan, and Ganem asks him to take him to the academy. 
Jiyuan explains that it's a booster pill, and with just one of these, Xiaohui can boost his Kai by about 10 years worth of training. He presents the pill to him, who thinks that just like in his last life, Jiyuan came to see him and gave him a Kai pill. The system notifies him that his stats have increased. His health increases by 85 points, his Kai increases by 2000 points, and his martial arts skill level increased. The Jiaxu school imitation is now at the beginner level. Xiaohui bows down in front of Jiyuan, expressing his gratitude and thinking that this is a huge change. The increase in Kai alone leveled up his skill to a beginner level, giving him a much better chance of surviving in the academy. After a while, they both reach the Martial Arts Academy and Jiyuan points toward the academy building. He says there's the Martial Arts Academy and adds that Xiaohui can walk the rest of the way by himself as he's heading back now. Xiaohui thinks everything is going just like it did the last time, which means any second now. The system notifies him to give the flying dragon pill from Ganma, and the second option is a facial expression laugh. He thinks there it is, and the second option is gone, probably because the shadow slicing sword is in his toolbox, and both options are tricky. The system notifies him that he has chosen to give him the flying dragon pill from Ganma 2. Xiaohui says to give him the flying dragon pill from Ganma 2. Jiyuan turns and asks what he just said, and Xiaohui replies that he guesses he wasn't told. Then, Jiyuan asks told what? Xiaohui says Ganma promised to give him one Kai pill and one flying dragon pill, and he just wanted to see if Ganma had it. He asks if he did not get a flying dragon pill, then he apologizes, acknowledging it's a bit last minute, but Ganma can just give the pill directly to him while offering another pill. Xiaohui thinks he knew Ganma had it, takes the pill, and expresses gratitude. Jiyuan punches him, throws him on the floor, puts his foot on his head, and kneels near him. Jiyuan says he will never make it out of the academy alive, but even if he does, Jiyuan will kill him himself. Jiyuan spits at his face, stands up, and walks away. Xiaohui eats the pill, thinking about Jiyuan, and swears that if he makes it out of this place, Jiyuan is in trouble. His status window informs him that his stats have significantly increased. His health points increased by 6003, Kai increased by 3500 points, and his skill level increased. So Huey School's beginning level reaches the basic level, Jiaxu School's incendiary field beginner level reaches a basic level, and Chejuk School's explosive field imitation reaches the beginner level. The system notifies him that his mind reading level has increased, and his passive skill mind reading imitation is now at the beginner level. He contemplates that he'll kill Jiyuan with his own two hands and checks Jiyuan's status window, finding that Jiyuan is one of Ganma's bodyguards. Jiyuan's body is normal, his hostility is at 77, his health points are 15,000, and his Kai is at 12,000. A message appears, providing a reference that 10,000 points are equal to one sexagenary cycle. 1 lakh points are equal to 2 sexagenary cycles, and so on. Siolhui enters the academy, where the supervisor asks him to choose one. He points towards the same, and the supervisor says Shin. The supervisor instructs him to gather 6 bamboo sticks with Shin written on them, similar to the one he selected. He is given one day, and if he's still alive by this time tomorrow, he'll be done with the test. He replies, mentioning that he was wondering about something, and takes the cover. He says he's not the only person taking this test, expressing surprise. He thought there would be other people around, judging from the number of sticks. He wonders why he doesn't see anything and questions if he did something wrong. Talking to a training supervisor, he reflects that normally someone at his level wouldn't even dare to speak to him and contemplates that he'd better just go. The supervisor states that standards increase over time and see all he walks out. He thinks there must be some demon warriors here at the academy. But since he doesn't see any around here, they must be assigned to different times or places. He ponders about the ones who are already here. Contemplating that he's going to keep fighting and getting stronger, he considers the phrase standards increase over time. He wonders if that means he'll have to fight stronger people later on and turns. Deciding that it doesn't change anything, and if he has to fight anyway, he might as well get it over with now, so that he can get more items. He runs out of the academy. Meanwhile, he reflects that he's back, returning to this circus that will soon turn into a sea of blood. However, it's different this time. In his last life, he was ambushed almost as soon as he got near that building. Now he contemplates that this time, he's going to do the ambushing himself. He wonders where that guy is and looks all around the building, but he doesn't see him. 
acknowledging that the longer he waits, the more likely he is to get attacked by someone else, he realizes he doesn't have a choice. Walking in the woods, he concludes that he'll just have to reveal himself and says come out wherever he is. The system notifies him with a warning message that an unidentified enemy has found his weakness, so he needs to decide how he would like to respond. Fight back, defend himself, or run away. He reflects that last time, he chose to run away and got stabbed in the back. He believes it's only because he hesitated for a second and could have dodged that attack. Convinced that he doesn't need to defend himself and the enemy isn't that strong, he believes he can easily beat him now. The system notifies him that he has chosen to fight back and continues. He feels someone behind him, quickly turns and sees that person jumping from the building near him to attack. He blocks the attack and counterattacks. The person falls and Siolhui remarks that it is nothing, thinking this guy is no match for him. The person gets up again, ready for a fight back. He thinks as proof of that, he's standing there looking right at him. The system notifies him about a golden opportunity, indicating that he has found an unidentified enemy's weakness and asks how he would like to respond. He gets ready for an attack, thinking that this window just appeared while smiling. Siolhui reflects that he's a little excited about this life, not that he enjoys killing now, but it's just that he's much more powerful this time around. He finds it exciting to be able to see that change in himself, and this life promises to be interesting. In his current state, he believes he'll win no matter what he chooses, having already tried attacking and using martial arts. He decides to try the last option this time. The system notifies him that he has chosen to use a tool, emphasizing that he will be told how to use this option only once. He checks his toolbox and receives another message about his medicinal items and gear, with the options being medicinal items or gear. He thinks that the tomes are gone, and it only shows the special pills and gear. He wonders if it only shows him things he can use right now, and gear is probably the safest bet. Meanwhile, the system notifies him about gear, specifically a weapon. It presents options like the Shadow Slicing Sword and the Fragrant Moon Dragger, and he chooses the Shadow Slicing Sword. The system then inquires about the placement of the sword, for example, in his right hand. Reflecting on this, he thinks about placing it in his right hand. Siolhui's sword starts shining, and he realizes how it works. He believes it will come in handy if he breaks or drops his sword, even though he can only use it when that window appears. At that moment, the person runs to attack him, shouting, Die! Siolhui responds, saying he's too slow, and he stabs him. While sitting near the deceased person, he thinks using his toolbox doesn't seem much better than just choosing to attack and going three seconds back in time. Nevertheless, he acknowledges that using a special pill when he's in danger would definitely help recover some of his health and takes his shin as well. He remarks well, he's sure he'll figure out how to make good use of that option over time. Reflecting, he wonders how many people are currently in the academy what kinds of treasures are present, and how many there might be. He speculates that the bigger buildings likely hold more treasures and decides to jump and reach the roof of one. He acknowledges that staying hidden was made easier thanks to his cloaking skill. However, the system notifies him that cloaking gradually reduces his kai. He acknowledges that he may be stronger than before, but it's only relative. He secretly tries to open the door, thinking he can't be too confident yet, and successfully jumps inside. Recognizing the need for caution, he checks the drawers to find something but says there's nothing there, guessing they wouldn't be that easy to find. He senses someone's presence and decides to secretly move forward and hide, noting that he wouldn't normally have heard anyone there. The system notifies him that the cloaking effect allows him to hear even the faintest nearby sounds, and he thinks it must be because of this skill. Reflecting, he believes cloaking was created as a way to stay hidden, and the skill also enables him to hear enemies approaching more easily. While listening to someone's footsteps, he finds it unsurprising that the skill includes an effect like that. Deciding to go after the approaching person and catch him off guard, Sailhui hides inside and acknowledges that he feels the person moving around, but he can't discern the specific actions due to the closed door. He contemplates the potential danger of staying exposed in the hall and wonders if he should just attack. Considering the need to avoid a situation where he might have to fight two enemies at once, he tries to look out and says just go in, and he has to trust himself. After a while, the system notifies him about Gaiam State, who is the commander of the Milsa Company at the Tumultuous Sky Pavilion. Gaiam's body is normal, and his health has 2205 points, with his Kai at 1820. 
Siolhui runs to attack him, and they both get ready to defeat each other. While engaged in the fight, the system notifies him that his health goes down 103 and his Kai goes down 108. Suddenly, Gaim twists his foot, presenting an opportunity for Siolhui, who thinks this is his chance, and he runs to stab him. The system further notifies him that Gaim uses a power strike, causing Gaim's health to fall down to 2,058, and his Kai also decreases by 16,002 points. Gaim is left coughing and bleeding. Siolhui thinks he doesn't get it and wonders why that window didn't appear to show Gaim's weakness. He tells him to just kill him, while Siolhui reflects that the window doesn't appear when his opponent has lost the will to fight. He decides he should end this and approaches him, questioning what he is looking for in the place. Gaim asks if he passed out, to which he explains that it's just in case someone ambushes him and that he should finish him off now. He points his sword at Gaim's neck. The system notifies him to select one of the options below, kill him or torture him. Siolhui is puzzled by the situation and Gaim questions why he hasn't killed him yet. He replies that Gaim is still awake and based on experience, it's better to torture someone than to kill them in this type of situation. Meanwhile, Siolhui states that he thinks he knows why, and Gaim asks what he means as Siolhui chooses the option to torture him. Siolhui grabs Gaim's shoulder, twisting his bones, and Gaim yells in pain. Siolhui reflects that this technique uses Kai to stimulate sensory nerves and then twists bones, causing intense pain. Siolhui demands answers and Gaim asks to answer what? Siolhui insists he knows exactly what he wants to know. Gaim, expressing disbelief, claims Siolhui is out of his mind. He threatens to repeat the torture and Gaim moves his hand forward to attack. Siolhui replies okay, he admits it. He then asks what this is. Gaim responds that he has something, and he presses him to elaborate. Gaim instructs him to look in his bandana, and as he removes it, the system notifies him that he has obtained part 1 of a treasure map, 1 over 7. He checks the treasure map's details, discovering it's a comprehensive map of all the treasures under the purple roofs in the Martial Art Academy, with a total of 10 treasures. Siolhui laughs in delight, and Gaim pleads for Siolhui to just kill him. Siolhui responds that he'll gladly find his pressure point and make it quick. The system, once again, notifies him to choose between killing or torturing Gaim more. Siolhui hesitates as he looks at the screen, considering his options and his possessions. The system notifies him that he has obtained part 7 of a treasure map 7x7 seven seven while Siolhui berates Gaim. He reflects that he can understand attempting to stab someone in the feet or legs, but trying to stab him in the butt is going too far. The system then notifies him that he has gathered all the pieces of the Martial Arts Academy Treasures map 7x7, and he attempts to check the map while turning to look at a scroll in a drawer. He considers that unless he's reading the map wrong, there should be a treasure in this drawer, so he tries to retrieve something from it. He realizes that although there is supposed to be a treasure here, it's missing. This explains why he was looking around so much, and he remarks that it means someone already took it, perhaps leaving the red bean jelly there as a mockery. He concludes that he'd better get moving before all the treasures are taken. Meanwhile, the system notifies him that he has obtained a guide to the mysteries of sound. He checks the tiles on the floor while following the sound opens a tile and discovers another martial tomb. He exclaims that's nice and asks if it is another martial art tome. He thinks to himself a first treasure. Tomes usually take time to learn, so they aren't very useful in situations like this, but not for him. The system then notifies him about the tomes, Tome of Invisibility, Cloaking and Mysteries of Sound New, and he has learned the mysteries of sound. As the wall breaks, revealing something, he considers it the second treasure. The system notifies him that he has obtained the formula for Chioma poison. He questions what formula for making poison this time is, as he looks at the book. He thinks he doesn't really need this right now. The system informs him that he has learned the formula for Chioma poison and remarks, but it can't hurt to learn it. Suddenly, something smashes the building, prompting him to point his sword toward the broken structure. He is concealed in a crack in the ceiling, being very clever as he retrieves an item from the ground, believing it to be the third treasure. Simultaneously, he receives a notification stating that he has acquired the advanced demon fist gloves. Wondering what advanced means, he reflects on his belief that all treasures are the same and questions the significance of the term. He speculates that the gloves do appear somewhat unusual and decides to try them on, wearing the gloves. 
The system informs him that he has acquired the basic skill Wind Fist and his understanding of the incendiary field has increased. The system then provides information about the gloves, describing them as a treasured item of Jiang Guan Nok, the 34th in the hierarchy of the demon cult. Pondering Jiang Guan Nok's identity, he considers him to be one of the leaders of the demon cult's central administration and assumes him to be exceptionally powerful. Reflecting on the perilous nature of life at the martial art academy, he concludes that investing in high-quality gear is a prudent decision given that any moment could be their last. He observes that people who graduate from the martial arts academy are treated well, understanding the reason behind it. He mentions that he has discovered three treasures so far, one of which has been taken by someone else. He feels the urgency to move quickly before the remaining treasures are also claimed. As he crumples the map, he declares that it's time to go and steps out. The system informs him that he possesses three out of ten treasures and descends the stairs. Hearing voices, though unable to comprehend them, he approaches another room where guards converse. He discreetly observes them and tries to listen carefully. The system provides a state summary, revealing Mujong as a member of the Seven Dragon Company at the official Demon Palace. His health is at 2305 points and his Kai is at 2510 points. He advises him to leave and not interfere with them. Gamja asserts that he is quite confident they could defeat them with their synchronized attacks, while Sialhui examines his status window, revealing that he is Gamja, a member of the Seven Dragon Company at the official Demon Palace. His health stands at 3,203 points, and his Kai is at 2,920 points. He then scrutinizes another person's details, Siati, a member of the Demon Dragon Company at the Crimson Demon Palace. Siati's health is recorded at 2,901 points, with his Kai at 1,620 points. He comments that he can discern Gamja is from the official Demon Palace, emphasizing that their paired attacks are weak. Salyu intervenes, cautioning against foolishness and predicting that they will end up getting themselves killed if they persist. He reviews Salyu's status screen, identifying him as a member of the Demon Dragon Company at the Crimson Demon Palace. Salyu's health is noted at 4,500 points, and his Kai is at 4,670 points. He contemplates the official Demon Palace and the Crimson Demon Palace, recognizing them as two of the four pillars that support the central administration of the Demon Cult. He notes that the Crimson Demon Palace oversees the Great Imperial Pavilion and the Tumultuous Sky Pavilion, placing these individuals in the upper-level palaces. This is likely why they are significantly stronger than Jiakmyong, and he perceives each of them as even more powerful than Jiakmyong, the captain of the Great Imperial Pavilion's Black Moon Company. Observing that they are on the verge of fighting each other, he questions the necessity of engaging in a conflict right in front of where their treasure is hidden. He ponders his options, acknowledging that he is stronger than them individually. However, he realizes that he is not strong enough to defeat all of them simultaneously. He wishes he could assess their offense and defense to make more accurate calculations, but unfortunately, such information doesn't appear unless in special cases. While they engage in combat, he watches and contemplates their actions, acknowledging that in theory, the best course of action would be to carefully calculate his next move instead of impulsively intervening. However, he also recognizes that he cannot simply walk away from the situation. He acknowledges that he will never attain the level of power he desires unless he takes some risks, a lesson learned through experiencing death a few times. The system notifies him of a golden opportunity, revealing that he has identified a weakness in Gamja, a member of the Seven Dragon Company. The system presents options for how he would like to respond, attack, use martial arts, use the toolkit, or approach the enemy anew. Contemplating the situation, he thinks that it might be a good time to attack Gamja since he is already down. He hesitates, not wanting to make a decision at the moment, and wonders about the new option of approaching the enemy. As he examines this option, he notices that there are only five seconds remaining. Considering that choosing to use martial arts to eliminate Gamja would only address one of the four enemies, he realizes that using Kai would prompt all of them to attack him simultaneously. Frustrated, he thinks damn it, he doesn't know what to do, but whatever. The system notifies him that he has chosen to approach the enemy and asks if he would like to move to the east, west, south, or north. Pondering the options, he wonders about the significance of these directions and whether he has to choose one of the four spots. He considers the possibility of instant movement, finding it incredible. Placing his hand on his sword, he takes a moment to think, 
relieved that there doesn't seem to be a time limit as time is still on pause. Examining the positions of Salyu and Gamja in the center of the room to the west, with Gamja's partner Majong to the south, he notes that the east and the north appear relatively safe. Recognizing that Salyu and Siati are not as close and there is some distance from Majong, he contemplates how to reduce the number of variables. He realizes the need to eliminate two individuals from different palaces simultaneously to create confusion. This way, he believes neither of the remaining two individuals will be in a hurry to attack him if they both lose their partner. He thinks because either of them could stab the other one in the back at any moment and thinks all right, he chooses north. The system notifies him that he has chosen north, now continuing, and thinks it all happened in the blink of an eye. Suddenly, he is right next to Gamja, and he turns toward him just a second late, but by that point, it is already too late. Sioe runs to attack Gamja, stabs him, and gets a notification that the deadly strike dealt 2631 damage. Gamja's health reaches zero quickly while he coughs and bleeds. He thinks he thought he stood a pretty good chance in this fight, in fact, he was sure of it. He thinks he doesn't know why these divine opportunities started coming his way, but they never cease to amaze him. The system notifies him that he has found Majong's weakness, also found Siadi's weakness, and also found Salyu's weakness. He thinks these opportunities are absolutely incredible and gets ready for the attack. The system notifies him that it's a golden opportunity and asks how he would like to respond. The system notifies him that Demon Dragon Company member Salyu has been selected, uses martial arts, and Xiaohui runs to attack while he receives another message that shows him two options, Chojuk School and Explosive Field Basic. He utilizes some skills to attack Salyu, throwing him away, and receives a notification that it's a deadly strike, causing Salyu's health points to fall to zero, resulting in his death. He remarks that the skill is incredible and checks his status window, which indicates that his Kai points have fallen to 3200. He thinks he lost about half of his Kai, but considering how powerful the attack was, it's worth it. He reflects that he was too focused on killing Salyu, and it's already too late to dodge the attack. He wears his demon fist gloves and attacks Siati, who is ready to counterattack, and asks how he blocked that. Siolhui attacks him again, throwing him away, and the system notifies him that he executes a powerful strike on Siati, causing his health points to fall to zero, resulting in his death. Meanwhile, Siolhui's Kai also falls by 200 points while Mujong looks at him, and Siolhui says it looks like he has gathered all the bamboo sticks he needs. Mujong tries to attack Xiaohui while the system notifies him that his opponent has taken 675 damage, then 552 damage. Because of a deadly strike, his opponent has taken 1078 damage, and Mujong's health goes down to zero, resulting in his death. Xiaohui declares it's over, while the system notifies him that he has obtained one nine heart pill of protection one demon spirit pill, one blue dragon spear, one willow leaf dagger, one imperial full body armor, and one red chain dagger. He laughs and says look at all this stuff and remarks great. He has six bamboo sticks now. That's enough to pass the test. Deciding that he doesn't require the spear or the daggers, he plans to discard them and decides to check the special pills he obtained. The system notifies him about the Nine Heart Pill of Protection, describing it as a mixture of leftover grain and eggs, with the effect of boosting health by 300 and a sweet taste. Another message informs him about the Demon Spirit Pill, a medicinal pill crafted from various medicines, with the effect of increasing Kai by 270 and a bitter taste. Expressing a bit of disappointment, he wonders about the efficacy of these pills. Shortly after, he receives a message indicating that he now possesses an imperial full body armor, and he proceeds to put it on. Chuckling, he remarks that it appears even better than the heavenly silver armor, though he acknowledges the difficulty in confirming this as he cannot view the detailed stats. He declares, now then, let him check the most important thing of all, as he gazes at the chest. Wondering about its contents, he lifts the lid. The system notifies him that he has discovered one red bean jelly. Puzzled, he thinks it's strange why he keeps finding red bean jellies in these treasure chests. He contemplates the pattern, noting that red bean jellies consistently appear in places where he expects to find treasure. He speculates whether someone is intentionally placing them, or if it has a connection to his experiences in his previous life. Unexpectedly, Oma attacks him from behind, but he swiftly evades the assault, jumping away and preparing for a counterattack. Oma expresses surprise, admitting he didn't think the protagonist was that strong. 
Siolhui, in turn, asks for Oma's identity. Checking Oma's status window, he learns that Oma is the commander of the Suresian Company at the Crimson Demon Palace, with health at 43,050 points and Kai at 5,950 points. Oma inquires if Siolhui knows him, and Siolhui thinks he might understand why the chest is empty and why he consistently finds red bean jelly. If his assumption is correct, the chest should contain the special pills that have contributed to his significant growth in this life, specifically, the physical boost pill and the blue lotus pill. Reflecting on Oma's health, Siolhui notes that it was 4650 in his last life, but this time it's 4350, a decrease of 300 health points. Oma suggests they postpone their confrontation to another time, emphasizing that he just arrived and has nothing to gain from killing Siolhui. Siolhui recalls his prior search of the building, realizing it was much later than the current time. He speculates that Oma might not have been strong enough to defeat the four individuals who were present then, surmising that they were likely ambushed by Oma while engaged in their own conflict. He suggests asking a question, inquiring about Siolhui's intended destination upon leaving the building. Mentioning the possibility of not wanting to encounter each other again, he looks at Oma, who nods in agreement. Oma shares that he plans to go to the building with a yellow roof, expressing confidence in having an easier time defeating whoever is inside. Siolhui, realizing that the yellow-roofed building is where he encountered Oma in his last life, concedes that there's no point in struggling if it can be avoided but asserts that he's heading to the yellow-roofed building. He emphasizes that Oma can choose to go elsewhere if he prefers. Oma agrees, stating that it's fine with him. Siolhui poses another question, prompting Oma to turn towards him. Siolhui wonders when they will have the chance to face formidable opponents, remarking that everyone around seems weak. Surprised, Oma asks if he's kidding and speculates that no one briefed him on the details before his arrival. Oma acknowledges his own strength, conceding that he's formidable, but he asserts that his strength is limited to tonight. He explains that by tomorrow morning, a whole new level of powerful individuals will arrive, emphasizing the urgency to gather as many treasures as possible for survival. Siolhua, curious about the strength of these newcomers, inquires about their capabilities. Oma turns towards him and reveals that they are commanders representing the central administration's offices and pavilions. He bids farewell, wishing Siolhui good luck. Reflecting on this information, Siolhui deduces that these commanders represent the five pavilions and nine offices supporting the temple and the demon cult's central branch. He takes a deep breath, realizing that these commanders must be approaching the master level, with some potentially being true masters. To survive among them, he concludes that he needs to become stronger and keep moving. The system notifies him about the Nine Heart Pill of Protection, describing it as a pill made from a mixture of leftover grain and eggs with the effect of boosting health by 300 and a sweet taste. Another notification introduces the Demon Spirit Pill, a medicinal pill crafted from various medicines, boosting Kai by 270 and having a bitter taste. Siolhui decides to use these special pills, consuming them to experience a rapid increase in both health and Kai. Arriving at a house, Siolhui peers inside discreetly and thinks to himself that everything appears just as he expected, with Chiako sitting near a deceased individual. Recognizing the similarity to his experiences in his last life, he urges himself to locate what he is searching for. The system notifies him of a golden opportunity, stating that he has identified Chiako's weakness and prompts him to choose how he would like to respond. Opting to approach the enemy, Siolhui enters the house. Chiako glances at him, and Siolhui reassures him, stating that if he intended to harm, Chiako would already be dead. He scans the surroundings and focuses on the deceased person, noting the presence of the heavenly silver armor. Confirming his suspicion, Siolhui realizes that items reappear in his toolkit upon resurrection, if not stored there. Meanwhile, Chiako inquires about Siolhui's intentions and examines Chiako's status screen. It reveals minor internal wounds, with health points at 2311 out of 2902 and Kai at 1120 out of 1630. Siolhui moves past Chiako and approaches the deceased person as the system notifies him of the presence of the heavenly silver armor. Reflecting on this, he realizes that he has already collected all the items he needs, rendering these additional ones unnecessary. He observes two more Shin and questions Chiako, asking if he is from the Great Imperial Pavilion and the leader of the Black Fire Company. Chiako confirms this and tosses the two Shin towards Siolhui, 
stating that he can keep them if he answers his questions. Chiako, curious about the inquiries, asks what Siolhui wants to know. Siolhui responds by asking if he has information about the other three tests Eon, SEO, and Pan tests. In turn, Chiako questions if no one provided him with information about this place before his arrival. Siolhui explains that they are given tests that they must pass and questions if that's the case. Chiako responds, stating that he himself is not aware of the test's details despite being advanced. Reflecting on Siolhui's choice of the Shin test as his first, Chiako speculates that he can somewhat understand. He proposes a deal, suggesting that if Siolhui answers his question, he will allow him to live. Siolhui agrees, under the condition that Chiako provides useful information. Chiako proceeds to reveal that the Academy's tests follow a specific order and it is impossible to pass them unless they are completed in sequence. Siolhui seeks clarification on what is meant by in order. Chiako explains that there are four tests in total, Shin, Eon, Seo, and Pan, and though he is uncertain of the exact order, he does know that the Shin test is the last one. Siolhui is shocked and asks if this is indeed the final test, grabbing Chiako for confirmation. Chiako affirms this, prompting him to question what happened to the Eon test, which he attempted after completing the Shin test in his last life. Chiako admits that he only became aware of this since being here, as the test organizers made it impossible for one person to gather all the treasures in advance. Observing the abundance of treasures in the vicinity, he realizes why he hasn't encountered formidable competition yet, it's because this is intended to be the final test. He reflects on Oma's earlier statement about the arrival of significantly stronger individuals tomorrow morning, recalling Oma's words, tomorrow morning guys on a whole other level will be here. Contemplating the situation, he decides that he must utilize the treasures in this place to face these formidable opponents. He deduces that the Shin test, created by the Academy, serves as a means to incite individuals with weak martial skills to engage in a life-or-death battle, an all-out war where the strongest claim the most loot. Acknowledging this, he expresses his belief in Chiako's explanation, but suggests that it might be better for him to escape while he still has the chance. Chiako responds, revealing that he plans on fleeing if he cannot find the desired treasures by midnight. Inquiring about the significance of midnight, Siolhui asks Chiako, who admits to having no clue. Chiako explains that by tomorrow morning individuals who have passed the other three tests will arrive. If Siolhui cannot find treasures that might enhance his chances against them, Chiako intends to leave. Curious about the strength of these newcomers, Siolhui asks for more information. Chiako describes them as individuals with the most potential, even within the demon cult's five pavilions and nine offices. He questions if this gives Siolhui an idea of their power. Chiako mentions that from the great imperial pavilion, Burring Shin, the captain of the Black Metal Company, will be present. Siolhui recognizes Burring Shin as the leader of one of the great imperial pavilion's seven companies. Simultaneously, the system notifies Siolhui of an important mission asking if he accepts the quest to eliminate Burring Shin. The completion reward for this mission is one blue dragon pill. Siolhui ponders the significance of this important mission to eliminate Burring Shin, contemplating the situation. After a while, the system notifies him about the blue dragon pill, an advanced special pill reportedly created by a scholar from India. It is said to increase health by 16,000 and raise Kai by 17,000. Siolhui contemplates the significance of this pill, wondering if it is what he thinks it is. Realizing the immense boost it provides more than a whole sexagenary cycle's worth of Kai and health, he decides that he definitely needs that pill. The system informs him that he has accepted the important mission, activating the target, Burring Shin. He is described as a trusted captain of the Lord of the Great Imperial Pavilion and the leader of the Black Metal Company. Renowned among the Great Imperial Pavilion's seven companies for their martial arts pills, Burring Shin entered the Martial Arts Academy on an assignment from Guai Sama, the Lord of the Great Imperial Pavilion. The system notifies him about activating the status window, resulting in his health points increasing by 300, Kai increasing by 270, and acquiring a new skill called Fighting Power, which has 30,000 points. He reflects that, with his elevated mind-reading level, he can now see his full status along with this new element called fighting power. The system then provides information about Burring Shin, stating that his martial arts level is almost at its maximum. Burring Shin's health is at 15,000 points, Kai at 12,000 points, and his fighting power stands at 70,000 points. 
Sialhui contemplates these formidable stats, acknowledging them as terrifying numbers. He wonders how he is supposed to defeat someone with a nearly maxed out martial art level. Considering the opportunities that have been coming his way, he speculates that using them might give him a chance to overcome this powerful opponent. Chiako inquires if there is anything else Sialhui wants to know. Xiaohui, curious about additional information regarding the tests themselves, asks if Chiako has any further insights. Chiako responds that he knows Pan signifies judgment, and according to what he has heard, a poison is released into the air when the time limit expires. He explains that passing the test within the time limit ensures survival, but failure results in death. Regarding the Eon test, Chiako has heard that someone poses a question, and if the answer is unsatisfactory, the individual is in trouble. Chiako admits uncertainty about the details of the CO test, but mentions that a book is provided and participants are assigned a problem from it. The task involves writing down the answer and submitting it. Chiako concludes by stating that's all he knows and asks if it is sufficient. Siolhoi agrees and Chiako excuses himself, stating he needs to return to collecting treasure before jumping out. Siolhui reflects that Jiuan deliberately withheld information, aiming for him to fail the tests. He vows that once he becomes stronger and survives this ordeal, he will make sure to seek revenge by ending Jiuan's life. Siolhui takes a seat and engages in meditation, intending to spend the remaining time searching for treasures in the yellow-roofed building. The system notifies him about the toolbox, revealing a new item called the Auxiliary Weapons Lightning Bomb. Siolhui acknowledges that the only useful item he found was a lightning bomb, recognizing that there are still many treasures left, but that the formidable opponents will arrive soon. Realizing the importance of recovering as much Kai as possible, he decides to focus on restorative breathing rather than continuing the treasure hunt. He expresses a desire to know more powerful Kai boosting techniques. The system then notifies him that his health has increased by 120 points, and his Kai has increased by 890 points. While meditating, he thinks it's dawn, time to get moving. He sits at the edge of a building and looks at the city. He wonders if it has already begun, and if he is too focused on restoring his Kai, not even hearing anyone come in, he knows he'd better move. The system notifies him that he is now using cloaking as he jumps from the building. He secretly moves forward from one building to another, hides behind a wall, and sees a person running. Burring Shin attacks that person from behind, killing him. Another person hides behind a rock, trembling and says, that guy is a beast. He asks how the hell he is supposed to fight people like that while looking at Burring Shin's sword. He mentions it's a good thing he found this spot to hide, just as he cuts him into two pieces and laughs. Siolhui thinks it's just a slaughter when he breaks another building and throws two people down. He reflects that the calm night air is now filled with the smell of blood because of these early morning intruders. He believes it's basically a one-sided massacre, while the system notifies him about the target. Siolhui jumps down from the building and wonders how he managed to survive dealing with these people in his last life. He runs, thinking they even hunt down and kill people in hiding. He considers if it's because of cloaking, as far as his skills go, that's the only possible explanation, or is there some other reason why he hides? Chiako is badly injured and tries to walk out, asking why he is doing this. Siolhui looks at him and thinks he's still here. He must have been dead set on getting more treasures, and Burring Shin just feels like it. Siolhui thinks he's Burring Shin. He wonders why they are fighting each other when they're both from the Great Imperial Pavilion. Chiaku says when the Lord of the Great Imperial Pavilion finds out about this, he'll be sorry. Burring Shin asks if he really thinks so and says unfortunately for him, he has already made a deal with him. He shakes his head and says he told him he can get rid of anyone who's only after the treasures. Meanwhile, Chiaku is being abused and he is about to be attacked, but Burring Shin quickly stabs him and throws him away. Burring Shin remarks that the silly little company leader is so pathetic. Siolhui looks at him and thinks he killed him just like that, and Chiako doesn't even stand a chance. Burring Shin says that aside from the bamboo sticks, all he has is a bunch of junk, while he takes his sticks and says he didn't expect much from this loser anyway. Siolhui thinks he has been watching him for a while now, but that window offering him a surprise attack still hasn't appeared. He wonders what he should do and realizes something. That's right. He throws a lightning bomb thinking he'll distract him with this and waits for a chance to ambush him. He thinks it's worth a shot. Burring Shin is completely focused on Chiako right now, and this may be his only chance to attack. 
After a while, the system notifies him that he cannot open his toolbox and he becomes scared, wondering what this is. The system again notifies him that a nearby enemy is aware of his presence and instructs him to distance himself from the enemy. He thinks damn it, even with cloaking activated, he still managed to hear him. He believes he'd better get away. Burang Shin comes out and see all Hui runs away while thinking he saw him. The system notifies him about a golden opportunity. He has found his weakness. It asks how he would like to respond to attack, use martial arts, use the toolbox, and approach the enemy. He thinks that was lucky. Should he use martial arts? No, from this distance, he can't finish him off in one hit. The system notifies him that he has chosen to approach the enemy and asks where he would like to move. He thinks he'll choose this one, selects the north option, and believes it's too late. He attacks Burang Shin, who blocks his attack. He wonders how Burang Shin defended himself so quickly and Burang Shin falls down. The system notifies him about a golden opportunity. He has found Burang Shin's weakness and it asks how he would like to respond. He thinks it appears again and wonders if it's because he tripled. While using martial arts and the explosive field, he attacks Burang Shin. He receives a notification that he executes a power strike, dealing 8,210 damage to Burang Shin, and his Kai also decreases by 2,405 points. Xiaohui also loses his 2,200 Kai points. He quickly uses the Sohui school to attack him, targeting his head, and his health decreases by 410 points more. Xiaohui thinks not to give him a chance to rest and employs Demon Fist gloves, using Wind Fists to attack him which results in his health decreasing by an additional 640 points. Meanwhile, he declares he's not done yet and employs Sohui School and Wind Fist together to attack him with full force, throwing him away. Burang Shin's health points decrease by 1120 and he thinks he blocked that too. The system notifies him of a golden opportunity. He has found his weakness and it asks how he would like to respond. He thinks there it is. The system issues a warning that Burang Shin has found his weakness and asks how he would like to respond. He thinks what the hell, a golden opportunity and a warning at the same time. The system provides options, attack, use martial arts, use the toolbox, and approach the enemy, along with other options to fight back, defend himself, and run away. He contemplates what he should do while the timer rapidly counts down, considering whether he should go three seconds back in time if he chooses to attack. At least he can briefly turn back time, allowing him to see what he does, but the problem is that he's exposed too. He contemplates fighting back, defending himself, or running away and is unsure which one to choose. Time runs out and he chooses the attack option. The system notifies him that he has chosen to attack and to act quickly. He also chooses the fight back option, reacting quickly. He thinks he went back in time by three seconds, just as he expected. This is both an opportunity and an emergency, and he has found his weakness too. He thinks he'd better prepare himself instead of attacking and wonders what he's going to do now. Here he comes, attacking him again. Burang Shin attacks Xiaohui, giving him a cut on his face. Here he comes, attacking him again. Burang Shin attacks Xiaohui, giving him a cut on his face. Xiaohui receives a notification that his Kai points have decreased by 4230. He thinks that was Burang Shin's sword aura, and it's a good thing he braced himself for it just in case, otherwise he would be dead. He reflects that if he got lucky, he might have killed Burang Shin first, but he would have gotten hurt too. One positive aspect is that Burang Shin used up a lot of Kai just now. Even if he can create another sword aura, it won't be as strong as the one just now, which means Xiaohui definitely has the upper hand in terms of health and Kai. Burang Shin asks who he is, and he replies that he is just one of his subordinates. Burang Shin inquires about the meaning of subordinate and whether he belongs to the Great Imperial Pavilion. Xiaohui responds that it's none of his business and runs to attack him. He receives a message that his health points fall by 1200 and Kai points fall by 618. There's another attack on him, and Burang Shin also loses 852 health points and 880 Kai points. Meanwhile, Xiaohui thinks he has more health than Burang Shin, but he's a bit low on Kai. If he lets him hit him, it could be risky, but he doesn't have time to worry about that. He thinks he should just keep the pressure on him, attacks him again, and receives a notification that his defense failed, causing his health to decrease. However, the attack is successful, and he deals damage to Burang Shin. The system notifies him that his dodge attempt failed, resulting in his health decreasing. 
Nonetheless, his strike is successful, dealing damage to Burang Shin, and they both inflict damage on each other, causing their health to decrease. They both attempt to defeat each other, and his health falls down to 4,872 points, with his Kai also decreasing by 1,050 points. Burang Shin's health decreases to 2,774 points, with his Kai falling by 1,505 more points. He thinks he's strong, the longer they fight, the smaller the difference between their health points becomes at this rate. Burang Shin challenges him, telling him not to dare relax while fighting, and attacks him, but he successfully blocks the attack. He thinks it wasn't supposed to be a jab. He decides to change his attacks and plans to attack first. They both attack each other again, trying to defeat one another. The system issues a warning that he has found his weakness and asks how he would like to respond, fight back, defend himself, or run away. He thinks, damn it, the three options depend on the enemy's distance and movements. He believes fighting back means he has to get right up close to the enemy, so unless he's stronger than them, it could be risky. Defending himself is suitable for when he's a bit farther away, judging from the enemy's distance and movements. That would probably be the best option here, and running away may make it easier to avoid the enemy's attack. He thinks, but he has to turn his back to the enemy so he could end up getting killed. The system notifies him that he has chosen to defend himself. Continuing, he attacks, and the system again notifies him, stating that the defense failed, causing his health to decrease. See Alhui's health points decrease by 1081, and his Kai also falls by 80 points. He thinks he was way quicker than he thought. Burang Shin's health reaches 994, and his Kai also falls 320 more points. He thinks he lost his health advantage because of that attack and walks towards Xiaohui. He asks if he's starting to feel the difference between them and says he doesn't know if he found a bunch of treasure here, but that's all he has. He says he's a loser, and he's a chosen one, and there's nothing he can do about it. He's not just bluffing. He thinks Burang Shin has strong fighting instincts and a lot of hands-on experience in battle. He thinks no wonder he carries out the main duties of the Great Imperial Pavilion as well as serving as captain of the Black Metal Company, the only one of the six companies where promotion is guaranteed, but don't be ridiculous. He says he thinks he's the only chosen one. Burang Shin says he has had enough of this and tries to attack him, saying die but Xiaohui escapes from that attack and thinks his sword aura spun around and stabbed him while he gets hurt. Burang Shin says he's not done yet and attacks him again, and Xiaohui yells because of the pain. The system notifies him that it's a deadly strike, with him delivering a fatal blow to him. Xiaohui tries to get up and checks his health points, which fall to 243, and his Kai also reaches 542. Burang Shin walks towards him while Xiaohui can't see him clearly, and his eyesight becomes blurry. He thinks he has lost too much blood, so he can hardly see. Standing with the support of a wall, Xiaohui takes a moment while Burang Shin approaches him and remarks that, despite being a loser, he has fought quite well and managed to put up a decent fight. He commends him for his effort, at least. Xiaohui considers that if this is how it is going to end, he might as well take a chance. He jumps out of the window, contemplating the accuracy of his guess. Burang Shin, noticing his move, questions where he thinks he's going and swiftly follows suit, jumping behind him. The system notifies Xiaohui that he has a golden opportunity to exploit Captain Burang Shin's weakness within the Black Metal Company. It asks how he would like to respond. Xiaohui, feeling pleased, exclaims that he has found the weakness. He reviews the options, attack, use martial arts, utilize the toolbox, or approach the enemy. Convinced that he has identified the weakness, Xiaohui believes it doesn't matter what kind of situation he's in. Activating this window seems crucial. He considers that as long as he finds an enemy's weakness, it always becomes apparent, and his guess was correct. If he were to attack now, he'd be dead anyway. Moreover, he acknowledges that he doesn't even have the strength to launch an attack. The system notifies him that he has chosen to use the toolbox and ops for the recovery option, consuming a red bean jelly with one bite missing. He contemplates the idea of using the auxiliary weapon, the lightning bomb. However, he realizes that, at the moment, his top priority is to survive at all costs. The system notifies him that he has used a healing potion, resulting in a health boost and the cessation of his bleeding while they both fall. He observes his health points increasing by 1,025 points. Upon reaching the ground, Xiaohui prepares to launch an attack. 
Burang Shin looks at him and questions how he was practically dead just a minute ago. Xiao Hui responds by stating that he informed him he is also a chosen one, as his sword starts to shine. Xiao Hui charges towards Burang Shin, reflecting on how formidable he is. Despite Burang Shin's efforts to block his attacks, Xiao Hui strikes with such force that he can't defend himself. Xiao Hui believes it's time to conclude the encounter and launches another powerful attack. The system notifies him of a bullseye and Burang Shin is severely injured, with his status window indicating that his health points have dropped to zero. Consequently, he falls to the ground, succumbing to defeat. Xiao Hui's status window updates him on his own health, revealing it has reached 243 out of 7708. Additionally, his Kai has fallen to 242 out of 7070. Xiao Hui, sitting down, laughs and asserts that he is stronger than Burang Xin, acknowledging that there's no denying it. He attributes his victory to luck in that particular fight. Meanwhile, the system notifies him that his mission is accomplished, and as a reward, he has received a blue dragon pill. In disbelief, he questions whether he is dreaming, expressing astonishment at having acquired a blue dragon pill. He explains that these pills boost health and Kai by over 10,000, considering them even more valuable than the treasures found in the academy. Reflecting on this, he believes that now, with a blue dragon pill, whatever else happens, at least this life was worthwhile. Determined to make the most of the situation, he decides to extract what he can from Burang Shin and leave quickly. So Ryong arrives and inquires whether he managed to kill Burang Shin. He turns to see who she is, and she approaches, acknowledging that he didn't catch Burang Shin by surprise, which she finds impressive. She further adds that she didn't expect to encounter someone so strong in this location. He simply stares at her as she continues, mentioning that she knows he's from the Great Imperial Pavilion, but warns that he won't last long in the academy, smiling confidently. She runs away, affirming that he did kill Burang Shin, expressing the hope of seeing him again, and stating that, for now, if he'll excuse her, she's kind of busy. He remains seated, reflecting that all he could do was sit there and stare at her. While some might consider him a fool for this honestly, there wasn't really anything else he could do. He checks her status screen, revealing her name as So Ryong of the Crimson Demon Palace. Her body is classified as normal, and her health points are 28,000, Kai is 24,000, with a fighting power of 90,000. Considering her even greater strength compared to Burang Shin, he doesn't dare to pursue her. The next morning, Xiao Hui sits under a tree, takes a nap, and contemplates his situation. He thinks about his past life, recalling how he hid here before leaving for the academy, realizing that he only has two lives left. He checks his status screen and notices that his health points and Kai are very low. Contemplating whether he should take the blue dragon pill to boost his stats in this life or save it for later, he weighs the decision. If he takes the blue dragon pill, he anticipates having even better stats than Burang Shin. However, with the presence of early morning intruders, he worries about the possibility of being outnumbered and failing the test, resulting in a complete failure in his next life. Not only would he fail the Martial Arts Academy's test, but he would also face a much harder time defeating Burang Shin. Deciding to wait before taking the pill, he observes a rabbit appearing in front of him. Reflecting on his past experience, he wonders how he managed to pass the test last time, considering that the beasts hunted down and killed even those in hiding. Recalling that he stayed in this location last time and then walked right over to the academy entrance, he contemplates the challenges ahead. Meanwhile, he arrives at the gate of the academy and reflects that nobody even tried to stop him. He decides that, for now, he'd better place the Demon Fist gloves in his toolbox, considering them the best weapon he has in the academy, and he's determined to hold on to these gloves. While they may not be the ideal item for him, given his preference for sword techniques, they have helped him survive a few close calls. Considering the Imperial full body armor, he concludes that it's pretty worn out now, so there's probably no need to bother putting it in the toolbox. However, when it comes to the Shadow Slicing Sword, he encounters a problem as his toolbox won't open. Frustrated, he tries to open it and wonders what's wrong. Suddenly, he exclaims well, what do they have here as he jumps. Gaoyal arrives and Xiaohui thinks to himself that this guy has appeared again the one he saw before. Gaoyal comments on Xiaohui's speed, prompting Xiaohui to check Gaoyal's status screen. 
It reveals that Galliol is the captain of the Seven Dragon Company at the official Demon Palace, with health at 25,000 points, Kai at 22,000, and fighting power at 63,000 points. Siolhui realizes that he didn't know there was an enemy nearby, which explains why his toolbox wouldn't open. Though his stats are similar to Burang Shin's, Siolhui acknowledges that he is currently too weak to fight him. Contemplating that this might be the end for him, Siolhui hears him advising him not to bother wasting time trying to escape. Gaoyol waves his sword, declaring that Siolhui is already dead. Despite the grim situation, he decides that if he's going to die, he might as well die fighting. Drawing his sword, he runs towards him, preparing to launch an attack. After a while, a warning is given by the system, informing him that Gaoyal has identified his weakness. It asks how he would like to respond whether to fight back, defend himself, or run away. He considers whether it is because Gaoyal is much stronger than him and speculates that Gaoyal may have attempted to attack him first. However, he finds himself already at a disadvantage before even having the chance to swing his sword. He believes there is only one thing he can do as the system notifies him that he has chosen to defend himself and is now continuing. Gaoyal approaches, kicking him away. He falls down and Gaoyal advances, launching an attack. Siolhui yells in pain and the status window shows a notification that Bullseye Gaoyal has dealt 235 damage to him. He coughs, trembles and attempts once again to hold his sword. Gaoyal laughs and remarks that Siolhui doesn't give up easily. He asks what he thinks he can possibly do to him and questions the point of all this struggle. Gaoyal sits near him, grabs his hair, and declares that guys like him should just accept that they're like dirt to him. Siolhui thinks he finally understands and responds, saying that if he wants to step on him, he can let him. After all the extra lives he has gained, Gaoyal suggests that if Siolhui wants to hit him, he should stay still. Siolhui, lying there dying, reflects on the need to get stronger. Gaoyal then says that if he wants to be killed, he can die. Siolhui contemplates the reason why he needs to get stronger, realizing that stopping means dying and allowing others to treat him like dirt. He resolves to stand up and rise above the filth. The system window notifies him that he is now using the Grand Ship's sword technique. Siolhui quickly employs his sword to attack Gaoyal, resulting in a blast. Gaoyal is badly injured, and a notification confirms it as a deadly strike. Gaoyal's health points decrease to 21,830 and his Kai falls to 12,555. Siolhui waves his sword, which shines again. The system notifies Siolhui that his health points have only fallen by 4 points. Gaoyal observes this and asks what the hell is this? Siolhui laughs and coughs extensively. He contemplates that he can't believe the secret to activating the Grand Ship Sword technique. He acknowledges it's his own fault, bringing this upon himself, and thinks about the need to move his head in a certain way. Gaoyal expresses his outrage, questioning how Siolhui dared to do that. He reflects on the unfortunate fact that he was too weak to use his sword aura at full blast. Siolhui laughs once more, mentioning that he's stuck there, and adds that others would pounce on him if they saw him so badly injured. He verbally abuses him, taking his sword again. Siolhui wonders if this is the end for him and reflects that, well, this life wasn't too bad. At least he got a blue dragon pill and learned how to use the grand ship sword technique, but for some reason. Meanwhile, the system notifies him of a golden opportunity it has found Gaoyal's weakness. He considers that this opportunity has just appeared and he doesn't even have the energy to lift a weapon at the moment, let alone stand up and fight. However, he realizes he needs weapons. The system instructs him to use the toolbox, asking what he would like to use. He chooses the lightning bomb. The system notifies him that he is now using the lightning bomb and believes he has something he can use. As Gaoyal runs to attack him, he throws the bomb, resulting in an explosion. The system informs him that he has executed a deadly strike, dealing a fatal amount of damage to him, who is now dead. He receives a notification that his health has also fallen by two more points. He reflects on how incredible it was, as the explosion tore Gaoyal to shreds and destroyed everything around him without harming himself. He acknowledges that he has beaten him, but with wounds like these, he knows he won't last much longer either. He crawls to find a safe place. He contemplates the necessity of acquiring Gaoyal's belongings as his health points fall by one more. He hopes that there is something useful among Gaoyal's possessions if he dies in this manner. He considers it would be a waste of the lightning bomb if he were to perish now. 
remembering he has the red bean jelly, he believes there's still some left and decides to use it. The system notifies him that he has recovered some health, with his health increasing by just two points. He acknowledges that he is just a little bit further, only to lose two more points of health. The system then notifies him that he has obtained five health potions, along with one warrior spirit blade, one fruit of a thousand shades, one blood freezing moss, one high quality short armor, one map of martial art academy shin test, and one martial art academy test order and information sheet. Lying on the floor, he contemplates the shadow slicing sword, realizing he must retrieve it. Unfortunately, his health points fall to zero, and the system notifies him that this is his last life. In the year 95 of the Heavenly Calendar, Chapter 2, three options are presented by Ganma, and the system begins tuning back in time. After a while, he stands again in front of Ganma, and the system notifies him that he needs to choose one of the following three options. Become Ganma's foot soldier, become Ganma's bodyguard, or become Ganma's secret assassin. The system informs him that he has chosen to become Ganma's foot soldier. He acknowledges this and instructs him to get to work as he walks away, waving his hand to signal him to follow. Sioe calls out to him, mentioning that he has something to tell him. Ganma stops and looks at him. Siolhui shares that he discovered something by accident, but it's a rather sensitive issue. He assures Ganma that he is already a part of this and advises him not to worry, encouraging him to share what he knows. Siolhui bows down, confirming his commitment, and thinks it may be a gamble, but he needs to make sure of something. He asks Ganma what he would like him to do if he found a spy who's monitoring him on behalf of another disciple. Ganma walks away and asks who the spy is, remarking that it's to be expected as everyone gets involved in things they didn't bargain for when becoming one of Chenma's disciples. He acknowledges that it has certainly been true for him ever since he became one, and he reflects that despite being one of the top hundred warriors in the demon cult, Ganma prefers to remain in the shadows. During their conversation, he gets a sense of how much Ganma has struggled just to stay alive this long. Ganma inquires of him, asking if it is him. Siolhui confirms and says that's right. Ganma continues walking, advising him that if he finds any clues about this spy on his way to the academy, he should come to see him right away. He mentions he'll be at the Yuan Palace. Siolhui thinks about where the Yuan Palace is and realizes it's a rest area exclusive to Chen Ma's disciples. He contemplates that ordinary warriors within the demon cult are not allowed near the palace, and anyone approaching it without a valid reason can be executed on the spot. He considers that it would be even better if he could bring the spy to Ganma and smile. Siowi bows down, acknowledging the instruction, and thinks about bringing the spy to Ganma. Reaching the basement of the Heavenly Sun Archive, he reflects on the reason why he mentioned the spy to Ganma. It was so that he wouldn't have to go to the academy, and he needed to use this life to come up with an alternate plan. He acknowledges that there's still some valuable treasure there, but now that he knows how powerful those early morning warriors are, it's too risky. He thinks he needs to bring Jioan to Ganma. The system notifies him that his health points are at 118 out of 120, and his Kai is at 250 points. He considers that, unfortunately, he can't use the red bean jelly that he had eaten just before dying for the last time. He inquires about the items he obtained from Gawiol, and the system notifies him of a warrior spirit blade, Gawiol's exclusive weapon, and a high-quality short armor, a favorite item of Soruk, Lord of the Bisang Pavilion. Its effect is to block some attacks without any damage. Additionally, he acquires Blood Freezing Moss, a moss found on a thousand-year-old frozen bloodstone, with the effect of boosting health and Kai by a certain amount. He also obtains a fruit of a thousand shades, a fruit of a rejuvenation plant that survived in an underground shades area for over 1,000 years and its effect boosts health and Kai by over 3,000. He acknowledges that at least he got one good item, the fruit of a thousand shades. The system notifies him that he has used blood freezing moss. Siolhui's health increases by 820 and his Kai increases by 540 points. He contemplates that finally he can use that. The system notifies him that he has used the blue dragon pill, and his health and Kai have increased significantly. His health increases to 16,335, and his Kai increases to 17,791. He reflects on the amazing effects of the pill, feeling his body overcoming its own limits. Dozens of veins in his body open up automatically, and the resulting vigor passes through his lower abdomen, flowing into his whole body with his sharpened senses. 
he realizes that he can now hear people walking on the floors above him and the sound of objects being lifted. He can even distinguish who made the sounds and hear the faintest cough. The system notifies that his mind reading level has increased and his passive skill in mind reading reaches an elementary level. He has learned the Sohui school, mastered the incendiary field at Jiaksu school, and acquired proficiency in the explosive field at Chojuk school. He walks away, saying last but not least, and his sword shines. The system informs him that the grand ship sword technique is now being activated as he practices with his sword. He laughs and acknowledges that this technique is truly remarkable. He believes he can sense a significant change in his life, thinking it will be completely different. The scene shifts to the Heavenly Sun archive in the basement. Siolhui reflects that he has been in the underground storeroom for a few hours now. He considers his main goal at the moment, to assess how quickly and efficiently he can activate the Grand Ship Sword technique. He acknowledges that the Grand Ship Sword technique is extremely powerful but also has a deadly disadvantage, especially since he is usually right-handed. He finds it challenging to hold the sword with his left hand while he readies his sword thinking that remembering the different sword positions is not the only issue. The process of activating the technique presents a bigger problem. He believes it takes too long to execute each move, and he realizes that his opponents won't just stand there and wait for him to activate the skill. He expresses a wish that he could somehow connect it to the Sohui technique and acknowledges that he better keep practicing. Meanwhile, Du Hong, the director of the Heavenly Sun Archive, is chewing something and asks what's all that noise. Siowi thinks Du Hong must have heard him practicing and apologizes. Du Hong responds by asking what on earth were he doing. Siowi explains that he was just doing a bit of training and realizes that he almost forgot about it. The system notifies him that Du Hong has one life and provides other details, such as having a mission to become Du Hong's pet, which upgrades to a combat type. Du Hong's health is at 3500 points, his Kai is at 3200 points, and his fighting power is 10,000. Siolhui questions what this mission is, examining its details. Meanwhile, Du Hong holds a stone piece in his mouth and spits it at Sahauhi, who quickly sidesteps and narrowly escapes. Du Hong states that he didn't tell him to move, berates him and spits another stone at him. This one hits his chest, and he remains still. Siolhui clenches his hand, contemplating whether to retaliate violently. He decides against it, opening his hand and telling himself to relax. He contemplates that he needs to think carefully about this and considers that breaking this guy's neck would be a piece of cake, but he ponders the potential consequences. He doesn't want anything to mess up his plan, and in this life, his main goal is to kill Jiawan. He bows down, offers his apologies, and decides to stand still. Du Hong, however, spits on his face again, expressing that he's glad he is here. Du Hong mentions how bored he has been lately, noting that the people passing through have been getting on his nerves. He suggests getting to know each other better and laughs. Siolhui considers whether he should just kill him, but he decides against it. The system notifies him that the mission is to become Du Hong's pet, rated 0 by 8, upgrading to combat type. He thinks about the reward and remembers the rule of the demon cult, obey the strong, which everyone is required to follow. In this environment, it's normal for superiors to dictate the very survival of their subordinates, and Du Hong doesn't need any reason or justification for bothering him. After a while, Siolhui reaches the outhouse and starts digging a hole in the ground. He declares to Du Hong to wait, as he plans to kill him as painfully and cruelly as possible. Meanwhile, the system notifies him that he has become Du Hong's pet, rated 1 over 8. Reflecting on his actions, he notes that he spent the entire night cleaning the outhouse and now has to dispose of all the waste. He mentions that this situation reminds him of Jiokmyong, and no matter how many times he's revived, he just can't seem to avoid such problems. Siolhui realizes he still has six more tasks to complete, and it's going to be brutal. He wonders what combat type means and hopes it's worth all the trouble. Hearing footsteps, Ibyok arrives and mentions that his stomach doesn't feel good. He asks Siolhui if he ate breakfast too quickly. The system notifies Siolhui about Ibyok's details, revealing that he is the director of the third floor of the Heavenly Sun Archive, with a health level of 2400 points, Kai at 2890 points, and fighting power of 8000. He looks at his details and wonders why this status window is here, speculating if someone is present, but he can't see their face. Suddenly surprised, he exclaims there's someone down here. Ibyok identifies himself as the person Du Hong mentioned, the new guy at the archive. 
He assumes he knows him because only the directors of the archive use this outhouse. Sialhui smiles and confirms that he's just doing his job. Ibyok, while removing his pants, remarks that it's good for Sialhui and encourages him to keep up the good work. He then expresses the urgency to go and sits down to relieve himself. Sialhui tells him to wait, insisting that he's right here, but Ibyok doesn't listen and begins using the outhouse. Sialhui observes that Ibyok seems to have diarrhea and verbally abuses him. Frustrated, Sialhui goes to the river to wash his face and takes a bath, contemplating how he should deal with the two individuals. He states that first, he'll beat them within an inch of their lives and laughs. Then, he plans to shove their faces into their own waist, step on them, and keep them in that condition until they are dead, deeming it perfect. Irritated, he shouts that he'll kill them both. The scene shifts to the basement of the Heavenly Sun archive, where Du Hong asks if Xiaohui is finished with the cleaning. Ibyok laughs, stating that it looked pretty clean to him. Du Hong asks if is that so. While Xiaohui looks at them and thinks that these two remind him of Guai Sama and Cho and Deng, he believes they enjoy coming up with new ways to humiliate him. Despite wanting to beat them up immediately, he restrains himself and affirms that everything is clean, smiling. The system notifies him that he has reached 2 out of 8 as Du Hong expresses satisfaction. Du Hong instructs Xiaohui to run a bath for him and Ibyok as he points towards Ibyok. Xiaohui replies, saying he'll do that right away. Du Hong then asks if Xiaohui washed his hands properly as Xiaohui walks out. Ibyok mentions he doesn't want to smell, and Xiaohui reassures him, saying there's no need to worry as he makes sure his hands are very clean. They both laugh a lot. Xiaohui looks at them, thinking that they should wait because he'll kill them if it's the last thing he does. Meanwhile, they hear footsteps, become scared, and quickly run out to greet a girl. Xiaohui wonders what the girl is doing there. Xiaohui checks her status screen, revealing that her name is Soryong of the Crimson Demon Palace. Her body is normal, with health points at 20,999, Kai at 21,000, and fighting power at 80,000. She inquires about Ganma, and Du Hong informs her that he is in the Yuan Palace. Satisfied with the response, she then looks at Xiaohui and asks who he is, mentioning that she has never seen him before. Du Hong whispers to her that he's a low-level grunt at the Great Imperial Pavilion and is currently responsible for sorting out the basement. She questions whether he's truly just a nobody, and Du Hong reaffirms that he's not worthy of her attention. She considers this for a moment, and then says, well, he seems pretty intriguing to him while smiling. Meanwhile, Xiaohui looks at her, and in that moment, just gazing at her is enough to make him feel like his heart has stopped. As she walks towards him, she asks for his name. He replies, Xiaohui, and she compliments him, saying it's a nice name. She adds that she's not sure how he ended up in the basement, but starts laughing secretly. She then speculates that there must have been a reason for his presence. Xiaohui thinks she can probably smell him, realizing that no matter how hard he tries, the smell won't come off because of those two individuals. She waves her hand and says see him around before walking out. Xiaohui also waves his hand and replies all right. Meanwhile, the system notifies him and asks him to select one of the options below. He wonders why there's another one of these options, as the system presents him with the following choices. The first option is whether he would like to go out with her, the second option is if he wants to spend a hot night with her, and the third option is whether he would like to feel his abs. The timer for this selection is only 10 seconds. He wonders about these options, realizing they didn't appear for nothing. It has always been like this as time ticks away. Despite how random the options may seem, he believes they almost always impact the near future. He thinks they put him in danger and then reward him for it. In some cases, he considers they might affect not only his current life, but also the options in his next life. With only three seconds left, he decides to go ahead. The system once again notifies him that he has chosen the option of wanting to go out with her. He asks if he could have a moment of her time, and everyone looks at him while she laughs. She states that she knew there was something different about him. He thinks she laughed again and wonders if he made the right choice, realizing she doesn't really seem upset that he's being so bold. Taking a breath, he contemplates the situation. After a while, the system notifies him to select one of the options below. The first option is whether he wants to spend a hot night with her, and the second option is if he would like to feel her abs. The timer is again set to 9 seconds. He thinks oh no, this is just like what happened with Ganma before, and he has no choice but to accept the consequences of his decision as time winds down. 
He asks himself what he should do and thinks wait, maybe he's approaching this the wrong way. He realizes that he has always tried to choose the lesser of two evils, but that ends up making things even worse. There were times when the worst choice turned out to be the best one, and he acknowledges that he'll probably end up having to choose all the options eventually, so he decides to take it like a man. The system notifies him that he has chosen to spend a hot night with her, and he looks at her, thinking she probably thinks he's a total lunatic. He says he knows that what he's saying probably sounds so strange. He reflects that he wasn't sure how he thought he could dig himself out of this, admitting that he keeps struggling constantly with the hope that things will get better. However, as he observes, he never seems to get anywhere. He mentions that he just got soaked in filthy water, yet he still couldn't stand up for himself. Despite this, he wanted to be brave and say something at least. He acknowledges that's why he's being so direct, even though he knows it won't get him anywhere. He clarifies that he just wants a reason to go on living. He understands this might be an insult to her, but meeting her is one of the best things that has ever happened to him. After experiencing death and killing others so many times, he admits that he suddenly got a bit emotional. He started out trying to make sure she wasn't angry at him, but it quickly turned into something completely different. He opened up to her, thinking he was just venting his frustration. She reassures him, saying she wasn't insulted, but he pardons himself. She clarifies that she said she wasn't insulted and thought he was being a bit too eager. He wonders if she means that, contemplating whether she didn't mind what he said. Ibyok shouts, asking if he has any idea who he's talking to, and assures her that they'll punish him for this outrage. Duhong also adds something, but she interrupts them, asking both of them to shut up. She bumps into both of them, causing them to fall down. She walks towards Siolhui again, while he looks at her. She puts her head on his shoulder and expresses her hope that he gets as strong as he wants. When he does, she declares that they'll get out of this hellhole together and then runs away, adding that she hopes to see him again sometime. Siolhui thinks about the term hellhole and never expected to hear someone from the demon cult call it that. He wonders who this woman is. He states that life is the sum of countless choices and the consequences determine their fate. While people usually say that they can't change their fate, he senses that this choice changed the courage in both of his past lives and the current one. He notes that it happened because of a word he had never seen above anyone before. He notices a notification appearing above her head indicating that she has three love lines and he thinks it suddenly appears over her head. After some time, he hangs clothes on wires while feeling something on his face. He smacks it, rubs his face, and remarks that those evildoers sure didn't hold back when they beat him. He still feels sore all over and attempts to lick his cheek, then laughs. The system notifies him about O King Myon's tunic, which is high-quality protective gear and battle armor made by a military tailor for the royal family of the great state. Its effects significantly boost defense. The system also notifies him about another item, a white spirit bomb, which is a type of explosive passed down orally in the imperial family and made of a dyed lightning bomb. Its effects are that when detonated, the explosive temporarily confuses enemies within a radius of 9 meters in front of him. The system notifies him about another item, O Understanding Swordsmanship, which is a book written 250 years ago by Elder Dajian while studying martial arts in the Central Plains. Its effect is to increase his understanding of sword techniques. He looks at all the items and comments look at all the good stuff those old bastards were hiding in here. He'll take this as payment for his cleaning. The system notifies him that becoming Du Hong's pet has reached 4 out of 8 now. He mentions that he should be done with this mission in the next few days and just needs to hang on until then. On another note, he didn't expect to meet another like-minded person here. He reflects that demonic martial art is a style of martial art that paralyzes his human rationality and makes him crave only power. He speculates that perhaps because of their desire to get stronger, people in the demon cult become addicted to power and end up being brainwashed as they hone their demonic martial arts abilities. He reflects that anomalies like him appear in the demon cult from time to time while squeezing clothes. He considers that these anomalies are people who refuse to be brainwashed and seek something better because they are suspicious of everything. He never imagined she would be one of those people too. He expresses the hope that he can see her again and thinks that he wants to get stronger, which is what he has always told himself because he is sick and tired of being humiliated like this. He acknowledges that now he has a clear reason to get stronger even though he is still so pathetically weak. 
However, if he gets strong enough, he thinks maybe he can get out of the demon cult with Soryong someday. He sincerely hopes that day comes soon. Du Hong instructs Xiao Hui to try punching a certain way and emphasizes that he has to bend his head. He continues with guidance, demonstrating how to hit him in a specific manner. He insists that Xiao Hui should listen to him and mentions that this is how he did it while tying Xiao Hui completely and delivering a powerful punch. Xiao Hui, confused, asks what this is and what he thinks while looking at them. Ibyok also rushes to punch him. Xiao Hui tells himself to stay calm, thinking he's almost there, while the system notifies him that becoming Du Hong's pet has reached 7 out of 8 points. Ibyok declares it's time for the finishing move and moves to strike, but he quickly tells him to hold on, requesting him not to do this. Despite his plea, Ibyok kicks Xiao Hui between his legs, causing him to scream in pain. Du Hong asks how was that, pointing out that's not what he meant, as he was not supposed to do that there. He suggests that he might need to show him himself and asserts, now, watch carefully, before attempting to punch Xiao Hui's face. However, Xiao Hui moves his face aside, causing Du Hong to miss his attack. Meanwhile, Du Hong asks if he just flinched, and Ibyok questions if he's out of his mind. Xiao Hui smiles, while Ibyok suggests that they knocked the sense out of him. He continues laughing because the system notifies him that the mission to become Du Hong's pet is completed, achieving 8 out of 8 points. Xiao Hui acknowledges that he's out of his god of mind. The system once again notifies him that he may now select combat type and can choose combat type at any time in normal circumstances. Ibyok asks what he just said and the system provides details about combat type. The first option is a turn-based fight and the second is an AI fight. Ibyok, angered, abuses him and attempts to attack him. However, Xiao Hui grabs his punch and declares that now he's going to make them both pay. He squeezes Ibyok's punch, stating it's for everything he has done to him over the last six days. Xiao Hui then kicks him between the legs, causing Ibyok to cry out in pain. Xiao Hui reflects that he felt it clearly, it was like two little balls of tofu bursting. That's the only way he can explain it. Du Hong abuses him and rushes to attack him, but Xiao Hui thinks he's too slow. He punches Du Hong away, then looks at him and asks if he's not already dead, noticing some foaming liquid coming out of his mouth. The system notifies him that Du Hong is dead. Xiao Hui grabs his shirt and shakes him forcefully, insisting that there is no way he can just die like that. He emphasizes that Du Hong needs to get up because he's not done with him yet, and he still has to pay for everything he did. He mentions that he can't just die like that while the system notifies him about combat type 2. The first option is a turn-based fight, which is a style of combat where participants take turns fighting. The second is the system window appearing when Xiao Hui either leaves himself exposed or senses danger, and time stops with options provided based on the type of attack. Xiao Hui checks the advantages of that combat type, realizing that he won't miss any opportunities. It is the most efficient method of attack, and he can use his toolbox in battle. He checks the disadvantages, noting that he may suffer more damage than usual if an enemy catches him off guard. The second disadvantage is that he is less focused in battle, and the third is that this mode may not be activated or time may not stop when he is faced with many enemies. He remarks that he sees this as how he has been fighting so far, and this is the new one. He looks at the AI notification that informs him AI is a style of combat involving artificial intelligence, and the user gives the system full control over the battle. The advantages are that it allows him to fight at his absolute best by analyzing every possible variable such as the physical state and weapons of the user and the enemy's weakness. Additionally, it allows the user to realize their full potential, and his combat skills improve as he gains experience. He observes the disadvantages, realizing that he can't interfere with the battle until it is over. The AI may take longer to make decisions when faced with many enemies, and he can't use his toolbox. He says that sounds pretty epic, maybe he should choose this. Meanwhile, Ibyok gets up, abuses him, and runs to attack him from behind. He realizes there's one more, and the system notifies him that AI will now initiate the battle. A flash appears, and he ascends into the air, feeling scared as he observes himself floating. He wonders what's happening, and if he's flying, then glances at the ground, realizing he's down there. It's like an out-of-body experience as Ibyok runs to attack him. He thinks Xiao Hui is moving, he's coming right at him. He flips and kicks him away, and his AI shadow looks at him surprisingly. 
He thinks it was more like a physical weapon than a martial art technique, dominating the other guy without using much power. The AI Shadow asks why he hasn't finished him off and why he's just standing there. He asks what's going on while the system notifies him that Pyagam, the general manager of Heavenly Sun Archive, has arrived. His body is normal, and his health is 74,050 points, his Kai is 8,909 points, and his fighting power is 30,000. Pyagam asks if did he this while Sialhui thinks he's not saying anything. Pyagam says he guesses there's no point in asking him anything and walks towards him. He thinks he's curious and wonders how the AI would deal with that guy. Based on his fighting power, he's not a very serious threat, but he's also not weak enough for him to let his guard down. He draws his sword, not holding anything, and contemplates his next move. Meanwhile, Pyagam holds his sword to take it out. Sialhui runs towards him, thinking of attacking first, but that's so risky. Pyagam abuses him, saying he'll teach him a lesson, and attacks him, but Sialhui quickly escapes from that attack. Sialhui thinks it dodged the attack and doesn't back down, it saw the attack coming. His AI thinks wait a minute, he almost died just now, for a second forgetting that's his body down there. Sialhui again runs to attack him, while the AI wonders why he does that again, stating that this is way too dangerous. Meanwhile, Pyagam attacks him again, and he escapes from that attack as well, jumping back. The AI shadow wonders what it's thinking and why it's being so aggressive. It thinks it's doing something again while Sialhui runs once more to attack. Pyagam asks if he has any idea who he's dealing with, ready for a counter-attack. However, Sialhui quickly kicks at his feet, and Pyagam screams in pain. Then, Sialhui punches his chin and kicks him again. The AI shadow looks at him surprisingly, while the system notifies him and asks what he would like to do with Pyagam. It inquires if he wants to kill him or knock him out. He thinks it wants him to make the final decision and looks at Pyagam, who is sitting in front of him on his knees. The system notifies him to kill him, and he holds his head and smashes it. The system notifies him that the AI has been deactivated, and the results of the battle will be shown only once. The results indicate that Sialhui survived, Ibyok is dead, and Pyagam is also dead. Its calculations reveal that his body is normal with no damage, and his health has fallen by 12 points. His Kai remains at 21,000 points. He thinks it only cost him 12 health points to kill the director and general manager of the Heavenly Sun Archive, and his Kai didn't even go down. He sees a flash, comes back into his body, and becomes happy, saying he's back in his body. He reflects on using only 12 health points to defeat two people, something he never imagined was possible. He thinks he could have never fought like that if he had been in control, and he guesses the AI could see a few moves ahead. He says he'll have to try it out a few more times to figure out how exactly it works. The scene shifts to the basement of the Heavenly Sun Archive, where Sialhui sits on a chair and thinks about quickly burying the three bodies and getting rid of them. He knows he's leaving the Archive anyway, so it doesn't matter if anyone finds them. Holding a mirror, he looks at his lives. He has two coins, meaning two lives. He thinks he has two extra lives again and should be strong enough now if he can just beat Jiyuan. Considering that he'll earn Ganma's trust, he says he'd better get ready to fight and checks his toolbox, exclaiming look at all the stuff he has found as he observes numerous pieces of equipment. The system notifies him that he is equipped with heavenly silver armor. A flash appears, showing his armor, and the system notifies him that he is now using understanding swordsmanship. The system notifies him that his understanding of swordsmanship has increased, his skill has leveled up, and Sohui school has reached the basic level. Similarly, Jiaksu school and Chojak school have also reached the basic level. He thinks that all his skills are now at the basic level and checks his status screen. It shows that he's a lieutenant of a low-level unit with two life coins. His body is normal, and his health is at 20,548 points. His Kai is at 21,000 points, and his fighting power is 90,000. He wields an ordinary sword, and his armor is heavenly silver armor. He thinks that finally, he'll change this back to the turn-based style and look at a notification about combat type, choosing between AI or turn-based. He thinks alright, now he's ready to beat that spy Jiyuan. The system notifies him that he has reached an important point and asks if he would like to save. Sialhui wonders what that important point is. The system then notifies him that he should choose which spot he would like to save. Year 95 of the Heavenly Calendar, Chapter 2 or Chapter 1 with three options presented by Ganma to empty save points. 
he thinks that unlike in his previous lives, nothing really happened just now, but there must be a reason that this appears whenever these options come up. He believes that they always affect his future somehow, so he decides to give it a try. The system notifies him that in year 95 of the Heavenly Calendar, Chapter 2 or 1, with three options presented by Ganma, he becomes Ganma's foot soldier, the final opponent after failing the test at the academy, and he has an empty save point. Then the system notifies him that it's saved. Meanwhile, he wonders what that means as he looks at the status screen after failing the test at the Martial Arts Academy. As the final opponent, he guesses and tries to say something more, but he hears someone's footsteps and looks at him, recognizing him as Jiyuan. Jiyuan approaches him, handing him a pill and saying here take it, while the system notifies him that he has obtained a Kai pill. He takes the pill, consumes it, and notices his health increasing by 85 points and Kai increasing by 2000 points. He remarks that one pill alone is sufficient to boost his Kai by about 10 years worth of training. He then asks if Jiyuan isn't going to give him the flying dragon pill. Jiyuan responds that Ganma said he has one and instructs him to hand it over. Jiyuan tosses another pill towards him and he catches it, thinking that if he reacts as he did in his previous life any second now, just as he expected, Jiyuan runs to attack him. He reflects on how he didn't anticipate it last time and seizes his punch to halt it. The system notifies him that his stats have significantly increased, with his health points soaring to 6,005 and his Kai increasing by 3,500. He wonders why the other person is behaving that way and contemplates whether the first disciple taught him to be so impulsive. Realizing there's no turning back, the system notifies him that his mind reading level has advanced to the basic level of elementary proficiency. The system further informs him that his health points have reached 26,650, his Kai points have reached 27,180, and his fighting power has reached 1 lakh. He believes he can defeat the other person, drawing on his experience from the Martial Arts Academy. He now knows how to utilize the options, and his skill levels have improved along with gaining actual combat experience. Additionally, he is confident in his ability to use the Grand Ship Sword technique. He checks Jiyuan's status screen, noting that Jiyuan's health points are 15,000, Kai points are 12,000, and fighting power points are 1 lakh and 90,000. He believes he can win this time and is shocked to see this. He reflects on how his fighting power stat started appearing when his mind reading reached the basic level. Drawing from experience, he knows that skills become significantly stronger as the numbers increase. Even Burang Shin only had 70,000 fighting power making Jiyuan much stronger than those early morning intruders. He looks at Jiyuan's fighting power points again. The system issues a warning, informing him that Jiyuan has found his weakness and asking how he would like to respond. He is shocked and wonders if he has already done everything he can, considering that Jiyuan has much more fighting power. He contemplates that fighting back would be suicide and with nowhere to run, the system notifies him that he has chosen to defend himself. He sees this as his only option and both of them prepare to defeat each other. Jiyuan slaps him, attempting another slap, but he successfully blocks the attack. As they engage in combat, he receives a notification that Jiyuan has discovered his weakness, prompting the system to ask how he would like to respond. He decides to run away. Jiyuan unsheathes his sword and launches an attack. The system notifies him that it's a deadly strike and Jiyuan inflicts significant damage, he screams, falling down as his health points decrease to 9,815. Jiyuan approaches him, and as he looks at Jiyuan, he realizes he can't keep up with him, he is simply too strong for him. He reflects that there's no way he can use the Grand Ship Sword technique now, especially since he can't move his left hand due to the profuse bleeding. He acknowledges that the only advantage he holds over Jiyuan is in terms of health and Kai. Contemplating his options regarding martial arts, he grabs his sword and decides to fight back with the Sohui school. Waving his sword towards Jiyuan, he attempts to strike, but Jiyuan counters and abuses him. Siolhui tries to stab him, but Jiyuan blocks the attack and counterattacks. They both block each other's swords, creating a flash. Siolhui utilizes the third basic technique of the Sohui school, launching repeated attacks, and Jiyuan attempts to block each one. Siolhui thinks that the Sohui school is effective, and now he plans to maintain the pressure. However, the system interrupts, notifying him that Jiyuan has found his weakness and presenting three options, fight back, defend himself, or run away. 
Perplexed, he fails to comprehend the situation, but he is fighting back nonetheless. The system notifies him that he has chosen to fight back, prompting him to run towards Jiyuan to launch an attack. However, Jiyuan stabs his shoulder with a blast, causing him to bleed. A notification follows, stating that his health points have decreased to 15,988, and he vomits blood. Jiyuan attempts to punch him again, but he manages to evade the attack. The system then issues a notification, KO. He's incapacitated. After some time, water droplets fall on Xiaohui as he is tied to a chair, and Jiyuan slaps him, saying wake up. He checks his status screen, revealing that he has two lives. His body shows 24 ruptures or fractures, including a slightly damaged temporal lobe, pain in the middle phalanx, and a paralyzed left arm. His health points have dropped to 85, and his Kai has fallen to 3500, with his fighting power less than 10,000. He realizes that he has been significantly harmed. Ma Guayan stands nearby, observing him, and remarks that he's awake, finally coming to. He steps forward. Siolhui looks at him, trying to identify who he is. Checking his status screen, he discovers that the person is Ma Guayan, eighth in the hierarchy of the Crimson Demon Palace's Guayan unit. Ma Guayan possesses one life coin, with a hostility level of 95% and danger in alliance with Qin Ma's first disciple. His health points are 350,000, Kai is 310,000, and fighting power is 420,000. Xiaohui then checks his own lives, realizing he has only one life left. He recalls that Ma Guai An was the examiner for the Martial Arts Academy's Eon exam. Ma Guai An remarks that Xiaohui seems to recognize him and contemplates the concept of insight. He then comments that considering Xiaohui's history of sneaking around and spying, it would be odd if he didn't recognize Ma Guai An. He inquires about who sent Xiaohui, and Xiaohui denies any knowledge of what he's talking about. Convinced that talking won't work, Xiaohui grabs his shoulder wound, causing him to shout in pain as his bone twists. Ma Guai and insists on asking again, questioning who sent Xiaohui and how he managed to survive in the Great Imperial Pavilion without any affiliation for so long. He asserts that Xiaohui must have someone backing him. Xiaohui admits that there is someone and is asked to reveal their identity. Xiaohui responds, stating that it's the Lord of the Great Imperial Pavilion, the one who can defeat them. Enraged, Ma Guai and twists Xiaohui's other shoulder, causing him to yell in pain and close his eyes. Ma Guai and comments that Xiaohui hasn't woken up yet, stating that they still have plenty of time to continue. Xiaohui questions if Ma Guai and is genuinely certain about that, expressing concern that if Ma Guai and doesn't kill him before the Martial Arts Academy's test concludes, he will be the one in trouble, not Xiaohui. In response, Ma Guayan inquires about the reason, and Xiaohui explains that Ganma will come looking for him, which is why Ganma didn't allow him to pass the test. Ma Guayan is puzzled and asks why Ganma would do that. Meanwhile, Xiaohui thinks it's because Ganma knows the secret of the Lord of the Great Imperial Pavilion. Ma Guayan dismisses it, stating that it doesn't make any sense, and questions the connection between knowing the secret and their situation. Xiaohui asks if Ma Guayan is genuinely clueless or simply messing with him. He then reveals that the Lord of the Great Imperial Pavilion is backing the First Disciple, and it so happens that the First Disciple's spies are interrogating him. Xiaohui inquires if his explanation clarifies everything and believes that their reaction this time is different, confirming his correct guess. He senses there is only one reason why they are displaying such hostility towards him. Jiyuan, confused, questions what Xiaohui is talking about. In his thoughts, he believes they perceive him as a threat to Salma, the first disciple. However, he asserts that he has never done anything to be considered a threat and couldn't even if he wanted to. Jiyuan asks why Xiaohui seems so flustered. Xiaohui privately thinks that only Guai Sama could pose a threat to the first disciple, leading to a possible hypothesis. He considers the fact that they want to know who is backing him and states that Lord Guai Sama's weakness lies in his connection to Zhang Myonggu of the Mount Hua sect. Xiaohui thinks that ever since he informed Ganma about Guai Sama's weakness, they likely began taking action as well. He concludes that the thread connecting them all probably leads back to the first disciple. Ma Guai and asserts that Xiaohui initiated the conflict with Jiyuan, while gripping his hair and questioning why Xiaohui believes they prevented him from taking the test. Xiaohui explains that originally, they intended to let him take the test, assuming he would die, but their decision changed when they discovered Jiyuan's role as a spy. 
Xiaohui reflects that the order of the tests didn't matter since, even after passing the Xin test, he would have had to face Jiawan in any of the remaining three tests. Furthermore, he recalls that upon his arrival at the Martial Arts Academy, he was alone with the training supervisor, indicating collusion with these individuals. Xiaohui speculates that even if he had given up on the test before its completion, they would have attempted to kill him. He wonders how he knows this, and the system notifies him that in the year 95 of the Heavenly Calendar, chapters 2 to 15, becoming Ganma's foot soldier is the final opponent after failing the test at the academy. He contemplates that the window appearing when he saved his progress indicates that failing the test means he cannot pass it, as the final opponent refers to Jiawan. Siolhui asks why the individuals present don't just confess and questions if they genuinely want to know who is supporting him. He further inquires if they desire information on how many of Guai Sama's secrets he divulged to Ganma. The system notifies him that he has discerned the first disciple's intentions using good insight, and by boosting his insight score, he can permanently upgrade one of his martial arts skills to a higher level. Xiaohui ponders the meaning of this revelation, and Hyukbai arrives, commenting that Xiaohui is even more amusing than expected. Hyukbai states that he has heard enough, regardless of whether Xiaohui finishes the test, as he poses a threat to Salma. She walks toward them. Siolhui gazes at Hyukbai, who declares that any threat to Salma must be eliminated and launches an attack on him. The system notifies Siolhui that they are now returning to year 95 of the Heavenly Calendar, chapters 2 to 15. A flash appears, healing all his wounds and breaking his ropes. He considers that he might have died this time, but realizes he learned something it's impossible for him to pass the Martial Arts Academy's tests. He trembles at the thought. Feeling compelled to fight Jiowan, he acknowledges that he has no interest in choosing a more difficult life than the current one, even if he has to fight. The system notifies him that he has changed his combat type to AI. Siolhui gets up from his seat, recalling the last time he used the AI combat type and acknowledging its superior power compared to fighting manually. He opens his toolbox, and the system notifies him that he has equipped King Myung's tunic and the warrior spirit blade. Siolhui decides to keep the fragrant moon dagger hidden in his tunic and leaves the white spirit bomb on the desk. He thinks this will create more variables, considering that if the eye's job is to determine the best possible move, it might use these items. He determines that he is going to win this time and believes he has to win. Siolhui grasps his sword, ready for the fight, and wonders how to use the insight points he acquired earlier. Jiowan arrives and questions why he's holding his sword, the system notifies him that the AI will now initiate the battle. Siolhui's AI shadow once again hovers in the air as he faces Jiowan. Jiowan asks why he is holding the sword, and Siolhui responds that he is training, surprised that the AI can talk. Jiowan hands him a pill, instructing him to take it. Siolhui is relieved that he didn't say much and consumes the pill. Jiowan turns to leave, instructing Siolhui to follow him. Siolhui chews the pill and follows, requesting the flying dragon pill from Ganma. Jiowan pauses and Al Shadow looks at Siolhui. Siolhui thinks about how he initially believed the AI could only fight, but now it seems it can talk too. Jiowan questions what that was, and Siolhui contemplates the decision-making abilities of the AI. Meanwhile, he mentions that he wasn't informed, but Ganma had promised to provide him with one Kai pill and one flying dragon pill. He laughs, noting that it's the exact same thing Ganma said before. This is the moment where he expects Jiowan to punch him, and he contemplates his options while observing the AI sitting down and seemingly pondering something seriously. Siolhui attacks Jiowan, who swiftly evades the assault and retaliates. Jiowan questions what Siolhui thinks he's doing. Siolhui employs the sixth basic technique of the Sohui school, launching a series of attacks, but Jiowan skillfully blocks each one. Siolhui then uses the Sosang Kai strike, contemplating that it's another head-on attack similar to the last time, and attempts to escape from his counter-attack. Siolhui instructs his AI to understand that he knew the previous strategy wouldn't work against Jiowan, as he had already attempted it. Siolhui waves his sword, realizing that the AI is holding the sword in its left hand. The system notifies him that he is now using the Grand Ship Sword technique, and the AI stabs Jiowan's hand and cuts his arm, eliciting a yell of pain from Jiowan. He contemplates that he didn't know the AI could use the Grand Ship Sword technique with a knife and effortlessly combine it with one of the basic techniques. 
he acknowledges that the AI can probably make slightly better decisions than he can and is impressed by its combat abilities, thinking that it truly considers everything. Jiwan sits down and questions if Xiaohui knows some knife moves, noting that using sword techniques with a knife, while not overly deadly, still manages to incapacitate him. He finds Xiaohui to be a real mystery and demands an explanation of how Xiaohui accomplished that. The AI thinks that Jiwan is a monster, as he has just lost an arm yet remains completely calm. Jiwan grabs his sword once again, ready to fight, and asserts that he will find out soon enough. He runs to attack Xiaohui, who blocks the attack and employs the explosive field, almost hitting Jiwan. However, he swiftly escapes and jumps again to launch another attack. Xiaohui jumps, swiftly navigating the stairs to escape the attack. Jiwan, fueled by anger, relentlessly attacks him again and again, but Xiaohui skillfully evades each assault. Jiwan attempts to strike his other hand, causing Xiaohui to cry out in pain, yet he refuses to give up. The AI observes Xiaohui's quick reflexes and movements, marveling at their speed. Even Jiwan is surprised, thinking that Xiaohui is poised for victory. Jiwan notices cracks on his sword and anticipates success, only for the sword to break in his hand. Xiaohui laments that his knife wasn't strong enough to withstand the grand ship sword technique and questions why it had to break at this moment. Jiwan remarks that it's unfortunate for Xiaohui and mentions that he just recalled Ganma's instruction to give him a sword. However, Jiwan is now relieved he didn't follow that instruction, declaring that today must be Xiaohui's lucky day. Xiaohui regrets not putting away the shadow slicing sword before the fight, thinking shoot should have been more careful. When Jiwan mentions luck, Xiaohui questions if he heard that correctly, thinking Jiwan must be a spy. He instructs Jiwan to listen carefully, asserting that his basic foot techniques are pathetically slow. Jiwan asks about this revelation, and he challenges him to come and try to fight, confidently claiming that he'll tear his head right off. He reflects on the situation, finding it almost as if he's looking at a different person. Jiwan abuses him and charges to attack, but Xiaohui skillfully evades the assault. Jiwan demands to know where he thinks he's going, prompting him to counterattack and escape once again. Jiwan declares that Xiaohui is trapped and orders him to die, launching another attack that Xiaohui narrowly escapes. Xiaohui advises himself not to get too emotional, then takes out a bomb and tells Jiwan to take it. Jiwan observes the white spirit bomb, and as it detonates, he falls down, coughing severely. He throws a knife that pierces Jiwan, remarking that he is pathetic. He reflects on the incredible capabilities of the AI, noting that it successfully defeated Jiwan, but he realizes they need to stop at that point. He acknowledges that the poison Jiwan was hit with will be fatal without an antidote, and he resolves not to let Jiwan die so easily, insisting that Jiwan must pay for fighting him. Jiwan pleads for Xiaohui to stop, but Xiaohui is determined to bring him to Ganma to resolve the situation. As Xiaohui prepares to attack Jiwan again, the AI intervenes, advising him not to proceed. The system prompts Xiaohui with a decision on what to do with Jiwan, whether to kill him or knock him out. The AI takes a breath, expressing relief, and the system notifies Xiaohui that he has chosen to knock Jiwan out. Xiaohui throws his broken sword on the floor, and a flash occurs as the AI returns to his body. He realizes he's back and feels the need to hurry. The system notifies Xiaohui that he is using the poison antidote, and Jiwan swallows the antidote. Following that, the system notifies him that he has obtained the shadow slicing sword. The scene shifts to the Yuan Palace, where Ilgibu sits, having a drink, and inquires about how things went. Chen Guang, Ganma's right hand, responds that a problem arose. Ilgibu asks about the nature of the problem, and Chen Guang replies that some of the people they were following noticed them. Ilgibu questions if he left any evidence, to which Chin Guang assures him that there's no need to worry. They eliminated all evidence using bone melting acid. Ilgibu expresses disbelief, wondering how they could have detected the Silver Spirit unit, considering he is an espionage expert. Two birds sit near him, and Chin Guang responds that the individuals who noticed them weren't from the Great Imperial Pavilion. Ilgibu takes another sip, acknowledging this, and contemplates that the Silver Spirit Unit is a key unit consisting of Ganma's top information agents, all elite experts in tracking and evasion, making it rare for them to get caught. He concludes that only a Supreme Master could have noticed them. Chin Guang notes that the timing is peculiar and addresses Ilgibu as Master, asking why they suddenly assigned people to watch the Great Imperial Pavilion. 
Il Di Bu suggests that some information might have leaked, but Chen Guang disagrees, asserting that they were extra cautious this time. Il Di Bu queries the meaning of being cautious and asks Chen Guang how many people he has by his side, intending to say something further. Il Di Bu remarks that he's already losing more and more people to other Chen Ma disciples, attributing it to his dwindling powers. He expresses sympathy for his followers, stating that they have to serve such a weak master. Bowing down in front of Ilgi Bu, Chen Guang reassures him that it's not true, and they have no doubt that he will rule for a thousand years. Ilgi Bu laughs and acknowledges that he once had very ambitious plans. He reflects on the fact that compared to Ganma, other disciples of Chinma possessed greater power and influence, along with more councilmen and agents working for them. He contemplates that there are even rumors circulating that some elders in the central administration directly serve the disciples of Chinma. Ilgi Bu brings up the person who disclosed an unpleasant secret, asking about their current situation. The response is that they dispatched a second-grade bodyguard, who is currently taking the Martial Arts Academy's entrance test. Expressing concern, Ilgi Bu wonders if the Yoji Du map and the information shared by that person might be inaccurate. He inquires whether there has been a direct encounter with Xiaohui. The reply is that there has only been information heard from the person who disclosed the secret. Ilgi Bu acknowledges this and mentions that upon investigating Xiaohui, it was discovered that there is a reason why the Lord of the Great Imperial Pavilion dislikes him. Swirling his bowl, Ilgi Bu questions the contents and reveals that Xiaohui and some members of his company broke into Guai Sama's office without permission, getting caught in an attempt to steal martial arts techniques. He expresses disbelief, questioning how a mere company member could engage in such actions. Ilgi Bu laughs and acknowledges that it sounds ridiculous, but Guai Sama doesn't immediately punish Xiaohui. He asks if the reason is known. The response is a refusal, prompting Ilgi Bu to inquire about the fate of the people in Xiaohui's company. Ilgi Bu reveals that they are all dead, as the Mount Hua sect got to them. The other person mentions having heard about low-ranking demon cult warriors being attacked by the Mount Hua sect recently, but they didn't know that they were under Xiaohui's command. Reflecting on this, they consider that it implies the Yoji Du map can likely be trusted. Ilgi Bu raises the possibility that all of this might be part of Guai Sama's plan. He suggests that Xiaohui, the lieutenant of the company and the only survivor, may have been the one who provided him with the map. Ilgi Bu further speculates that this could be the reason why he sent the Silver Spirit unit to spy on Guai Sama, resulting in their deaths. Ilgi Bu takes another sip of his drink. Meanwhile, Ilgi Bu mentions that he's still uncertain about what to believe. The other person asks for clarification, saying pardon. Reflecting on the map Xiaohui gave him, Ilgi Bu notes a comment in Guai Sama's handwriting about the secret meeting with another sect. He comments that this incident would shake the very foundation of the demon cult, deeming it too much for a mere lieutenant to handle, and places his bowl on the table. Ilgi Bu further speculates that, based on the situation, Guai Sama likely only noticed the map was missing after Xiaohui left for the Heavenly Sun Archive. The other person questions why Guai Sama sent Xiaohui to the Martial Arts Academy and suggests that he is of no use now. They ask if there is a reason Guai Sama sent him there with such a precious sword and special pills. Ilgi Bu clanks his bowl on the table and explains that Guai Sama promised Xiaohui something, specifically, a chance to get stronger. The other person questions if it's almost impossible for Xiaohui to pass the martial art academy's tests at his level. Ilgi Bu concedes that it probably is nearly impossible, but he suggests that if Xiaohui does manage to survive, he might just be able to get a boost of energy from Guai Sama. As a disciple of Chinma, Ganma is stuck in a position where it's impossible to move forward or back down, so Ilgi Bu can understand the appeal of wanting to find someone in a similarly desperate situation, where the only escape is to break out. Recalling his desire to get stronger, Ilgi Bu speculates that maybe that's what Ganma sees in him. He remarks that they seem to have some unwelcome guests upon seeing Salma, Mahu, and a girl disciple. On the other side, Xiaohui holds Jiyuan at his shoulder and walks toward the Yuan Palace. Xiaohui instructs Jiyuan to be quiet while Ban Gok blocks his way and asks who he is and what he wants. Checking his status screen, Xiaohui identifies Ban Gok as the gatekeeper at Yuan Palace, with health points at 1850, Kai at 1230, and fighting power at 1,10,000. He wonders why this guy's stats are so high when he's just a guard. Ban Gok shouts, demanding to know what Xiaohui wants. 
Siolhui replies that his name is Siolhui, and he's here to see the fourth disciple. Van Gogh asks if he has an appointment. He responds affirmatively, thinking so and laughing. Van Gogh questions whether he actually said that, then declares that he will go ask, instructing him to wait there. He agrees and Van Gogh warns that if he's lying it'll cost him his life. He assures him and thinks that Van Gogh is indeed aggressive. Van Gogh returns and informs Siolhui that he can go in. He expresses thanks, bows and proceeds to move forward to enter. Entering Yuan Palace, Siolhui spots three individuals and recognizes them. He stops to check one of their status screens, revealing the name Salma, Chinma's first disciple. However, he can't check Salma's health, Kai and fighting power. Wondering why Salma is present, he considers the possibility that the other disciples might also be there. Ilgibu questions Sialhui about his presence, causing him a surprise. He contemplates his situation, realizing that he came to hand over Jioan to Gonma, who works as a spy for the first disciple standing right there. Ilgibu becomes irritated and repeats his question, while another disciple inquires about his identity. He ponders his options when the system notifies him to select one of the choices below. Confused, he looks at his status screen, which indicates that he brought Salma's spy with plus one point, step outside Mahu, or he'll kill him with plus two points, and the last option is it's him, asshole with plus three points. Perplexed, Siolhui examines the options, wondering about their significance. The scene shifts to the Yuan Palace 15 minutes before Siolhui's arrival. Ilgibu takes a sip of his drink and asks how they have been. Mahu responds that he has been enjoying himself as usual and asks if everything is okay with him. Ilgibu smiles, says yes and thanks him. He reflects that Mahu, the second disciple, seems like a nice guy, but is a viper on the inside. Ilgibu believes every action of Mahu is carefully calculated, evident from the fact that he commands the demon cult's Mysterium company. Aryon greets Ilgibu, saying long time no see, and waves her hand. Ilgibu responds indeed, long time no see, he contemplates that Aryong, the third disciple, seems like a naive, somewhat empty-headed girl, but is as cunning as a snake and a master of seduction. Ilgibu notes that she is so skilled at manipulating others that she managed to gain the support of all the demon cults assassination and training institutions. He further observes that Aryong even has the support of the hermit masters who belong to the elders of the hidden demon palace. Meanwhile, he reflects that Salma is undoubtedly the strongest among Chinma's disciples in the demon cult. Rumor has it that when he was 20 years old, Salma defeated Grand Elder Jin in Hyacian of the Mudang sect, widely considered one of the greatest masters of his time. The story goes that Salma beheaded him right in front of his disciples. When he turned 30, Salma defeated three elders of the Jiamchang sect, along with four bodyguards and their top disciples in a head-to-head -head battle. Salma even went so far as to cut off their heads and pile them up, mocking standard martial arts techniques, causing a great stir in the world of martial arts at the time. Now at the age of 40, Salma has reached the level of a supreme demon. He is considered as strong as any of the other greatest warriors in the world. The person reflects on Salma's strength and asks how he has been, to which Salma responds with an intense look. He reflects that usually Salma just ignores him, but today he is acting outright hostile. He recalls coming across several people while looking into Guai Sama and his supporters. Salma calls him an arrogant prick, and he believes that the strongest suspects are Salma's henchmen. He is pretty sure that Salma knows he has been investigating him, so he understands how Salma feels. Ban Gok arrives and tells Ilgibu that he has something urgent to report. Ilgibu asks what it is, and Ban Gok replies that someone named Siolhui is here to see him. Ilgibu is surprised and asks what Sialhui is doing here. He instructs Ban Gok to let him in. The scene returns to the present where Sialhui stands in front of Ilgibu. Ilgibu asks what he's doing here and Sialhui attempts to answer, but Ilgibu interrupts him, shouting and demanding to know why he is there. Mahu asks who Sialhui is and questions why Ilgibu is getting so upset. Sialhui, in response, asks who Ilgibu is and retorts that it's him asshole. He wonders why Ilgibu wants to know and shouts, using explicit language, leaving them all looking at him in shock. The system notifies him that he chose the option it's him asshole, and he reflects that he can't believe he just said that. Among the three absurd options, he chose the worst one. He reviews the options again and thinks that if his past experience has taught him anything, it's that the worst option is often the best one. With only one life left, he decided to take a risk 
hoping he made the right choice, while Mahu looks at him. He contemplates whether this was the right choice, then decides to explain himself. As Aryong approaches him with her sword, reaching near his neck, he freezes and trembles. Mahu intervenes, stopping Aryong's sword with his own to prevent an attack on him. Mahu asserts that the insult was directed at him, not Aryong, and questions what she is doing. Aryong responds by telling him to back off, as she doesn't like him. Mahu insists that he cannot do that and can't stand back while one of their Ganma's men is in danger. He points to Salma as an example, noting Salma's confidence in the face of insults. Aryong gets irritated, takes her sword back, and angrily turns her face away. Siolhui observes that Aryong's sword is an automatic one, known as a divine weapon, and it winds itself up like a snake. He acknowledges that it could sense how deadly Aryong's attack was just now. Despite feeling paralyzed and unable to move when her sword drew near his throat, Mahu managed to block the attack. Meanwhile, he considers these people unbelievably powerful and wonders how he is going to make it out of here alive. Mahu laughs and remarks that he has an amusing little helper in Ganma, asking if he saw how brazenly he insulted him just now. Ganma apologizes and says he will deal with him himself. Mahu asks if he didn't hear him just now, saying not to kill him. He thinks that maybe Mahu is not so bad after all. If Mahu hadn't stood up for him, he would already be dead several times over. He thinks Mahu may be a beast, but perhaps he's not as evil as Guai Sama. At least, that's what he thought until this revelation appeared. The system notifies him that he has received three rewards for choosing that option. The first reward is that he can see the personality types of Chinma's disciples. The system again notifies him that Mahu is a sociopath who will do anything to get what he wants. His apparently sociable behavior is carefully calculated, and he disguises himself well, keeping his true nature completely hidden. Although lacking a conscience, his cognitive abilities are highly developed, making him adept at devising schemes. Mahu states that he's sure he didn't come here just to insult him and asks what he's doing here. Siolhui looks at him and thinks that he has seen that look somewhere before a mixture of excitement and pleasure and realizes it's the same look Guai Sama had. He contemplates what he should say, recognizing that he has to say something. The best option right now would be to arouse Mahu's curiosity. He places Jiyuan on the floor and says, as Ganma mentioned, he brought a spy here. Mahu asks who the spy is, and Ganma inquires about what he means. Siolhui suggests they see for themselves, remove the cover from Jiyuan's face, and they all gaze at him. Salma also looks, and Siolhui notes Salma's reaction. The system notifies him that Salma is a psychopath. As long as he gets what he's after, Salma is indifferent to other people's pain and is willing to do anything. He's egotistical, caring only about himself, and as a bloodthirsty murderer who recognizes only power, he is full of envy and desires to destroy anything that makes him uncomfortable. He enjoys crushing the hopes of people faced with death. After a while, he thinks this guy is a complete monster, and he knows the demon cult is full of people like him. But he has never seen someone so obsessed with the desire to kill. Mahu asks about the spy and wonders if he would like to interrogate him, but Aryong refuses. Mahu questions why not, stating that he's a spy, and maybe they can find out who he works for. She replies not to get on her nerves. The system notifies them about her details, revealing that her name is Aryong, and she has histrionic personality disorder. She is impulsive, showy, and highly emotional. She craves attention and is able to completely control her emotions and even physiological reactions when she wants something. She manipulates, controls, exploits and leeches off others. She is extremely skilled at finding what people lack and seducing them with it. He thinks, are any of these people normal? Gamna questions why he thinks he's a spy and walks towards him. Siolhui replies that he deliberately withheld the special pills and sword he meant to give him in order to make him fail the academy's test. Meanwhile, Ganma asks what he means by deliberately, and he replies, yes. He knows that he was desperate, so he asked him for the special pills and the sword, but he beat him and tried to kill him. He continues, saying that he told him something. Ganma asks what this is, and he replies that he said he'll never pass the test anyway, and even if he does, he'll kill him. He added that the same fate awaits Ganma, the weak and cowardly fourth disciple. He thinks he made that up of course, but seeing the frown on Ganma's face, it looks like his gamble worked. He checks Ganma's details, discovering that he's Ganma, with borderline personality disorder. 
Ganma exhibits disturbing self-destructive behavior when personal relations or a sense of self is threatened. He is emotionally unstable and capricious, oscillating between a sense of superiority and inferiority. Ganma displays self-resentment for being weak-willed. He also sees that Ganma exhibits unpredictable aggressive tendencies when threatened by the fear of abandonment, expressing rage and a desire to kill others in response to paranoid suspicions. He observes that Ganma is highly dependent with a bipolar tendency towards both distrust and blind faith. He thinks he has found Ganma's weakness, while Mahu asks in that case, does he also knows who that spy works for? Siolhui thinks he can't say anything, he doesn't have any proof that he's Salma's spy. The system notifies him about the second reward. He will now be presented with proof. He sees a shining scroll at Jiyuan's body. The system notifies him that a secret letter from Ma Guai and is in his breast pocket. Seeing the window that appeared this time, he suddenly realizes something about the numbers in front of the three options. The options are one, he brought him Salma's spy, plus one point. Second, step outside Mahu, or he'll kill him, plus two points. And third, it's him, asshole, plus three points. He thinks they're not just rewards, they show different types of rewards depending on what he chooses. He recalls that Ma Guayan is the examiner for the Martial Arts Academy's Eon Test, and that he met him in the cave that Jiyuan dragged him to in his last life. He thinks like Jiyuan, he also works for the first disciple, and they prove everything. He says that the proof is in his pocket, pointing towards the letter, and he sees this and says to bring it to him. Ganma takes the letter, reads it, and Mahu asks what it say. Ganma replies would he like to read it and hands him the letter. Mahu takes it and reads, while Aryong also looks at the letter from behind. Salma remarks, that's strange. Why would a spy give himself away and be so determined to make some random guy fail the Martial Arts Academy's test? He may not be very strong but he's still technically the bodyguard of one of Chen Ma's disciples. He adds that he got beaten by someone who was going to take a test at the academy and asks if doesn't seem ridiculous. Siol Hui looks at him, thinking that his aura is terrifying and he can't move a single muscle. He has never felt anything so intimidating. He wonders if he will really survive this beast, while the system notifies him about the third reward, stating that his health and Kai are now one lakh, and all of his other abilities have been significantly enhanced. Meanwhile, he checks his status screen, finding that he is Siolhui. His health and Kai have reached 1 lakh points and his fighting power is at 3 lakh 90,000. His martial arts styles Sohui school, Jiaksu school, and Chejuk school have also reached intermediate levels. He sees that his mind-reading passive skill has reached an intermediate level, and he has met the minimum requirements to learn the four elemental techniques. The four elemental techniques, specifically wind, have reached their first steps, and his chart of characteristics for the four elemental techniques, wind god, n for neutral and indications a, has also reached a speed of 4-5x. He becomes surprised to see this and thinks it's incredible. The system gives him a warning that Salma has found his weakness and asks how he would like to respond. Salma runs to attack him. Siolhui looks at him and asks what is this? He wonders why all of a sudden, this is happening and contemplates what he should do. He thinks he may be stronger now, but he's no match for Salma. The system notifies him of three options, fight back, defend himself, and run away. He thinks he can't just stand here and get killed, and this is his only option anyway. Please don't die, he hopes, and the system notifies him to run away. Salma runs to attack him with his full force and unleashes a blast. Siolhui quickly escapes from that attack. He wonders if he dodged it and realizes no, it wasn't a direct hit, but it got him. His improved abilities and King Myung's tunic deflected the sword aura. Salma points his sword towards him and says it looks like he has got some strength in him after all. Siolhui thinks he can't move and Salma's aura is overwhelming. He believes he can guess when someone reaches such a high level of mastery and can paralyze people even with their gaze. He wonders if this is the end while Mahu comes forward, grabs Salma's shirt, and declares, that's enough. Salma looks at Ganma and walks towards him. Siolhui observes Jiyuan, who has died. He reflects that when Salma used that sword aura just now, he wasn't the only one attacked, Jiyuan was hit as well. Perhaps Salma was trying to kill both of them, that monster. Mahu remarks that Ganma is quite an amusing subordinate, hands him a letter, and walks away. Aryong chases after him, urging him to wait. Siolhui looks at both of them. 
he contemplates that he can understand Salma's reaction since he's directly involved in this. However, he wonders what on earth is written in that secret letter and ponders what could have made the other disciples react in such a way. Donma instructs Sialhui to accompany him, and Sialhui agrees, walking behind him. He wonders where they are headed, realizing that this doesn't seem like the way to the library, among other things. Checking the details, he notes that Ganma is the fourth disciple of Chinma. His health points are 950,000, his Kai points are 880,000, and his fighting power is 1,050,000 plus infinity. Sialhui can't believe Ganma is so powerful, but he is puzzled by the infinity symbol. Ganma announces they have arrived, and he looks around, questioning their location as it appears to be a dead end. Ganma asks if he doesn't know that he is about to interrogate him. Simultaneously, the system issues a warning that an unidentified enemy has discovered his weakness, inquiring about his preferred response. Sialhui ponders what is happening and realizes he needs to fight back as he sees a bright light approaching him. After a while, he awakens in a room and attempts to get up, but he finds himself unable to move as he is tied with a rope. The system notifies him that his blood channels have seized up, one ear is paralyzed, and he has six stab wounds and 32 minor wounds on his body. Checking his status screen, he notes a decrease of 10,000 health points, 30,000 kai, and 350,000 in fighting power. Ganma arrives and asks if he's awake, then questions why he is doing this to him. Ganma asserts that he knows very well why he's taking such actions and presents him with a letter. He responds that he doesn't understand what Ganma means and questions why he insists that he knows very well. Examining some symbols on the letter, he inquires if it's some kind of secret language. Ganma explains that, since he's pretending not to know, he will reveal that Chin Ma's disciples are knowledgeable in all the secret languages used in the five pavilions and nine offices. This particular language is the secret language of the night sky pavilion that serves their master. Ganma elucidates that it means kill the traitor. Meanwhile, he wonders who the traitor is, what it's supposed to mean, and what this night sky pavilion serving Ganma is all about. He states that he has no idea what any of this means and reflects on initially thinking that the secret letter was from Ma Guai and of the Crimson Demon Palace. Ganma accuses him of being quite the actor and angrily demands to know his assigned task and who he works for. He insists he doesn't know who sent him. Ganma attempts to simplify things, mentioning that Guai Sama killed everyone else in his company, yet he sent Xiaohui alone to the Heavenly Sun Archive and gave him the Yoji Du map. Ganma claims he wanted Xiaohui to get stronger, so he sent him to the Academy. He contemplates Ganma's statement, thinking about wanting to get stronger. Ganma continues, stating that now he sees him as way too strong for a mere Academy and proposes his own theory. He asserts that Sialhui never intended to join the Martial Arts Academy. Instead, his goal was to earn Ganma's trust to spy on him. Ganma questions if he is correct. He contemplates that there must be a way and there has to be some method to untangle this mess as his blood drips onto the floor. He believes he has to find a solution and wonders if the secret letter truly instructs him to kill the traitor. Reflecting on the fact that Chen Ma's other disciples turned around and left upon seeing the letter, he assumes it's likely true. He considers that if the letter is written in the secret language of the night sky pavilion supporting Ganma, he can speculate about what might have happened. In essence, someone working for Ganma sensed that something was amiss, leading them to have Jiuan deliver a letter in a secret language instructing Ganma to eliminate the traitor. He thinks Chen Ma's other disciples, upon seeing the secret letter, probably view him as someone's spy since he defeated Jiuan. They likely think he's a spy who approached Ganma. He reasons that they left the two of them alone so that Ganma could carry out the task of killing him. He questions whether he just needs to prove that he doesn't work for Guai Sama. Ganma inquires about what he means and he responds by clarifying that he just needs to prove that he's not on their side. Ganma then asks if he can prove it, and he confirms. He reflects on the usual options in the selection window, providing him with an escape route and making it appear as if he is a spy to allow a private conversation with Ganma. Ganma instructs him to go ahead and try, while he contemplates once again that the secret letter was the reward that laid the suspicions of the first disciple to rest. He expresses gratitude, whether it was luck or fate, for obtaining another piece of evidence through the experiences of many lives. Considering the situation, he thinks he needs his toolbox, and it fits perfectly, whether it is a blessing or a curse. 
he checks his breast pocket, acknowledging that these option windows are saving his life. Ganma takes the books and asks in surprise, questioning where he got them. Sialfi responds that Jiyuan had it, prompting him to ponder why a supposed spy would possess such an item. He asks when Jiyuan lost that tome. Glancing at Ganma, he believes Ganma cannot answer due to the embarrassment of losing something significant and his pride preventing acknowledgement of it. Ganma concedes that he is right, acknowledging that the time when he lost the tome doesn't align with his actions. He realizes that by putting things in his toolbox, instead of leaving them in their original places, he has subtly altered the course of events. Ganma asserts that the Lord of the Night Sky Pavilion would never betray him and presents the book again. Sialhui points out that if Ganma didn't order this, one thing is clear. If they take action, there's no reason the enemy would sit back and do nothing. Ganma asks what he means, and Sialhui explains that conspirators always prepare for every possibility, such as if Jiyuan dies or is discovered. Meanwhile, he asserts that they need to further consider the possibility that whoever is behind this situation anticipated both of those scenarios. Ganma questions if he is suggesting that someone orchestrated the entire situation. He replies that it's worth considering. Ganma remarks that he always has a way of confusing him. In response, he points out that if he truly had any ulterior motives, wouldn't he have shown the four elemental techniques to the other disciples just now? Ganma turns and walks away as he contemplates that Ganma's position within the demon cult is already precarious. If he had shown that tome to the other disciples, it wouldn't just be embarrassing. It would have been challenging to explain why someone like him possessed a tome from the head of the cult. Ganma acknowledges that he kind of likes that answer but expresses confusion about something else. He takes a seat in front of him and asks why he insulted Mahu like that at the Yuan Palace. He replies that he knows it was impertinent of him, but explains that he just wanted to express his true feelings. Ganma inquires about what is meant by his true feelings. He responds, stating that one of them is a viper, another is a con man, and the third is a complete lunatic. He adds that he can only imagine how stressful it must be for Ganma to have to be around such bizarre people. He mentions that the thought of it made him angry at that moment, and when he saw the way they snickered around Ganma, he couldn't stand it anymore. He apologizes for stepping out of line. Ganma laughs, gets up, and walks toward him, expressing that out of all his answers so far, that was his favorite one. Siolhui wonders if he is safe now, feeling dizzy as his eyes close. After a while, he awakens in a bed and contemplates his surroundings, realizing he isn't dead. The system notifies him that he has consumed the flower of blood pit fruit and the white deer gall bladder. It informs him that his body has fully recovered, and his health and Kai have increased by 10,000. Upon checking his status screen, he observes that his health, Kai, and fighting power have all increased by 10,000. Considering the special pills he took, he wonders if Ganma gave them to him, acknowledging that he's now in the best shape possible. He examines himself in a mirror and checks his lives, discovering that he now has only one life left. Reflecting on this, he realizes that after narrowly escaping death, he is now stronger than ever before in any previous life. However, he acknowledges that his problems are just beginning, now that he has sided with Ganma, the weakest among the disciples. He anticipates that his life will constantly be in danger from now on and believes he needs more lives. He reflects that overcoming the latest brush with death has made him stronger, allowing him to now use the four elemental techniques. The system notifies him about a list of martial arts techniques. Sohui school, Jiaksu school, and Chojak school are all at an intermediate level, and the four elemental techniques include wind at the first steps. Contemplating this newfound power, he believes he can become even stronger. He recalls that a similar occurrence took place when he first gained insight, and he looks at the status window. The system once again notifies him that he may only select martial arts techniques that are at an intermediate level or higher. It presents the options of Sohui School, Jiaksu School, and Chojak School, all available, but notes that the wind element is unavailable. He thinks about the system's promise to boost his martial arts techniques and wonders how strong it will make him. Deciding, he opts to try the Sohui school. The system notifies him that his martial arts technique has been upgraded, transforming Sohui school into Soso school. He reflects that the Soso school is one of the demon cult's most renowned techniques, known as the Soso or Pale Hand school because the practitioner's hands turn slightly blue upon learning it. 
He believes it is so powerful that he can engage in battles with swords using only his bare hands, rendering him virtually invincible to sword strikes. Contemplating its potential, he thinks that if used correctly, it could be even more potent than the four elemental techniques. He notes that while the four elemental techniques are associated with Chen Ma's disciples, no one has ever made a name for themselves within the demon cult using those techniques. However, this is not the case with the Soso -so school. As he runs out of his room, he is confident in the unique legacy and history that the Soso -so school represents within the demon cult. He reflects that just 20 years ago, there was someone named Murieo Chin, also known as the level-headed witch, who single-handedly assassinated about a hundred members of the Iron-Willed Guards. Deciding to give it a try, he uses a magic skill. He contemplates that this extreme yin technique draws in yin energy to create a cold blast. Utilizing the Soso -so school skill, he punches the floor hard, practicing the technique. Despite his body not being technically ready to fully unleash the Soso -so school, with not all the channels in his body open yet, the technique still proves to be powerful. He marvels at the incredible technique. He arrives and surprisingly asks if he is a disciple of Murieochen. Wondering why Gonma is there, he realizes he was so excited about learning the Soso -so school that he didn't even check to make sure no one else was around. Ganma observes that he knew there was something odd about him, especially considering how a mere company lieutenant could defeat Jiwan. Despite this, Ganma doesn't seem upset. Ganma then asks if he truly studied with Murieochen. Glancing at his status screen, he notes that Ganma has borderline personality disorder. He realizes that Ganma currently lacks any trust or confidence in him, even though all he did was try out the Soso -so school just now. Despite this, he senses a bit more warmth in Ganma's tone of voice, leading him to believe that perhaps he can take advantage of this. Deciding to proceed, he acknowledges Ganma's assumption that he's going to be his master and confirms that yes, he is a disciple of Murieochen. Ganma says he sees and apologizes for asking, recognizing that he probably wanted to keep it a secret, but he admits to being nosy. Siolhui reflects that Ganma already appears to trust him more than he did just a minute ago. Ganma then inquires if Master Murieochen is still training in isolation, noting that she is difficult to track down, and almost no one in the demon cult knows her whereabouts. Confirming this, Siolhui states that about ten years ago, she left in search of even greater mastery, and that was the last he saw of her. He mentions that he hasn't heard from her since then. Ganma comments that she is known for being somewhat cold even within the demon cult and hopes Siolhui will understand. Siolhui thinks he managed to dodge that okay and Gonma agrees, breaking an ice rock with his magic skill. He further explains that the Lord of the Night Sky Pavilion was never involved and someone else is behind all this. Consequently, he proposes making Siolhui a member of the Silver Spirit Unit from today. Siolhui asks what the Silver Spirit Unit is, thinking it's one of Gonma's main units that handles tracking and cover-up missions as well as occasionally taking out enemy targets. He contemplates that although the training is brutal, it provides an opportunity to get stronger more efficiently than at the Martial Arts Academy. He expresses his commitment to try his best. Ganma responds positively, stating that it's good. The system then notifies him that he has completed the mission to become Ganma's foot soldier, and it is now calculating his total score to date. His health and Kai points are 110,000, and his fighting power is 400,000. Furthermore, his martial arts techniques and toolbox have been updated. The system informs him that the total score he gains is 3, providing him with 3 more lives and now 4 coins. He reflects on gaining 3 more lives as the system notifies him that simulation has been added to the list of combat styles. It explains that he may change combat styles during battle, such as transitioning from turn-based fighting to AI and then to simulation mode, even while in battle. The system notifies him that once he changes from turn-based fighting to AI, he can't revert to turn-based fighting and simulation mode becomes more effective as he reaches greater levels of mastery and learns more martial arts styles. However, in AI mode, he can't see his opponent's stats. The system informs that simulation mode is provided only once when facing several opponents and the system calculates the optimal value based on the strongest opponent. It advises him that if he isn't satisfied with his current life, he should try a higher difficulty level, for example, the three options presented by Ganma. He wonders if this information is just for his own reference. Ganma mentions that he has some urgent business to attend to but assures him that he'll be back shortly. 
he instructs him to wait there until he returns and he agrees to do so. He reflects that he has died and come back to life several times now. Throughout all these unexpected options and non-stop fighting, he gradually began to forget about his desire to get stronger. However, he can't give up, as getting stronger is the only way to survive in this challenging environment. He believes it's impossible to escape this hell and expresses his frustration with an angry punch. Realizing that reaching the very top is essential, he decides to take a break and engage in some meditation. Ganma inquires if he is present and upon receiving confirmation, he runs towards him. Sialhui explains that he was just recharging his Kai with restorative breathing. Ganma expresses relief, then asks if he can see him for a moment. Sialhui agrees and notices someone accompanying Ganma, prompting him to inquire about the person's identity. Upon checking his status screen, he discovers that the person is Hyuku, the head of the Silver Spirit Unit and a Supreme Master. His health points are 4 million, Kai points are 2,070,000, and fighting power is 9,080,000. He contemplates the almost 10 million fighting power of Hyuku and marvels at the unimaginable level of strength. Siolhui asks Ganma what brings Hyuku here. Ganma explains that people usually have to pass a test to enter the Silver Spirit Unit, but Siolhui has already demonstrated that he's qualified to join. However, positions are assigned based on his skill level, so they're going to conduct a simple test. Siolhui inquires about the nature of the test. Ganma points toward Hyuku and instructs Siolhui to see him. The system notifies Siolhui that rankings are assigned based on skill level, providing four options, becoming the head of the Silver Spirit Unit by defeating Hyuku, becoming the captain of the Silver Spirit Unit's Dead Spirit Company to earn Hyuku's respect, becoming the commander of four groups of the Silver Spirit Unit's Dead Spirit Company to surprise Hyuku, or becoming a member of four groups of the Silver Spirit Unit's Dead Spirit Company to disappoint Hyuku. Ganma expresses his intention to have Siolhui attack Hyuku as best as he can. Siolhui checks his status screen, revealing that his health and Kai points are 110,000 and his fighting power points are 400,000. He also checks Hyuku's status screen, discovering that his health points are 4 million, his Kai is 2,070,000 and his fighting power is 9,080,000. Siolhui asks if he can begin and holds his shadow slicing sword. He also adopts the combat style of turn-based fighting, preparing for the upcoming battle. The system notifies him that it's a golden opportunity because he has found Hyuku's weakness. Siolhui thinks that Hyuku is letting him have the first strike, appearing relaxed. The system again notifies him to use martial arts, presenting three options, Soso School, Jiaksu School, and Chiyojuk School. Siolhui realizes that he doesn't see the four elemental techniques and wonders if it's because they're still at the first stage. Meanwhile, he considers that he can't use the four elemental techniques in front of Ganma anyway, so he decides to worry about that later. Right now, his main priority is hitting Hyuku. The system notifies him that he has chosen the Soso school and attacks Hyuku. Hyuku stands calmly, and despite the blast and the full force attack, he laughs and says the Soso school is awesome. Siolhui wonders if he has beaten him as he throws ice rocks at Hyuku, but Hyuku remains in the same position. Siolhui realizes that it was one of his strongest techniques, and Hyuku brushed it off like it was nothing. The system notifies him again about a golden opportunity, revealing that he has found Hyuku's weakness. Siolhui smiles, thinking that in that case, he has to choose the approach from the north option. He points his sword toward Hyuku and wonders how about this. Hyuku holds his sword, commands him to quit messing around, and throws him away. Hyuku comments that Siolhui calls himself a disciple of Murieochin, finding it pathetic. He questions Lord Ganma about whether there is some reason he wants to let a loser like Siolhui into the Silver Spirit Unit. Siolhui asserts that it's not over yet and activates the combat style AI, causing his shadow AI to appear behind him. Hyuku thinks he sees that Siolhui has changed his tune and taken the bait. While acknowledging that Siolhui isn't a bad fighter, he senses that he hasn't revealed his full potential yet and wants to see his true strength. The system notifies Siolhui that AI will now begin the battle. The AI runs to attack him, but Hyuku blocks the attack with his two fingers, smashes it, throws him away, and shatters his ice rocks attack. Siolhui runs to attack with the explosive field and almost stabs Hyuku's neck with his sword. He attempts a blast, but Hyuku stops that attack as well. Meanwhile, he acknowledges that there's not much he can do against someone with ten times more fighting power. Not even the AI can overcome that. 
the AI shadow expresses that it expected him to win against someone with that much more fighting power while Seolhui looks at him. The AI shadow asks if he's talking to him, and Seolhui replies look at him up there, hiding like a coward. He knows what he lacks more than anything, and that's an insatiable desire. Seolhui continues to think that forgetting about willpower and all that nonsense, he needs to want to tear his opponent to pieces, asking if he understands. He believes he's not wrong, as most of the greatest demon warriors go into battle with exactly that mindset. He thinks that lowly company members like him aren't vicious enough, while Hyuku asks if he has given up and walks towards him. Seolhui responds that he'll never beat that amateur in this body. He taps his head to activate the divine spirit channel, taps his neck to activate the energy gate channel, and also taps his chest for the navel gate channel. He suddenly realizes wait a minute, that's the blood death technique. He thinks that the lunatic is gambling with his own life just to draw out hidden potential and decides to use all his skills. The system notifies him if he wants to continue the fight himself, asking for a yes or no. He selects yes and pauses for a while, reflecting on what he was thinking. He exhales and Hyukgu walks towards him, commending him on the impressive display. He then asks if they could fight one more time. Hyukgu suggests there's no need, as he has already seen that Seolhui is more than capable. Despite this, Seolhui insists, and he bows down in front of Hyukgu. He advises him not to get carried away, stating that he has already seen enough. Ganma interjects, saying he may continue, and instructs Seolhui to show them everything he's got and use every technique at his disposal. Hyukgu reluctantly agrees, stating that this is the last time. Seolhui expresses gratitude, holds his sword, and prepares for the next round. He acknowledges that he can't fight as well as the AI, and it's impossible to defeat Hyukgu anyway. Thus, he decides to try a simulation. The system notifies him that he activates the combat-style simulation, and the triple flow sword technique has been added to the simulation. The optimal moves for each technique will be shown in a video. Another status window informs him about analyzing the number of martial art styles 7 points, analyzing the number of basic techniques 32 points, analyzing the number of foot techniques 14 points, and analyzing the number of hand techniques 5 points. The system notifies him again that the analysis is complete, and now he uses 35 basic techniques, 14 foot techniques, and 5 hand techniques. He wonders what he's supposed to do with these techniques, while Hyukgu comments that he thought he wanted to fight. Seolhui apologizes. The system notifies him again that he will now be shown a video for the first time, and a phantom warrior appears. He thinks there's a phantom again, darker and thicker than before. He looks at him and sees a shadow standing in front of him. Then he realizes that a spirit just came out of Hyukku's body as well. The system notifies him that the simulation is now playing. Both phantoms run to attack each other, attempting to defeat one another. Seolhui thinks wait, is it showing him all the possible attacks he could use? However, none of them are making a scratch on Hyukgu's phantom. It's countering every move, proving to be formidable. While his phantom slices Hyukgu's phantom, Seolhui looks at the scene surprisingly and thinks it's worked. The system notifies him of the sequence, upper stab and mid stab, followed by a right side step and low slash, then moving on to upper and low multiple stabs, dodging his stab, low slash, and going for Sosnag Kai strike. The calculation is complete, and now it continues. Seolhui runs to attack, using upper stab and mid stab, striking him hard as he attempts to block the attack. Seolhui quickly employs a right side step and low slash, launching another attack, which he blocks with his sword. Seolhui once again employs upper and low multiple stabs to attack. He comments that he thinks he can beat him with these simple moves, considering it an insult. Seolhui believes Hyukgu is getting irritated. He counters with a stab from him, prompting Hyukgu to express his frustration, saying he has had enough of this and attacks. Seolhui dodges his stab, cuts his belly using a low slash, and utilizes the sixth basic technique of the Sohui school, executing the Sosang Kai strike. Hyukgu berates him. Seolhui thinks that after boring him with ordinary slashing and stabbing attacks, he caught him off guard by suddenly using his real combination of attacks. He realizes his complacency created an opening, and the simulation calculated all that. Seeing Hyukgu running to attack him back, Seolhui becomes scared, screams, and tells him to wait a minute. Ganma intervenes and grabs Hyukgu's hand to stop him, stating that's enough and warning that if he attacks Seolhui with that much power, he'll kill him. Hyukgu bows down in front of Ganma and apologizes, asking for forgiveness. 
Gonma reassures him, saying it's all right. He could sense that he was trying to provoke him. In terms of his abilities, Ganma acknowledges that he should be appointed captain of the Dead Spirit Company, but he still needs time to adjust to the new environment. Ganma proposes assigning Siolhui a training instructor to provide the necessary training before appointing him as the captain of the Dead Spirit Company. Hyuku agrees, stating that he was thinking the same thing. Ganma calls Siolhui and asks if he agrees. Siolhui replies affirmatively, and Ganma announces that as of this moment, he's temporarily making Siolhui a member of the Dead Spirit Company. Turning to face Siolhui, he tells him to thank him and assures him that he won't let him down. The system notifies him that he has been appointed a member of the Silver Spirit Unit's Dead Spirit Company. For three days following his battle with Hyuku, Siolhui focused on restorative breathing and allowed his body to recover. He sat in his room, engaging in meditation to promote healing. Checking his status screen, he confirmed his current position as a member of the Silver Spirit Unit's Dead Spirit Company. His health and Kai points stood at 1 lakh 10,000 and his fighting power at 4 lakh points. Opening his eyes, he noticed the presence of the AI shadow. Reflecting on the eye's words look at him up there, hiding like a coward. He knows what he lacks more than anything insatiable desire, see all we contemplated his own state. He realized that initially he possessed an unquenchable desire, but now he questioned whether it still remained. Taking a mirror, he checked that he had four lives. Strangely enough, with each additional life gained, his sense of desperation seemed to diminish. He pondered the idea that he lacked the courage to confront his fears. Meanwhile, he placed his mirror on the table and wondered about the significance of the three-year training period. Recalling Gonma's statement that successful completion of three years of training as a member of the Silver Spirit Unit would lead to his appointment as the captain of the Silver Spirit Unit's Dead Spirit Combat, he set a personal goal to surpass the AI within that time frame. He aspired to reach a level that even the AI could not have imagined. As he undressed, the system prompted him with a notification. Would he like to create a save point? Yes or no? He pondered the meaning behind creating a save point, realizing that this window appeared during significant moments or when important events were on the horizon. The thought crossed his mind that something major might be about to happen. He decided to save his progress for now. The system then notified him of three options for year 95 of the Heavenly Calendar, Chapter 2. Either one presented by Ganma, 2 to 15, or the final appointment after failing the test at the Martial Arts Academy. Another option was Year 95 of the Heavenly Calendar, Chapter 3, to one successfully became Ganma's foot soldier. There was also the bonus story, three-year period of explosive growth. Reflecting on his experiences, he noted that the record of his life had always provided detailed descriptions of his current situation. He wondered if this three-year period of explosive growth presented an opportunity for him to enhance his abilities. Scratching his head, he decided he'd better head out. He planned to wash up and do some training to clear his mind, quickly putting on his clothes and rushing out of the room. The system then notified him to decide on his schedule for September of the year 95 of the Heavenly Calendar. The options were, to learn martial arts, accept a mission, act as a foot soldier, or scout the area. As he knocked on the door, he pondered the significance of September in the year 95. Wondering about the number 36, he reflected that it was part of the promised three-year growth period. Realizing it must refer to the current month, he opted to choose the Learn Martial Arts option. The system then asked him what he would like to learn, presenting options such as the Silver Spirit Unit's main school, tracking theory, understanding blood channels, and training instructor lessons, all at the beginner level. He thinks since he's a member of the Silver Spirit Unit now, the first thing he should learn is Ilwanso School. The system notifies him that he will now learn Ilwanso School, the Silver Spirit Unit's main school. Jiakpa opens the door, looks at him, and asks if he is Siolhui. He confirms that. He introduces himself, saying his name is Jiakpa. He's Siolhui's commander and training instructor of the Dead Spirit Company. Today, he's going to start learning at the Silver Spirit Unit's main school and tells him to come with him. Siolhui agrees and follows him, while the system notifies him that he has learned Ilwanso school imitation. He wonders how he managed to learn all that on the first day. The system again notifies him that his understanding of Ilwanso school has increased. Jiakpa looks at him and thinks he can't believe what a quick learner he is. The system notifies him again that his understanding of Ilwanso school has increased, and his understanding of Ilwanso school has also increased. 
He thinks he has already learned to imitate his sword aura and his ill one so school level has increased, with imitation also reaching an elementary level. He feels like he is sitting in his room, feeling dazed and looks around, wondering what happened. He just left the room a minute ago, yet somehow, he has memories of training for the last month. The system notifies him again about the results of one month of training. His health and Kai increased by 10,000 and his fighting power increased by 20,000. Then he checks his status screen to confirm the addition of points. He becomes happy and asks if he is dreaming, while the status window notifies him about the list of martial art techniques. Soso -so School Imitation, Jiaxu School, and Chojuk School reach an intermediate level, and Ilwanso School reaches an elementary level. That's now, along with the four elemental techniques, wind first steps. After a while, he gets up and goes to Jiokpa's gate, knocking while the system notifies him to decide on his schedule for October of the year 99 of the Heavenly Calendar, 2 over 36. The options are to learn martial arts, accept a mission, act as a foot soldier, and scout the area. He laughs and says he's not dreaming, thinking that a month had passed by in the blink of an eye, and his head was crammed full of information. He starts his practice again while thinking about the hierarchy of the Black Martial Arts Academy, the Silver Spirit Unit's training institution, as well as its leaders and the names of the different companies. What's most impressive, he thinks, is that he learned an actual martial arts style. The Ilwanso school he just learned consumes his lifespan in exchange for boosting his Kai, like most other schools of the demonic martial arts. However, it's based on his primordial life force. He thinks it is akin to the state of Kai balance, achieved when the five elements of the pure school are all in harmony with each other. He sits down and engages in meditation, gathering all five factors, fire, earth, water, metal, and wood. He thinks it may be a type of demonic martial art, but it is different in that it is based on a standard martial art technique. That's why it is even better because, depending on how he masters it, he could avoid being consumed by the demonic nature. This is absolutely incredible while he clenches his hand. He thinks in the past, he had to study and train all by himself, but now he can learn directly from his master Jiokpa. He thinks this will help him get stronger even more quickly, while the system notifies him about the option to learn martial arts. He thinks alright, let's keep going, while the system again shows him a notification about the results of training. His health and Kai increased by 50,000 points, and his fighting power increased by 90,000 points. Now he has learned the advanced Ilwanso school. He becomes excited to see this and checks his status screen to confirm the addition in his health, Kai, and fighting power points. He thinks he can't believe how quickly he's growing, and it only took three months to get this much stronger. He again runs towards the door, and the system notifies him to decide on his schedule for December of the year 95 of the Heavenly Calendar, 4x36, showing options again. He chooses again to learn martial arts. He thinks this is fun, he loves getting stronger, and he wonders how much more powerful he could get in one year. He thinks he's going to learn everything he possibly can in one year. The system notifies about learning martial arts, tracking theory, understanding blood channels, and training instructor lesson, all are at the beginner level. He thinks now that he has learned everything about the Ilwanso school and it's not on the list anymore. The system notifies him that understanding blood channels is at the beginner level, and he will now learn the Tome of Secret Pressure Points. He thinks this time, he'll learn this while the system notifies him that he has learned the Tome of Secret Pressure Points, Pressure Point Hand Technique, and also learned the Life Force Draining Technique. He has completely mastered understanding blood channels advanced. He thinks it only took three days to learn everything about blood channels while the system informs him that his tracking theory is at the beginner level, and he has learned stealthy tracking steps. The system notifies him that he has learned distant hearing, allowing him to hear even faint sounds from a great distance, and he has learned night vision, enabling him to see clearly in the dark. The system notifies him again that he has learned how to make scent masking water, a technique that allows him to erase his scent. Another notification tells him that he has learned how to use bone melting acid, and he has obtained one bone melting acid. He has completely mastered tracking theory advanced. He looks at these notifications and becomes excited, saying that's perfect. In just one month, he learned all about blood channels and tracking theory, while the system notifies him that it's December 31st. He thinks there's still one day left and says he sees that. Well, in that case, he'll just practice using the skills he has learned. 
He does some exercises while he walks towards the table and opens a box, saying, seeing this jade chest reminds him of the treasure hunt at the martial arts academy. He states that it is empty and he had hoped there might be some red bean jelly at least. The system notifies him, asking if he would like to combine his martial arts school, and he decides whether or not to proceed. He inquires about the meaning of combining them and opts for the affirmative. The system informs him that no martial arts scrolls have been detected, instructing him to insert martial arts scrolls, while he scratches his head and contemplates. He asks what martial arts scrolls are, and if the system wants him to place the scrolls in the chest, stating let him see as he scans his surroundings. He thinks there they are, as he takes a pen and attempts to write something. Thankfully, he still remembers all the martial arts styles he has learned in his past lives, so he proceeds to write them down. After writing some books, he places his pen on the table and remarks, so there's the Sohui school, Soso school, Ilwonso school, Chojuk school, and wind from the four elemental techniques, totaling six in all. He agrees, saying all right, let's try this, and attempts to place all the books in the box. The system notifies him that the characteristics of the techniques differ, instructing him to consult the characteristic matching chart and upgrade information. The characteristic matching chart indicates that wood corresponds to fire, earth to metal, and upgrades maintain the same characteristics in order of wood to fire to earth to metal to water. He observes that it does work, but the characteristics are different, and he will have to apply the five elements. Flipping through the books, he concludes that the Sohui school and Soso school both represent extreme yin techniques, sharing the same water characteristics. The system notifies him that the Sushinsu school is complete and the corresponding book floats in the air, prompting him to believe that he has succeeded. The system further notifies him that he has obtained the Sushinsu school and its imitations. Reflecting on it, he thinks that the Soso school makes his hands immune to sword strikes, while the Shin in Sushinsu means body. He contemplates, realizing that essentially, the Sushinsu school renders his entire body invincible against sword strikes. Considering that he cannot fully utilize it at the moment, he acknowledges that even at the imitation stage, he can likely generate ice crystals nearly as potent as a sword aura. He remarks that this is even more robust than the four elemental techniques, despite having learned it just now. Checking his status screen, he notes that his health and Kai have reached 170,000, and his fighting power has soared to 840,000. Pleased with the significant boost in his fighting power, he is eager to continue. While he contemplates, the system notifies him that the Blazing Fist School is complete. He thinks that this technique is a combination of the Jiaksu and Chojuk schools, and for some reason, they transformed into a hand technique when he combined them. He believes he can now unleash even more firepower than before with less Kai. The system then alerts him about the list of martial arts techniques, indicating that the Ilwonso school has reached an advanced level, the Sushinsu school is at an imitation level, and the Blazing Fist school is also at an imitation level. Additionally, the four elemental techniques, specifically the wind first steps, are mentioned in the notification. He reflects that he couldn't connect any of the other techniques, but he is content with this achievement. Seated, he checks his status screen. He acknowledges that these windows, which first appeared when he was on the brink of death, were like a beacon of hope on a dark night. He describes it as a new year, lighting the way forward. Standing up, he takes out his sword, and the system notifies him to decide on his schedule for January of the 96th year of the heavenly calendar, 5 over 36. Once again, he chooses to learn martial arts. The system then prompts him to specify what he would like to learn. The scene shifts to the Black Martial Arts Academy, where he observes that it is the place where members of the Silver Spirit Unit undergo training. The academy is situated in a villa surrounded by forests and mountains, with the training grounds located within the academy. The system notifies him that starting today, he will be under the tutelage of the training instructor, and the lesson is at a beginner level. Considering this, he thinks there's only one thing left to do. Jiokpa taps his sword on the ground while he checks Jiokpa's status screen, revealing that he is the training instructor of the Silver Spirit Unit. His health points are 6,060,000, his Kai is at 5,060,000, and his fighting power is 8,050,000. Jiokpa remarks that now he sees why Ganma was so eager for him to begin training. He adds that this course usually takes even the most gifted member of the Silver Spirit Unit over three years to complete, but he managed to finish it in just four months, expressing his genuine impression. 
Meanwhile, Siolhui expresses her gratitude and Jiakpa comments that with his current abilities, he won't be of any help to Ganma. In response, he asks what Jiakpa means by that. Jiakpa then inquires if he has any idea how powerful Chinma's disciples are. He denies having that knowledge, and Jiakpa proceeds to explain that the first disciple, Salma, has four supreme demon masters, including himself in his circle. Mahu, the second disciple, has two supreme demon masters along with dozens of advanced demon masters. The third disciple, Aryong, also has two supreme demon masters, but that's not all. Jiakpa adds that he doesn't know how she managed it, but Aryong even persuaded several hermit masters to emerge from seclusion and support her. The system notifies him that in the demon cult, a person starts at as low level, then reaches the level of supreme master, followed by advanced demon, and finally supreme demon. He contemplates that a supreme demon master is a level of mastery known as a warrior god or demon god. He reflects that Zhang Yonggu of the Mount Hua sect was one of those masters and inquires about Ganma. He responds that unfortunately Ganma doesn't have any. Surprised, he asks why no one has attempted to attack Ganma yet. He explains that it may surprise him, but it's because of Ganma's abilities and questions whether he has heard of divine death stars. He queries if Jiakpa is suggesting that Ganma is a divine death star and contemplates that divine death stars are a type of divinely blessed warrior that appears only once in a millennium. He believes they are capable of learning any martial art style and possess the energy to become a warrior god without any training. Furthermore, he thinks that if someone with the divine death star in them learns demonic martial arts, they become unstoppable. Jiakpa adds that he heard that divine death stars don't usually live past the age of 16. Jiakpa acknowledges that it's true, most of them die young because they can't control their madness. He explains that this is precisely why Chenma chose Ganma to be his fourth disciple, and he is different from most divine death stars. In response, he suggests that he could potentially become the head of the demon cult. Jiakpa, however, denies this possibility, stating that he can't go against fate. A divine death star will always remain a divine death star, and if Ganma decides to unleash all that internal energy, it will mark the end for him. Although this power is even greater than that of a supreme demon master, Ganma's destiny is to release all that power once and then succumb. He reflects, understanding that the symbol signifies Ganma's possession of the infinite power of a divine death star. Jiakpa asks if he comprehends the implication, emphasizing that he is not nearly strong enough to assist Ganma in any way. He concurs with that assessment and questions the purpose of the Silver Spirit Unit. Jiakpa responds, stating that their goal is to distort information to bring down the other disciples. Afterward, they will do everything in their power to destroy the last remaining disciple. He places his sword on Xiaohui's shoulder and declares that a single fight will determine everything. He reflects that they understand they can't win, so their objective is simply to ensure that they do not lose. This predestined plan is realistic and has a sure outcome. Jiakpa advises him not to be disappointed, emphasizing that one never knows how things will unfold in life. However, for now, he needs to become much stronger if he wants to be the captain of the Dead Spirit Company. Jiakpa states that he will train him to reach the next level. He agrees and states that he'll do whatever it takes, he reflects that this is not the time to worry about the future. All that matters right now is to get stronger at all costs. Jiakpa suggests that they begin his training, and he agrees. The system then notifies him that to become a supreme master, day one is complete. He needs to accomplish the following within one day. Three options for slashes horizontal slash, vertical slash, and diagonal slash are all at zero out of 10,000. Similarly, three options for stabs upper stab, mid stab, and lower stab are also at zero out of 10,000. After a while, Jiakpa taps his sword and instructs him to begin, questioning if that's all he's got. The system then notifies him about either day one or day two. He realizes that unlike with the other options, time didn't speed up for this training. Moving on to day three through day six, he thinks about how he's supposed to complete all this in one day if he doesn't execute each move perfectly. The numbers didn't increase during his practice. From day 13 to day 14 he practices diligently, but the required total isn't reached. Days 16 and 17 come, and he becomes tired of the intense practice. The system then notifies him that horizontal slash, vertical slash, and diagonal slash have all reached 10,000, and similarly, upper stab, mid stab, and lower stab have also reached 10,000. 
Overjoyed, he screams that it's finally over. However, the system immediately presents another task, indicating that swingling has been unlocked and side swing, forward swing, and back swings are all at zero out of 10,000. Frustrated, he exclaims God damn it and starts practicing again. On day 29, he receives a notification that side swing, forward swing, and back swing have all reached 10,000 out of 10,000. He throws his sword to the floor, sits down, and feels exhausted. He declares that he's done, and the system notifies him that the required number has increased to 20,000. Finally, on the last day, after one month of training, the scene shifts to the office at the Black Martial Arts Academy, where training administrator Beek Rong observes that, as he can see, they're quite exceptional. He ventures to guess that within six months, they will all be supreme masters. Jiokpa acknowledges that they have all received excellent scores, and regarding Yoram, Jiaksong, and Yangjin, he is not surprised as their prowess is well known. While looking at a document, Jiokpa adds that he didn't expect to see Soryong on the list as well. Beek Ryong remarks that Soryong is extremely clever and could easily fool most people. That's probably how she passed the martial arts academy. He mentions that Ganma surely knows how to spot talent, and he agrees with that. He then inquires about the guy who's supposed to be the next captain of the Dead Spirit Company, asking if he's still in meditation. The other person confirms that he is and mentions that he's been meditating constantly for the last three months. Jiakpa asks if he hasn't been doing any training, and he denies that, expressing a personal opinion that he's not sure if appointing someone like him as the captain of the Dead Spirit Company is a good idea. Jiakpa questions the reason for this, and he responds that he's only been practicing the basic techniques for the last several months. He believes that he should have moved on to training for unexpected variables by now, asking if that isn't what Jiokpa was hoping to teach him. Jiokpa concedes that he has a point, but notes that the boy isn't just mindlessly repeating the same techniques. He adds that the boy is circulating pure Kai through his whole body every time he executes a move, staring at him. He thinks that pure Kai circulation is a technique that circulates internal Kai to deliver more power to the tip of his sword. Beak wrong remarks, so that's what he's been mastering this whole time. Jiokpa responds that he's not sure yet if he's mastered it, but it's time to go and find out. They both go out and walk toward him, who greets them. Jiokpa asks if he has finished the assignment he gave him, to which he responds that he hasn't started it yet. Jiokpa questions why not, and he replies that he doesn't see the point opening his eyes. Jiokpa then inquires about what he has been thinking, and Siolhui responds that he was wondering whether a perfect technique really exists. Jiokpa asks if he found the answer, and Siolhui states that he answers that it's impossible. Jiokpa probes further, asking what makes him think that he has found the answer. Siolhui explains that he was thinking about how to make the impossible possible. Jiokpa follows up, asking how to make the impossible possible, and Siolhui agrees, saying that although there's no such thing as true perfection when considered from a broader perspective, he realizes that it's not necessarily incorrect either. He adds that depending on how he interprets its meaning, perfection itself can either be the wrong answer or the right answer. Jiokpa asks if he is saying what he thinks he is, and he contemplates that he's not sure if he realizes it, but he has reached a state of profound realization. Paradoxically, the closer he gets to perfection, the more distant it becomes. He perceives it as a type of awakening experienced by warriors who have opened their eyes to a new world. Siolhu yawns and thinks that it's also the path to even greater heights. Jiokpa instructs him to get back in the lotus position. He questions why, and Jiokpa replies, hurry, keep repeating the moves that appear in his mind, don't mind. He agrees, and Jiokpa grabs his shoulders, performing some magic skills. He feels he's practicing and thinks to look at that, sensing a bright light on his forehead. He continues his meditation for some time, and when he gets up, he feels a significant surge of power in his body. The system notifies him that his stats have increased significantly. Siolhui, a member of the Silver Spirit Unit's Dead Spirit Company, sees his health points increase to 530,000. Then it increases again to 1,030,000. His Supreme Master Fighting Power also increases to 5,060,000. The system congratulates him, stating that he has become a Supreme Master. The system notifies him about the results of the training, indicating that he has become a supreme master and has unlocked full circulation. Siolhui sits in his room, checks his status screen, and contemplates the meaning of being a supreme master, finding it odd to refer to himself in such a manner. 
The system once again notifies him that he has acquired untraceable phantom steps, the foot technique of the four elemental techniques, and an advanced mind-reading passive skill. The list of martial arts techniques reveals that the Ilwanzo school is at a perfect level, the Sashinsu school and the Blazing Fist school are at intermediate levels, and the four elemental techniques, specifically wind, are at a beginner level. He reflects on this experience, realizing that acquiring powerful martial arts techniques isn't the sole path to becoming stronger and that the key to strength isn't necessarily found in techniques alone. Meanwhile, he considers the importance of training, acknowledging its significance. However, he realizes that he also needs a fundamental understanding of the nature of martial arts itself. He believes that only by comprehending the true essence of martial arts can he ascend to even greater heights while reclining on his bed. The next morning, upon waking up, he receives another notification from the system. It prompts him to decide on his schedule for February in the 96th year of the heavenly calendar, 6 over 36. Three options are presented, accepting a mission, serving as a foot soldier, or scouting the area. Considering that he has already learned all available martial arts techniques, the option related to martial arts has disappeared. Consequently, he decides to explore the possibility of accepting a mission. The system once again notifies him and asks whom he would like to accept a mission from. The options include Ganma, the fourth disciple of Chinmei, Hyukku, the head of the Silver Spirit Unit, the training instructor of the Silver Spirit Unit, the doctor who healed him, or the servant who brings him meals. He contemplates whom he should choose, deciding to start with Ganma, the fourth disciple of Chinma. He approaches Ganma, who remarks that he has become much stronger, but still lacks a few necessary skills for the mission at hand. Ganma suggests coming back when he's fully prepared and walks out of the room. Reviewing his status screen, he realizes he can't pursue that particular option yet. He opts to challenge Hyuku, the head of the Silver Spirit Unit. Upon meeting Hyuku, he learns that news of unlocking full circulation has reached him, which is impressive. However, Hyuku explains that it's not the right time for a mission and advises him to return in about a year. Feeling a bit confused, he looks at the status screen again and decides to proceed with the last option. The system notifies him that he has chosen the servant who brings him meals just as Nosum knocks at his door, inquiring if he is inside and requesting permission to enter. He replies, sure. Nosum enters, bows down, apologizes for disturbing him, and expresses a desire to discuss something. Siolhui inquires about the matter, reflecting that he works as a servant for Elder Bikon Sama. He recalls that he brings him his meals every day, and his name is Nasim. The story unfolds in Siolhui's mind as he thinks about it. One day, Bikon Sama stopped by the deputy commander's office, but the deputy commander was absent. While waiting for his return, Bikon Sama discovered a martial arts tome in the brazier that had not yet been burned. After contemplating what to do, he decided to discreetly pass it on to his assistant on the outside. Siolhui believes that this is where the problems originated. The assistant, upon receiving the tome, suddenly disappeared, indicating that he likely left the demon cult and ventured to the central plains. Siolhui inquires how the assistant managed to escape without anyone noticing, pondering whether he might be deceased or if the deputy commander could have disposed of him. Nosum responds that the assistant's body hasn't been found. He clarifies that Elder Beacon was the one in the deputy commander's office, not his assistant, making it unlikely that there's a connection between the two. He further explains that Elder Beacon's hands are tied, because if the deputy commander intentionally left the tone there, acting could lead Elder Beacon into the deputy commander's trap. Siolhui speculates on whether there is a power struggle within the demon cult. Siolhui then questions why he is sharing this information. He explains that if the elder's assistant left the demon cult, someone needs to find and eliminate him. He asserts that it requires an independent individual who can act freely. He concludes that this is why he approached Siolhui. Essentially, they need someone whose disappearance wouldn't be noticed if they were to die during the mission. He considers that having no one backing him means there are no loose ends to tie if something were to happen to him. He interprets someone free to act on their own as someone the demon cult doesn't care about. Despite these thoughts, he decides it doesn't matter much. He then asks if he will receive something in return for capturing this guy. Nosum confirms that indeed Elder Beacon mentioned that Siolhui could ask for one favor whenever he needs it. Siolhui finds the proposition acceptable, thinking that one favor from a current elder in exchange for bringing this guy back is a good deal. 
The system notifies him that he has accepted a mission from Nosum, the servant. The mission is to retrieve Elder Beacon's top disciple, Mubi Iyam, who has run away to Chingi with a martial arts tome. Siolhui must bring him back within one month to complete the mission. The reward for mission completion includes earning the trust of Bikan Sama, who is 31st in the demon cult's hierarchy. Additionally, the reward includes the tome of camouflage, a key, and a map to the cult leader's secret book 1 over 4. Siolhui reflects on Mugi Iam, who was referred to as the elder's top disciple by Nasim, despite being called an assistant. Recognizing the value Elder Beacon placed on him, he decides that instead of resorting to killing, he should attempt to bring Mugi Iam back alive. Regarding the Tome of Camouflage, he recalls hearing about a special tome that allows one to change their face to resemble anyone they desire. Although he initially deemed it impossible, the inclusion of a map to the cult leader's secret book as part of the reward makes him consider its authenticity. As he processes this information, Sialhui realizes that Elder Beacon's top disciple Mugi Iam has fled to Chengar with a martial arts tome. Curious about Mugi Iam, he speculates whether this assistant might be a lecher. Nosum confirms this, prompting Sialhui to understand why Mugi Iam might have chosen to run away. He agrees to take on the mission and inquires if he should depart immediately. Nosum replies affirmatively but adds that there is one more thing. Sialhui asks him to reveal what it is. Nosum informs Sialhui that Elder Beacon wants him to accompany someone chosen for the mission, and since he knows Mugi Iam well, it would facilitate his escape from the demon cult. He suspects that Nosum is trying to keep an eye on him and asks for the identity of the chosen companion. Checking his status screen, Sialhui finds that the selected person is Siakdu, a carpenter with health points of 3 lakh, 0 kai, and advanced awakening fighting power at 90,000. His characteristics are listed as an unidentified developmental disorder. As Siakdu enters and introduces himself, he observes his advanced awakening despite having no kai, pondering whether he is naturally gifted. He inquires about their plan, and Siakdu responds that they are constructing a frontline defensive wall near the demon cult entrance. They plan to inform others that they are going out to select quality lumber, providing an opportunity for them to sneak away. Siolhui agrees, remarking that it sounds good, and requests Siakdu to lower his voice, thinking it is too loud. A notification appears, informing him that he will now be taken to Xianyong, the capital of Chingi. They embark on a horse cart, and Siolhui laughs, finding the situation quite convenient. The system then issues another notification regarding the mission to retrieve Elder Beacon's top disciple, Mugi Iam, who has fled to Chingi with a martial art tome. The mission must be completed within one month. Siolhui questions if he understands correctly that, regardless of Mugi Iam's altered appearance, Siakdu can still identify him. Siakdu confirms this, explaining that he has known Mugi Iam since childhood, and while he may change his appearance, he can't alter his habits and behavior. Siakdu expresses strong disdain, stating that Mugi Iam truly deserves to die. He clenches his hand, revealing that Mugi Iam consistently insulted him calling him an ugly freak and mocking his lack of attractiveness to women. Siakdu becomes emotional, asserting that being single his whole life is not a crime. The cart's driver slides the window open and announces that they have arrived. They disembark from the cart and observe the numerous people around. Siolhui reflects on the fact that he hasn't been outside like this in ages. Recalling his past, he remembers being born as a butcher's son, losing his parents at a young age, and enduring physical abuse from someone who accused him of stealing dumplings. This person would often berate him, calling him a thief for supposedly stealing his dumplings, claiming to have seen him staring at them. In the midst of struggling to survive in this difficult world, one day, some people approached him while he was eating dumplings. They inquired if he would like to learn martial arts, and that single question was enough to entice him to join the demon cult. At that time, he had no idea that there were even worse things in life than being a butcher's son. Siakdu calls out to him from behind, bringing him out of his thoughts. Siakdu then asks what he is thinking about. He groans and gurgles, expressing his hunger and contemplating what to eat. Siakdu shares the same sentiment, suggesting they go to the Debong Inn for a meal. They both agree and head to the Debong Inn, where they encounter two groups of people preparing to engage in a fight. Siakdu inquires about the situation, asking what's going on. The team leader of the Pichin school asserts that he anticipated this day, while the team leader of the Gujung school expresses a similar sentiment, stating he has been waiting for this moment. 
he challenges the Peachin school team leader, daring him to repeat his claim about being the best, leading to both of them grabbing each other's collars. The Peachin school team leader maintains that Peachin school has the best sword technique in Chingi, while the Gujung school team leader vehemently disputes this, asserting that the Gujung school is undoubtedly the best. Observing the argument, Siakdu notes that they are disputing which sword technique is superior. He agrees and suggests they focus on getting something to eat, emphasizing that everyone seems excited about the impending fight. After a while, they sit at a table to start eating lunch. A lady suggests to Miss Ju that they should intervene to prevent a potential mess, expressing concern about the possibility. Miss Ju dismisses the idea, stating that those guys are cowards who will only threaten each other for a bit before backing down. As she enters the scene, Miss Ju remarks that they're just acting tough to impress someone, finding it pathetic. Siaktu compliments the food, mentioning Captain Siolhui. Miss Ju listens to him and observes the ongoing dispute. Siolhui agrees and asks if Siakdu just had three pieces of meat at once. Siakdu laughs, and he responds by asking if they have any money. Siakdu pauses and admits that he spent all their money on the carriage, reassuring Siolhui not to worry as he will handle it. Suddenly, a small arrow comes from behind Siakdu, but he skillfully catches it with his chopsticks. Siakdu instructs someone to take care of it. In response, he pretends to have pain in his hand, claiming it's broken and crying loudly. This causes everyone to stop fighting and turn their attention to him. Meanwhile, he turns toward them and walks, inquiring about the person responsible for the arrow while holding it. The team leader of Peachin School demands to know who he is and instructs him to stay out of the situation. Siakdu forcefully taps his foot on the floor, creating a flash that startles everyone. Siakdu repeats his question, asking who threw the arrow. The team leader of Gujung School denies being the culprit, and the Pichin School team leader also denies involvement. Siakdu seizes the collar of one of them and insists they confess. He explains that the individual responsible will not only have to pay for their food, but also for disturbing his master, though he decides to let that slide for the moment. Both of them agree to these terms. He also stands up and approaches, suggesting it's enough and they should leave. Siakdu covertly gives him a thumbs up. He laughs and Miss Ju applauds, they both direct their attention to her. Checking her status screen, he learns that her name is So I Ju, the granddaughter of the Lord of Mangemson Manor. Her health points are 80, Kai is 0, and she has two characteristics, foot soldier missions. She greets them as warriors and he examines her characteristics, contemplating something. Siolhui ponders the significance of two missions and wonders if it means he can accept missions from this woman. He decides it's best to be polite to her. She approaches him, expressing admiration for the impressive display, noting that those two are respected swordsmen in the area. Siakdu, curious, asks about her identity. She deems it rude not to introduce herself, bowing down and stating her name is So I Ju. She further adds that she is the granddaughter of the Lord of Mangemson Manor. So I Ju mentions that she doesn't mean to brag, but everyone in the area knows who she is. Siolhui finds her so beautiful that she practically glows, understanding why the two swordsmen are desperate to impress her. He looks at both the Gujung school and Pichin school representatives. Not only that, but she is also the granddaughter of Mangemson Manor, the wealthiest estate in Chingi. Siakdu blushes while smiling, and Siolhui thinks that her name alone is enough to dominate the area, not him though. Meanwhile, Siolhui inquires about the reason for the granddaughter of Mangemson Manor being present. She responds that seeing masters like them arouses her curiosity and sparks a desire to get to know them better. He being modest, states that they might not be as nice as she thinks. She counters, claiming that the more talented a person is, the rougher they are around the edges. Siolhui finds her charming. Observing Siolhui, she remarks that he doesn't seem to be from the local area, and judging by his clothes and accent, he doesn't appear to be from the central plains either. She then asks about his origin, mentioning Xiaojiang. He thinks she doesn't even suspect that they might be from the demon cult. However, he confirms and states that he is from around there. Now that they have acquainted themselves a bit, he politely asks if he could request a favor. Curious about the favor, she acknowledges that they have only just met. Turning to the other side, she agrees to hear him out at least and smiles. After a while, Siolhui sits with her, and they have tea. He expresses that, not being familiar with the area, they could really use her help. Moreover, being from Mangeman Manor, she probably has easy access to information. He asks if she could look into their whereabouts for them. 
Taking a sip, she asks what he knows about this person. Sialhui replies that he's a lecher who's wearing a disguise, so he can't describe what he looks like. The only thing they know for sure is that he's obsessed with women and uses the demonic martial arts. He also takes a sip of tea. She takes another sip and reflects that Qingyi, though considered a part of the Central Plains, is so far away, yet people here are just as afraid of the demon cult. She secretly smiles. Sialhui looks at her and mentions that he has the ability to hide his demonic nature, making it difficult to spot him unless he uses his powers. She then asks if the two of them also possess such powers. Sialhui shakes his head, affirming that they do not. He thinks he doesn't want to turn her against them, especially those who are not supreme masters on the verge of becoming ultimate masters, capable of controlling even the most minuscule flow of demonic energy. He contemplates that such individuals will not notice that he has reached the level of a supreme master. In his view, Siakdu is just a really strong guy without any Kai who happens to be in the demon cult. She places her cup on the table and agrees to do the favor for him, asking what they can do for her in return. Sialhui smiles and mentions that there seems to be a misunderstanding, this is more of an offer than a favor. He suggests the scenario of a soldier capturing a dangerous demon warrior with the help of Mangemson Manor, asking if that isn't reason enough to proceed. He thinks that, if she doesn't accept his offer, he won't let her take control, and he'll simply go elsewhere. She responds, saying she'll help him, and he thinks that if that's the case, let him see if he can push her a bit further. He then asks if she could assist them with two more things, they need a place to stay and plenty of food. He inquires whether that would be possible. She replies that merely providing those things won't be enough. She adds that she will ensure they also have plenty of money for their travels and constant access to information and maps of the surrounding areas. She asserts that she'll help him in any way she can. He looks at her, thinking how assertive she truly is, something else altogether. She continues, making a condition that, in exchange for her help, he must promise to stop by Mangemson Manor again after catching this lecher. She explains that this is her only condition. He thinks this likely has something to do with her assigned duties, and there's definitely no reason to refuse. They both take another sip of tea, and he agrees to her condition. After a while, they all go out and reach near a building. Sialhui thinks that this place is enormous, and there's no doubt they're the wealthiest family in Chingi. A person approaches and informs So Aiju that the master is looking for her. She asks why her grandfather is looking for her. The person replies that he has brought her fiancé, Mr. Jiang, with him. She states that she has already told him several times that she has no intention to marry yet and inquires about his current location. The person responds that he's in Guanji Pavilion. So Aiju turns to Xiaohui, saying that her servant will show him to his room and she requests him to get some rest. She mentions that her grandfather is looking for her, so she better go see him. Sialhui agrees, and she walks towards Guanji Pavilion within Mangemson Manor. In Guanji Pavilion, Grandfather Wanjul Ju, the founder of Mangemson Manor and a man of significant wealth, sits with Mayan Jiang and laughs. He apologizes for keeping him waiting, explaining that So I must have gone out for a bit. Mayang Jiang remarks that it is no trouble, as he only asked to arrange this meeting because he was eager to see her. She arrives and mentions that if she knew he was here, she would have come sooner. Wanjil Ju, her grandfather, points to her, saying that there is his granddaughter. She admits that she didn't expect him to show up completely unannounced like this. He looks at her and apologizes for his impertinence, explaining that he just really wanted to see her. Wanjil Ju adds that it's not the only reason. Myong Jiang finished up some business for him, and they ran into each other on his way back. He invites them to have a seat. The scene shifts to a guesthouse within Mangemson Manor, which serves as Sialhui and Siakdu's accommodation. Sialhui contemplates how on earth he is supposed to use this, and the system notifies him about the Wind God Technique chart for the four elemental techniques. The Wind Technique is labeled as N for neutral, with indications that it has 4-5x speed. He reflects that he was so obsessed with the idea of perfect techniques for a while that he forgot to practice. Pondering what neutral and 4-5x speed mean, Siakdu asks what he is thinking about. Sialhui replies that it's nothing and in turn asks why he is eavesdropping by the door. Siakdu explains that everyone is talking about Soaiju's fiancé, and he is just curious about what they're saying. He adds that he thinks his name is Myung Jiang. Siakdu suggests that everyone is going to take a look at him and asks if Sialhui wants to go see him too. 
Siolhui questions why he would want to see him. Siokdu replies that he knew he would say that as they say, he's from the Mount Hua sect, but he bets he's not much of a fighter. Meanwhile, Siolhui exclaims did he just say he's from the Mount Hua sect? He confirms that and says that's what he heard. Siolhui gets up and walks out, asking him to lead the way, and he asks what's happening. Siolhui says he wants to see this man. On the other side, Wanjilju says now so I Ju, let me introduce them properly, and adds that Myung Jiong is a disciple of a powerful family from the Mount Hua sect. He describes Myung as faithful, loyal, and a respected martial arts master. She takes a sip of tea and acknowledges that it's very impressive. However, based on what she has heard, he has caused a great deal of problems with his carelessness and impatience. Moreover, there are many rumors about him being exceedingly fond of women. Wan Zhulju responds that he's sorry to tell her this, but heroes and warriors are always surrounded by women. As long as they enjoy themselves in moderation and don't mistreat them, it's not such a big deal. Myung Jiang observes that her immature behavior has created rumors that trouble her, assuring her that there will be nothing to worry about in that respect. He pledges on his family's name and smiles. He then inquires if those people are all here to see him, noticing some people standing there, including Siolhui and Siokdu in the crowd. Siolhui asks him about his father's health, whether he has gotten any better. Myung Jiang replies with a pardon and then affirms that yes, although it will still take some time for him to fully recover. Wanjil Ju questions what it means, mentioning that he received a letter from him a month ago, stating that he would be better soon. Myung Jiang confirms, saying that's right, and he's sure he'll be fine. He gets up, apologizes, expressing concern that he may have made her uncomfortable by showing up so suddenly, and decides to take his leave for today. Wanjilju asks where he is going, and he replies that some important business just came up. He walks out, leaving Siolhui to ask Siokdu if he is really from the Mount Hua sect. Siokdu confirms that apparently he is, and Siolhui questions why he asks. Siolhui mentions that Myung Jiang said before that if he ran into Mugi Eam, he'd definitely recognize him. Siokdu replies of course, how could he forget him? Siolhui asks really and adds that it looks like camouflage really does exist. The system notifies Siolhui about Mugi Eam's details, indicating that he's the first disciple of Elder Bikan, an awoken master. His health points are 4 lakh, his Kai is 1 lakh, 20,000, and his fighting power is 1,068,000, plus boost. Siolhui reflects that perhaps the real Myong Jiang has already been killed, and Mugi Eam stole his body. He acknowledges that he knew he was strong, but he didn't expect him to have 1,068,000 fighting power. He wonders about the boost thing and contemplates what he should do, expressing a bit of concern about that additional ability. However, he concludes that he shouldn't have any trouble defeating him. Siolhui looks at them as they walk towards him, pondering whether So Ju's two missions for him would disappear if he used the demonic martial arts while fighting Myung Jiang. Now that he knows who he is, he contemplates whether he should follow him and take him out later. He also looks at him, prompting Siolhui to wonder if he suspects something. Siokdu asks Siolhui if he thinks that's him, asserting that he would recognize him right away if he saw him. He adds that it's not him, swearing to it. Myung Jiang looks at them and comments that those two sure stand out. So Aiju interjects, stating that they're her guests. Myung Jiang inquires about whose guests they are, noting that warriors like them are not seen often in Chingyi. So Aiju questions if they seem that powerful to him, and Myung Jiang walks towards both of them, asking if that's not quite what he meant and questioning if that's right, gentlemen. Siakdu mentions that they are kind of special, explaining that Miss So Aiju was so impressed by their martial arts skills that she invited them to Mangemsen Manor. Siolhui thinks Siakdu is trying to figure out what type of martial arts style they use, but it doesn't matter to him as he's already using a non-demonic restorative Kai breathing technique. So Aiju steps forward, expressing her disapproval and asking Myung Jiang what he thinks he's doing to her guests. He appears startled and apologizes, stating that he simply wants to greet them and see what they're like. He asks for forgiveness from the gentleman. Siokdu laughs it off, saying that it's all right, and he adds another apology. Siolhui looks at Myung Jiang and thinks that he doesn't like him. He questions whether he really doesn't expect them to find him. He contemplates the idea of following him and dealing with the situation quietly, but he changes his mind. Siolhui asks if he believes he can remain hidden forever by concealing his demonic nature and assuming another identity. Myung Jiang asks what he means. 
see all who states that he should have been more careful. While he might fool most people, he grabs his sword, asserting that he can't hide from him. He points the sword towards Myong Jiang. The system notifies him of a golden opportunity, revealing that he has discovered Mugi Eum's weakness and asks how he would like to respond. Everyone becomes scared to see this, while the system notifies him about the mission notice window being activated, with mission notices including reference information and warnings. He checks the details of the reference information. He can't learn camouflage unless he captures Mugi Eum, and if he uses the demonic martial art in this situation, he can't accept missions from So Ju while acting as a foot soldier. If his actions result in the death of any standard martial arts warriors, he can't accept missions from So Ju while acting as a foot soldier. Checking the warning notification details, he learns that if Mugi Eum does not use the demonic martial art, he will be branded an enemy of the world of martial arts, and if Siakdu dies, he will fail this mission. He thinks about the meaning of reference information and warnings, pondering whether this mission has conditions. He finds it to be a nuisance, realizing that he'll have to avoid using the demonic martial art. Meanwhile, the system notifies him about options. Attack, use martial arts, open the toolbox, and approach the enemy. He thinks there's no need to give up on a mission with a potential reward. He'll just be careful and choose the option to approach the enemy. He faces north, preparing for the fight, runs toward the enemy, and quickly stabs him, throwing him away. The system notifies him about a bullseye, and Mugi Eum's health points decrease by 70,000, while his Kai falls 10,000 points. He realizes that Mugi Eum used a Kai force field, causing his sword to bounce off before piercing him. He had hoped to debilitate him. Wanjilju warns that they're fighting, with the man attacking Myong Jiong, and urges them to run as it's too dangerous to stay. Siolhui smiles, thinking it doesn't matter, while the system notifies him about a golden opportunity, revealing Mugi Eum's weakness, and asks how he would like to respond. He thinks he guesses it's because he's so much more powerful than him, but this window keeps appearing while the system notifies him about Bullseye. It indicates that he dealt over 40,000 damage to Mugi Eum, another attack dealt over 30,000 damage, and then 50,000 damage. He attacks him again and again, and Mugi Eum's health points fall to 1 lakh, 20,000, and his Kai drops by 3,000 points. Mugi Eum says wait, stop, don't kill him, and Siolhui reassures him that he won't kill him. He has a lot of questions for him. Mugi Eum asks what it means. While some guards arrive, saying they have to save Mr. Tubing Jiang and urging them to hurry. Siolhui asks if they are warriors from Mangjimsen Manor, finding them annoying. He thinks he can't kill these guys, while the system notifies him that Mangjimsen Manor Warrior No. 1 has found his weakness, and Mangjimsen Manor Warriors No. 3 and No. 11 have found his weakness. He attacks the warriors and kills them one by one, thinking he's not sure if it's because he doesn't intend to fight them. But these windows keep popping up. He considers it such a nuisance that he has to keep evading their attacks without killing them. And also, he lost track of where Mugi Eum is because of these guys. Siolhui gets irritated and shouts that he's really starting to piss him off. He punches the floor with full force, and a flash appears, throwing them all away. The system notifies him that he's using a combat-style turn-based fight simulation. He thinks that stopped those windows from appearing, and it's nice and quiet now while he looks at them falling down on the floor. Siakdu asks if he's okay and runs towards him, while he thinks right, he can get Siakdu to attack them for him, and he probably doesn't have any restrictions on him as he does. Meanwhile, Siakdu inquires if is that guy just now Mugi Eum, and he responds be quiet. He will deal with these guys, but don't kill them. Siakdu agrees and proceeds towards them. Reflecting on the situation, he realizes that, in terms of turn-based fighting, he cannot use it again as he has already utilized it once. He acknowledges that he has forgotten that he cannot change combat styles at will, and it seems like nothing is going right today. He also recognizes that he cannot check people's stats in simulation mode and concludes that he'll have to search for him in the crowd himself. Hoping that he doesn't get away, he wonders if this is what the boost ability does, observing him in a worse condition as he performs some magic skills. He contemplates that this is essence absorption, a daimonic martial arts technique that undeniably absorbs the essence of others. Mugi Eum likely used it to attempt healing, and Siakdu asks where he is hiding, scanning his surroundings. Believing Mugi Eum has camouflaged himself, he realizes he cannot check people's status windows. 
an old man approaches, stating there are more bodies nearby, and directs Siolhui saying warrior, he went that way towards that lady. Siolhui inquires about their location, and the old man points in a direction, saying that way. Siolhui presses for an exact location, but the system prompts him to jump. His phantom leaps up a building while he questions why he appears. Moving forward, he surveys the area, locates Mugiiam, and asks where he is, considering the possibility of him disguising himself as an old man. He questions where Mugiiam thinks he's going and reflects on the inconvenience of searching in the absolute worst place, wondering if he changed his appearance again. He sprints to locate him and inquires if she has seen him. Spotting a lady with a baby, she denies it, and he seizes her hand, gazing into her eyes, realizing she is not the one. She hasn't mastered the daimonic martial art. He discerns from her pulse that she lacks any Kai. Bewildered, she questions his actions, looks around, and ponders the whereabouts of Mugiiam. The system alerts him to jump, and his phantom emerges, leaping once more, when suddenly, someone attacks him, slashing his belly. Clutching his wound, he questions who attacked him, realizing it wasn't the woman behind him. He considers if it was the baby she was holding, looking at the infant and cursing, wondering if camouflage allows such deceit, making it challenging to apprehend him. Wanjilju intervenes, commanding an immediate halt to the attacks, instructing everyone from Mangemson Manor, not just the warriors, to sit down. He directs the captain to confirm if there is indeed a demon warrior among them. The captain verifies and states that they keep discovering women and children dead, their essence drained. Wanjilju informs Soaiju that the young man is seeking a lecher who can disguise himself. She confirms this, mentioning that he revealed this information when they first met. He then inquires about Mr. Jong's whereabouts. The captain responds, stating that he disappeared during the altercation with that man, although he doubts it was Mr. Jiang. At this moment, an individual arrives and questions both Xiaohui and Siokdu about their identities. Xiaohui, puzzled, asks what's happening, observing two Siokdu figures who grab each other's collars. One claims the other is a fake, while the opposing figure asserts that he is Mugi Eum. Seiju queries the warriors, asking if one of them is the man he's searching for and what happened to Mr. Jiang. Siolhui suggests that Mr. Gina Jiang is likely dead, and the lecher he was pursuing disguised himself as Mr. Jiang. One Siokdu urges to kill the imposter immediately, while the other insists he is the one who should be eliminated, labeling him a lecher. Observing Mugi Eum, he thinks that he definitely knows what he's doing. He believes Mugi Eum managed to find the exact same clothes as Siokdu, and is even imitating his voice. He understands why Elder Beacon accepted him as a disciple, acknowledging him as an incredibly gifted mimic. So Aiju inquires about their next steps, stating they need to identify which one of them is his friend. However, he responds that they don't need to know, expressing that there seems to be a misunderstanding. He doesn't care which one is the real Siokdu. He'll beat both of them until the real one reveals himself. He instructs both of them to brace themselves, throwing his sword and cracking his fingers. Mugi Eum's face changes, and Siakdu notices it, declaring that he just saw it, he is a demon in human form. Mugi Eum reveals his true face, laughs, and admits that he might have been too obvious this time, stating that it doesn't matter. He seizes a cactus hunter, asserting that he's not running away anymore, and declares that this time will be different. Siolhui perceives that Mugi Eum's daimonic energy feels stronger than before, surmising that he must have temporarily boosted his power by draining the essence of those people. He asks if Mugi Eum wants to fight, to which Mugi Eum responds affirmatively. Mugi Eum rushes to attack, wielding his hunter and commanding Siolhui to die. The hunter inflicts some cuts on Siolhui, prompting Siokdu to intervene. Siokdu rebukes him, attacking him as well, and instructs him not to pass out yet, asserting that he is not done with him, laughing menacingly. He threatens that once Siolhui falls down, he'll mutilate him, cutting out his eyeballs and flaying the skin from his flesh, piece by piece. Siolhui, feeling the face scratch, remarks that it kind of stings and questions if that is really all Mugi Eum has got. Mugi Eum verbally abuses him and rushes to attack him again. A bystander observes and exclaims that it's demonic energy, identifying him as a demon warrior. The system notifies the observer about mission completion, stating that all requirements have been met to capture him. Siolhui, confident that he has captured Mugi Eum, smiles and seizes his hair, commanding him to die. He declares that it's his turn now, allowing Mugi Eum to hit him once. 
Siolhui retaliates with multiple attacks, causing him significant injuries. He pleads for it to stop, but Siolhui warns him to brace himself, stating that he's just getting started. He threatens to break every bone in Mugi Eum's face, then proceeds to slap him and tie him up. Siolhui questions if he still hasn't said anything. Siokdu sighs, acknowledging his toughness and the threats he endured. Mugi Eum spits on him and asserts that once he gets out of there, he'll be the first one he kills. Enraged, he verbally abuses him. Mugi Eum claims that amateurs like them won't get anything out of him, emphasizing that he has endured torture like this more times than he can count. Siolhui reflects on the recent past when Mugi Eum promised to reveal anything they wanted to know if they stopped hitting him. However, when Siolhui asked him to write down the contents of the Tome of Camouflage, his demeanor changed. He believes Mugi Eum thinks he's safe as long as he doesn't disclose his secrets. Siokdu slaps Mugi Eum, and Siolhui approaches, stopping Siokdu, questioning if Mugi Eum truly refuses to divulge any information. Siolhui contemplates that, although he may have completed the mission, he only received two rewards, a key and one of the four pieces of the map to the secret book of the cult leader. The lair of the cult leader is something he had never considered entering. Tapping on the floor, he states that he knows. On the way here, he thought of a surefire way to get a lecture to talk. Mugi Eum questions what he is talking about, and he responds that Mugi Eum will find out soon enough, delivering a kick. He screams in pain and trembles. Siolhui expresses regret, stating that he meant to hit both but missed one of them. He apologizes but promises not to miss this time, delivering another kick. Mugi Eum refuses and shouts that he needs those, not the family jewels. Siolhui unties him and sits on a chair, and Mugi Eum also takes a seat in front of him. Siolhui instructs him to write everything down, emphasizing not to leave out a single detail. Trembling, Mugi Eum states that he's doing his best and begins writing. Siolhui asserts that he has no sympathy for someone who preys on other people's essence. Mugi Eum responds that he doesn't want to do it. It's the only thing he has ever learned. He expresses a desire to start over, explaining that he is tired of serving the demon cult and wants to live a life like that of the Gai Jiong. He questions his belief that someone who has learned essence absorption could live among ordinary people. He further asks why Mugi Eum ran away with the Tome of Camouflage. Mugi Eum pauses in his writing and asks for clarification on what he means. He specifies that he is referring to the Tome obtained from Elder Beacon. Mugi Eum corrects him, stating that the skill is called Shadow Deception, not Camouflage. He inquires about this and recalls Mugi Eum's baby transformation. He realizes that Mugi Eum managed to disguise himself using Deep Transformation, a Shadow Deception technique that changed his bone structure. After a while, he places the pen on the table and announces that he's all done. The system notifies him that he has learned Camouflage and Shadow Deception as well. Siolhui takes the book and contemplates that camouflage allows him to hide Adam's apple, change his voice, and even alter his hairstyle. However, he notes that it can't change bone structure or eyes. Siokdu approaches Mugi Eum, attempting to help him up, while Siolhui continues to examine the book. He realizes that with shadow deception, it is possible to change bone structure, explaining how Mugi Eum deceived people. Siolhui looks at the status window and observes the rewards received part of a torn map to the cult leader's secret book, one piece out of four, and the key to the secret book. He speculates that this is likely connected to the situation and acknowledges that he had never dared to attempt to enter the heavily guarded head of the demon cult's secret lair before. Meanwhile, he opens the door and goes out he thinks this is a technique that allows him to slip through even the narrowest of places, and with this technique, he might actually have a chance of getting in there. So Aiju asks if he is all done, and he confirms that, while Wanjilju asks if he doesn't know how to thank him. They would have been in grave danger if it weren't for him. He replies there's no need to thank him, he was simply doing his job. She asks if he could stop by here again sometime, and he looks at her status screen which shows her characteristics of two missions, foot soldier. He says sure, he has a reason to come back anyway. She asks what's the reason while he walks away and says never mind and says well, see her next time. She says for him to take care while the system notifies him to return and now returning home. He reaches his home and sits calmly while the system notifies him about mission completion and Beacon Sama now has an extremely favorable impression of him. He exhales and says it's over. 
The system notifies him that his health, Kai, and fighting power have increased by 10,000, and now his health points are 7 lakh, 10,000, Kai points are 1 million, 2 lakh, and 10,000, and his fighting power points are 5 million, 9 lakh, and 10,000. The system gives him another notification that 11 days have passed during the course of the mission, and he's free for the remaining 17 days. He thinks he still has some time left so he's free to do whatever he wants and thinks he should practice the new techniques he learned. He tries camouflage and shadow deception, transforming his face with Ganma, and then transforms into his baby version. He also tries Sushinsu school, ice rock skill, and uses blazing fist school and four elemental technique, wind while practicing with his sword. He also does some meditation, opens his eyes, and thinks he made really good use of those 17 days. He gets up and thinks his biggest achievement was finally learning how to speed up the elemental wind technique. Meanwhile, he thinks he hasn't completely mastered it yet, but he's excited to see how much stronger he can get. The system notifies him to decide on his schedule for March of the year 96 of the Heavenly Calendar and gives him the option to choose, accept a mission, act as a foot soldier, or scout the area. He thinks alright, time to keep going, while the system asks him who he would like to accept a mission from. Ganma, the fourth disciple of Chinma Hyuku, head of the Silver Spirit Unit, Jiokpa, Silver Spirit Unit's training instructor, or the doctor who healed him. He chooses the option, doctor who healed him, and the system notifies him that now he is traveling to Mount Na in the territory of the Central Administration's White Dream Palace. After a while, he reaches there and looks around, thinking if he is in the mountains now. He thinks this is Mount Na, the mountain near the Central Administration's White Dream Palace, and wonders what he is supposed to do here. The system again notifies him about receiving a mission from Dr. Hong, and a warning notification informs him that Dr. Hong is being pursued by the White Blood Company. He needs to find him before they do. He sees Dr. Hong running fast in the woods while some warriors follow him. Xiao Hui hides behind bushes and observes them. Hyoang says they have to get him and instructs them not to let him escape from the White Dream Palace. His team members agree with him, and Xiaohui also sneaks into that group. He thinks he managed to sneak in using camouflage, but he's not sure what to do now. He wonders how he is supposed to save Dr. Hong from all these people, just looking at who's leading them and checking his status screen. He knows that his name is Hyogwang, captain of White Dream Palace's White Blood Company. His health points are 1 million and 2 lakh, and his Kai points are 1 million, 8 lakh, and 10,000. His fighting power points are 4 million, 8 lakh, and 80,000, plus fighting spirit. He believes he surely possesses a significant amount of fighting power and deems the White Dream Palace as one of the main pillars of the demon cult. While he may only be the head of a single company, not even someone like Jiokmyong can begin to compare to him. He believes this task would be much easier if he were alone. As they all approach the dark forest, they inquire about the next steps, Captain. Hyogwang instructs groups 1, 2, and 3 to go left, groups 5 and 6 to take the cave, and the remaining group to accompany him in searching the mountain. Everyone agrees on this plan. Xiaohui observes his surroundings and realizes he is in group 6, noticing Dr. Hong running into the cave. He attempts to check the doctor's status screen, but is unable to, thinking it's good that he's in the cave. He and his group enter the cave when someone informs them to wait, as there's another fork. They are advised to split into two rows if they encounter another fork and then divide themselves into two groups again. The individual states that he will wait here as he cannot escape from this cave anyway. He insists they ensure a thorough search of every square inch, a consensus is reached and they proceed forward. Siolhui is grateful that he has ended up in the group heading towards Dr. Hong this time. He plans to wait for the group to diminish in size before taking them out. Dr. Hong hides behind a rock, breathing heavily. He mentions that his legs won't move and apologizes to Lord Ganma while looking at some herbs. He expresses regret that he really wanted to give him this purple dragon herb. He hears the voices of warriors instructing his teammates to go one way while he takes the other. Dr. Hong squeezes the purple dragon herb, resolving not to let them have it. However, someone arrives, immobilizes him, and threatens that he wouldn't do that if he were in his position. If he makes a move, he'll be killed, and the assailant assures him that the death will be as painful as possible, demanding the plant and pointing a sword at his neck. Siolhui seizes his face, twists his neck, and kills him, leaving Dr. Hong looking at him in surprise. 
He reassures Dr. Hong not to worry, stating that he's on their side. He removes his mask and ignites his fire finger, and Dr. Hong recognizes him. Dr. Hong inquires about Xiaohui's presence, and Xiaohui responds by asking what Dr. Hong thinks. He mentions that he treated Xiaohui whenever he was injured and is now here to return the favor. Xiaohui sits with a knee down and urges Dr. Hong to tell him what's going on. He reflects on the situation, thinking that Hiaguang, the captain of the White Blood Company, stumbled upon a purple dragon herb during a training session. Aware that his superiors would never allow him to keep such a valuable herb, Hiaguang kept it to himself. Concerned about potential dangers, such as poison or an excessive amount of either yang or yin energy, he enlisted Dr. Hong to assess the herb. He believes Dr. Hong fled with the purple dragon herb, and since all physical assets within the demon cult belong to the central administration, Captain Hiaguang pursued Dr. Hong to eliminate the evidence. Siolhui inquires why Dr. Hong stole the purple dragon herb and if he didn't anticipate the consequences. Dr. Hong explains that purple dragon herbs are extremely valuable, and he wants to present them to his master, Lord Ganma, even if it means risking his life. Xiaohui comprehends his motive and asks how he can assist him. The system notifies Xiaohui that he has received a mission from Dr. Hong. The mission details state that Chai Zio Hong, the central administration's doctor, is being pursued by the White Blood Company. Xiaohui needs to show that Dr. Hong can be trusted. If successful, he will attract the attention of Man Jiopsura, the head of the White Dream Palace. The mission rewards include a purple dragon herb, an elite-level special pill, and a part of a torn map to the cult leader's secret book 1 over 4. Observing his status window, Xiaohui contemplates the task of attracting the attention of the head of the White Dream Palace, a powerful figure even within the central administration. He wonders if taking out the White Blood Company, which works for him, would not enrage him. They hear some footsteps, and Xiaohui instructs everyone to wait there for a minute. Dr. Hong looks at him, and he, in turn, uses camouflage to cover his face. Another warrior arrives and asks if he found him, while the system activates the mission notice window, showing references that Dr. Hong will not provide the purple dragon herb unless he demonstrates his absolute might. The system also warns that if he takes too long to complete the mission, an even more powerful enemy will appear. He nods and mentions that he's going to venture further into the cave, inviting the warrior to join him. The warrior agrees. The system notifies Xiaohui again, emphasizing that he will fail the mission if Dr. Hong dies, so he must keep his identity a secret from the enemies to succeed. They both move forward, and the warrior asks where the person who was with Xiaohui is. He swiftly attacks him with bare hands, knocking him out, just as the rest of his team members arrive, stating that he is not going anywhere, and addressing Dr. Hong. Xiaohui observes them and acknowledges that there are indeed many of them. Nevertheless, he believes he can hold his own against them. One of the warriors inquires about his affiliation, to which he responds that he is obviously not from the White Dream Palace. The warrior remarks that Xiaohui seems naive and might not realize the severity of his situation. He questions whether he truly believes he can escape alive. The system notifies him about references indicating that Dr. Hong will not provide the purple dragon herb unless he demonstrates his absolute might. It warns that if he takes too long to complete the mission, an even more powerful enemy will appear. Considering the mission conditions, Xiaohui understands that he needs to achieve a decisive victory over these opponents. He checks the warning notification, emphasizing that he will fail the mission if Dr. Hong dies, and he must keep his identity a secret from the enemies to succeed. Meanwhile, he considers that, on top of everything else, he needs to keep his identity a secret using camouflage during the fight. The issue lies in the fact that camouflage consumes more mental energy than Kai, meaning he won't be able to unleash his full power. Rather than opting for turn-based fighting, he decides to go with this approach. The system notifies him that the combat style simulation has started, analyzing the number of martial art styles and the number of basic techniques. Another notification informs him that the analysis is complete, and he should continue. He activates the untraceable phantom steps, the third technique, and attacks them. Employing a lateral slash followed by sideways movement, he quickly slices through the warriors. Then, he utilizes the Sushinsu school for another attack, leaving Dr. Hong looking at him in surprise. Xiaohui employs frozen armor and attacks them with ice rocks. Dr. Hong observes, recognizing Xiaohui as an absolute master. 
he realizes that this is the man who will become the captain of the Dead Spirit Company. Dr. Hong reflects on his previous assumption that Xiao Hui secured the position through personal connections, not realizing how powerful he truly is. The system then notifies that the simulation mode is over. Xiao Hui marvels at the system's functionality, amazed at how accurately it guides him to defeat opponents. Despite being unable to use his full power due to the camouflage, he defeats them effortlessly. He tells Dr. Hong that there's no time to waste and suggests they get moving. Dr. Hong nods in agreement. Another warrior arrives and inquires about the whereabouts of the sixth group. Xiao Hui listens to this and turns his face to look. He curses, realizing that the others have sensed something is wrong and are heading over. He contemplates that taking them all out wouldn't be a good idea. The most significant issue is that he hears Captain Hiagwang's voice among them, with roughly the same amount of fighting power as he possesses. He remains uncertain about the meaning of the fighting spirit ability mentioned in his stats. Considering the possibility of defeating them all, he wonders about the consequences that would follow. He is certain that there would be repercussions. Dr. Hong acknowledges that it seems to be the end for him. He responds, acknowledging that he was never supposed to escape from this place in the first instance. Dr. Hong points out that with several company members dead, if he doesn't sacrifice himself, there will be repercussions for both of them. He retorts, suggesting that they don't know for sure. If he eliminates everyone, no one will find out. Dr. Hong counters, stating that the White Blood Company wasn't the only one who witnessed him running away. He contemplates Dr. Hong's warning that killing all these people would not only bring trouble for him, but also for Ganma. Dr. Hong is aware of the potential consequences. Offering a solution, Dr. Hong gives him the purple dragon herb and asks if he can promise to deliver it to Lord Ganma. He agrees, and the system notifies him that the mission is accomplished, and he has obtained the item's purple dragon herb and one part of the torn map to the cult leader's secret book 1 over 4. He reflects on initially thinking he failed the mission, only to discover that he succeeded. He questions whether he was supposed to help Dr. Hong escape. Dr. Hong suggests that he'll distract them while Xiao Hui makes a run for it. He recalls that the mission required him to earn Dr. Hong's trust. Dr. Hong instructs him to ensure that Lord Gunmer receives the purple dragon herb, then runs to attack them, shouting that he's over here. Captain Hiagwang orders them to grab and kill him. In the ensuing confrontation, Captain Hiagwang stabs Dr. Hong, killing him with one hit. Dr. Hong's glasses fall down and break. Xiao Hui witnesses this and turns to walk away. After a while, he returns and sits in his room. He exhales and expresses dissatisfaction with the way the mission played out. He wonders about what to do with the herb while looking at it. Reflecting on Dr. Hong's instruction to give it to Ganma, he contemplates whether it's necessary, considering Ganma is already dead. He ponders the idea that if nobody else knows about the purple dragon herb, he could eat it himself without anyone finding out. He also considers the possibility that Dr. Hong might have already informed Ganma about the herb in a letter. Deciding to try putting the herb in the toolbox, the system notifies him that the purple dragon herb has been stored in his toolbox. He decides to save his progress, with three options presented by Ganma. Year 95 of the Heavenly Calendar, Chapter 2 to 1, three options presented by Ganma, Year 95 of the Heavenly Calendar, Chapter 2 to 15, become Ganma's foot soldier, final opponent after failing the test at the Martial Art Academy, and Year 95 of the Heavenly Calendar, Chapter 3 to 1, successfully became Ganma's foot soldier, three-year period of explosive growth bonus story. He decides to save his progress, just in case Ganma is aware of the Purple Dragon Herb. Considering the need to be prepared for potential complications, he notes that he still has four lives left. After checking the status window, it notifies him that the progress has been saved. He thinks all right, let's see what happens, and proceeds to eat the purple dragon herb. The system issues a warning, stating that he requires an extreme young mental technique to absorb the purple dragon herb. He remarks on the bitterness of the herb and receives another notification informing him that without an extreme young mental technique, it takes one year to fully digest the purple dragon herb. Realizing he can't eat the herb yet, he notes the lack of information regarding the herb's effects and the specific extreme young mental technique required. He grabs his face, feeling a sensation of heat, and wonders if this is a side effect. It's too soon to determine whether it's good or bad. Contemplating his options, he questions whether he should wait a year or if it would be better to search for an extreme young mental technique. 
the system notifies him that Mangiopsura, the head of the White Dream Palace, wishes to see him and asks whether he wants to accept or reject the invitation. Wondering why this is happening all of a sudden, he senses a bad feeling about it as someone knocks on his door. He directs his attention to the door, thinking that the fact man Geopsura came all the way to see him must mean he found some connection between him and what happened to his subordinates. Considering this, he decides it would be better to refuse. However, the system responds that he cannot refuse. Irritated, he wonders if there's no way out of this situation and opens the door. Man Geopsura enters, greets him, and introduces himself as the head of the White Dream Palace. Simultaneously, his status screen notifies that he has Cooperation X2. Siolhui contemplates Man Geopsura, the head of the White Dream Palace, position 29th in the official hierarchy of the Demon Cult's eight palaces. He can't believe that someone of such power came to see him in person and queries the reason for Man Geopsura's visit. He wonders about the meaning of the Cooperation X2 and finds nothing indicating Man Geopsura's fighting prowess. Man Geopsura responds by asking why he thinks he's there. He admits he's unsure. Man Geopsura approaches and challenges him to guess, indicating that he has a feeling he knows the reason. He realizes this isn't good. Man Geopsura's question seems pointed as if he suspects Siolhui took the purple dragon herb. Despite having used a King Gong technique while fleeing and mastering tracks to an advanced level, Siolhui was confident that no one would find out. Man Geopsura urges him to take a guess. Siolhui is about to say something when the system presents him with two options, what the hell is he talking about? This is nonsense, or is there a problem? He ate the herb. The time for this selection is only 10 seconds. Meanwhile, he considers his options, finding them ridiculous and reminiscent of the choices that appeared when he first met Ganma, as he looks at the status screen. Unwilling to choose either of them, he reflects on how, so far, what appeared to be the worst options have often been the only way out of danger. With four seconds remaining, he thinks the responses are extreme, but despite that, he decides to go for it and chooses the first option. The system notifies him about his choice. Man Geopsera comments that he's quite an insolent young man, turns and walks out. Siolhui wonders if it worked. As Man Geopsera walks away, he mentions that sometimes, while he's walking around, he sees signs of a fever on his subordinates' faces. That symptom usually appears when someone is experiencing vertigo as a result of taking a special pill. Siolhui inquires about the meaning behind Man Geopsura's statement. Man Geopsura reassures him, saying it's alright, as he understands why he would want to conceal it. He acknowledges the herb's value and notices his red face, expressing concern about his well-being. Man Geopsura quickly turns towards Siolhui, grabs his neck, and causes him to scream. Man Geopsura proceeds to convey a stern message, emphasizing that if Siolhui thought he wouldn't be able to kill him, he would be sorely mistaken. He clarifies that he has not allied with any of Chinma's disciples, tightens his grip on his neck, and pierces him with his hand. Man Geopsura asserts that killing Siolhui won't cause him any harm. As a result, he becomes badly injured and vomits blood. The system notifies him that he has three chances remaining, returning to year 95 of the Heavenly Calendar, chapters 3 to 8, successfully becoming Ganma's foot soldier, the first year of the explosive growth bonus story. He sits in his room, looks around, becomes furious, and grabs his shirt. Expressing frustration, he mentions how he worked hard to earn those extra lives and how the mission messed everything up. Considering the visit from the head of the White Dream Palace, he reflects that since the visitor knows about the Purple Dragon Herb, maybe he should have chosen a different save point. He ponders the options, realizing the first one clearly wasn't the right choice. Deciding on the second option, stating that he ate the herb and asking if there's a problem, he believes it must be the correct one. However, he hesitates, considering other possibilities and the chance that he isn't supposed to eat the Purple Dragon Herb. Meanwhile, he contemplates whether he should bring the purple dragon herb to Ganma, as per Dr. Hong's request. Fortunately, he had placed the herb in the toolbox before saving his progress in his last life, giving him the flexibility to decide what to do with it. However, the prospect of giving it to Ganma raises uncertainties and gives him a headache. He considers the possibility that presenting the herb might not be the solution. Even if he chooses to give the herb to Ganma, he realizes that Man Geopsura might not be pleased to know that Ganma possesses it. In fact, he might sever ties with him to avoid a conflict with Man Geopsura. The system notifies him again that Man Geopsura, the head of the White Dream Palace, wishes to see him. 
he decides to focus on what he knows for sure at the moment and invites Man Geopsura in. He enters, greets him, and introduces himself as the head of the White Dream Palace. The system notifies him that he has Cooperation X2. Sialhui considers that the cooperation thing must have significance, although he is unsure about how it works. He speculates that it is probably related to the purple dragon herb and greets Man Geopsera. Man Geopsera remarks that he looks as though he is expecting him. He decides to try something and informs Man Geopsera that he has something to share concerning the whereabouts of the purple dragon herb. He makes up his mind to give the purple dragon herb to Man Geopsera instead of Ganma. In response, Man Geopsera asks about its location. Siolhui acknowledges the risk but states that he can't simply reveal its location to him. Despite the potential risk, he believes the cooperation thing might present a new opportunity, making it worth the risk. Man Geopsera questions if Siolhui is trying to bargain with him, expressing surprise and asking why he can't just disclose the information. Meanwhile, he acknowledges that Man Geopsura exudes a powerful aura, but he realizes he must confront that aura head-on. He decides to lure him onto the only battlefield where he can win. He informs Man Geopsura that Lord Ganma is also aware of the herb. Man Geopsura questions this, and he confirms it. Man Geopsura asserts that the purple dragon herb belongs to them in the first place and expresses the intention to explain everything to Lord Ganma, requesting Siolhui's cooperation. He thinks that this might be what the message meant and agrees, stating that he will give him the herb. Man Geopsura accepts and asks for its location. He shows him the herb, and Man Geopsura thanks him, takes it, and turns to leave, bidding farewell. After exhaling, Siolhui senses that something isn't right. He checks his status screen and notices Cooperation X2. He wonders why the message hasn't disappeared, considering that he just agreed to cooperate. He expected the number above his head to change or something. Man Geopsera pauses and adds one more thing, realizing he almost forgot something he needs from Sialhui. He asks what it is, and Man Geopsera replies that he seeks revenge for his dead subordinates. The warning appears, stating that the head of the White Dream Palace has found Sialhui's weakness and presents the question of how he would like to respond. The timer for this selection is only 9 seconds. He feels a sense of fear, questioning whether this option is not the right one either. He wonders what to do and whether he is going to die again, especially since he is up against the head of the White Dream Palace, who holds the 29th position in the Demon Cult's hierarchy. Normally, Sialhui would try to find a way to turn the situation to his advantage, but at this moment he can't even think of anything. The remaining time is just 5 seconds. Sialhui believes that it will be over in one hit, but he must make a decision. He pauses, thinking that if he's guaranteed to die, why did this window appear? In his previous life, he couldn't do anything to stop Man Geopsera from killing him, but this time around, a window has appeared. Considering the situation, Siolhui contemplates that there might be a slight chance of survival. Recognizing that whatever happens is beyond his control, he can only think of one solution. He opts to fight back, swiftly jumping out with a blast, reaching in front of Man Geopsera. Activating combat-style AI, his AI shadow emerges, and Sialhui believes that it's all up to him now as he confronts and attacks Man Geopsura. Observing his actions, Man Geopsura wonders what has gotten into him. Sialhui mentions that, as Man Geopsura may already know, he went easy on his henchmen. Man Geopsura inquires about it, and he explains that he could have killed them all but chose not to. Siolhui questions his own actions, considering whether taunting Man Geopsura in this way will work. However, he expresses confidence in the AI, believing in its capabilities, and commands it to go get him, running away. Man Geopsura looks at Siolhui, thinking that he's running away, and follows to launch an attack, using abusive language and commanding him to die. Siolhui is attacked and killed, receiving a notification that he now has two chances remaining. The system notifies him that he is now returning to year 95 of the Heavenly Calendar, chapters 3 to 8, having successfully become Ganma's foot soldier in the first year of the explosive growth bonus story. He sits in his room once again, expressing disbelief about what just happened. He reflects on how even the AI didn't know what to do, lying down on his bed. Considering that he briefly contemplated selecting a different save point with only two lives remaining, he regrets accepting such a risky mission. However, he ultimately chose to go through with it. Sialhui didn't like the idea of going back in time and having to redo everything, but he couldn't give up on a mission that had already used up two of his lives. 
he was determined to find a solution. He acknowledges that he shouldn't have kept this to himself in the first place. Not only did he not expect the head of the White Dream Palace to come to see him, but he also couldn't think of a way to persuade him. Sialfui considers that there's only one thing left for him to do he has no choice but to give the purple dragon herb to Ganma. He proceeds to meet Ganma, who inquires about his visit. Sialfui thinks that presenting the purple dragon herb is his only option. Ganma questions if Dr. Hong really asked him to give this to him. He confirms that unfortunately Dr. Hong did not survive. Ganma acknowledges this and expresses gratitude, assuring him that it will be of great help. Ganma places a hand on Sialhui's shoulder and assures him that even if the head of the White Dream Palace comes looking for him, he will ensure no harm befalls him. Sialhui thanks him, returns to his room, lies down on his bed, and reflects on why he overcomplicated something so simple. He curses the situation, considering it a waste of two lives. He believes this experience taught him several valuable lessons first, he shouldn't be greedy, and second, it's not necessarily a good idea to accept every mission that comes his way. Meanwhile, Sialhui rolls over in bed to another side and reflects that there is always danger lurking nearby, so he needs to act prudently. He states that he had better be more careful from now on. The system notifies him that Man Geopsura, head of the White Dream Palace, wishes to see him. He questions what this is now, and the system also notifies him that he can't refuse. Man Geopsura opens the door, enters and greets Sialhui, introducing himself as the head of the White Dream Palace. He gets up and asks him what brings him here, finding it hard to believe. Man Geopsura replies by asking why he thinks he's here, and he responds that he's not sure. He thinks that judging by the way Man Geopsura is acting, it doesn't look like Ganma has spoken to him yet. Man Geopsura then says to guess, mentioning that he has a feeling Sialhui knows why he's there. He thinks, wait a minute, he's saying exactly the same things he did in the life before last, and he has a bad feeling about this. Man Geopsura says he said, take a guess, while the system notifies him, what the heck is he talking about? This is nonsense. The second option is, he ate the herb, is there a problem, and again it's time, only 9 seconds. He gets irritated and thinks, why these options again, damn it Ganma, this isn't what he promised him. He thinks, did he return to the wrong save point? He looks at the status window and thinks, is there really no way around this, and he wishes he never got that damn purple dragon herb. He thinks it feels like he's stuck in hell with no way out, and time is running out quickly. He thinks, even if this leads to his doom, he might as well choose something different this time around. He thinks, go ahead and kill him. The system notifies him that he has chosen the second option that he ate the herb, is there a problem? Man Geopsura abuses him for this and asks that he realizes that he just signed his own death warrant and takes out his sword. Sialhui closes his eyes. Ganma reaches there and says here he is, and they both look at him. Sialhui feels relaxed to see him. Sialhui stands inside his room and looks at Lord Ganma and Man Geopsura, while he also stares at him and he walks away. Sialhui goes to Lord Ganma, and he replies there's no need to worry. He talks to him, stating that as long as he is here, he won't lay a finger on him. He thinks due to his outward appearance, he has forgotten just how powerful Ganma truly is. He thanks Ganma while bowing down. He is not sure whether it is because Ganma is a disciple of Chinmei or they made some deal, but either way, now he knows that Ganma is capable of persuading the head of the White Dream Palace and protecting him. Ganma says he really appreciates what he did for him and says, here, take this. The system window notifies him that he has obtained a divine weapon, the Ceremonial Blade of Awakening. The system window notifies him about the details that the Ceremonial Blade of Awakening is a ceremonial blade used by ancient cult worshippers during prayer. The High Priest used this particular sword. The system window notifies about the basic abilities of normal techniques, destructive power plus 70%. Extreme Yin Techniques, Destructive Power plus 50%, Extreme Yang Techniques, Destructive Power plus 50%, Four Elemental Techniques, Destructive Power plus 30%. It also notifies some additional abilities such as Combat Style Based AI, Simulation and Ability Boost. There are some special abilities such as Spirit Chaser Sealed Curse. He thinks this is incredible, and the destructive power of all his techniques increases. He thinks his fighting power and combat style abilities are stronger and he even received some kind of new special ability while holding that sword. He thinks this is practically a miracle. 
Ganma says that he managed to take the purple dragon herb from Dr. Hong and make it back alive even though he was surrounded by the white blood company and put his hand on his shoulder. Meanwhile, he remarks that the individual is obviously quite capable and deserves the sword, expressing high hopes for him. Xiaohui thanks him for his confidence and bows. Ganma assures him to keep up the good work and turns to walk away. After he leaves, Xiaohui opens the window, comes out holding the sword, and thinks it's a great sword, the kind a disciple of Chin Man might use. He senses tremendous demonic power in it, making him almost nervous as the sword shines. He considers combining it with the Wind God, his currently strongest ability. The system window notifies about the four elemental techniques, the Wind Technique Chart and the Wind God, with N indicating neutral and a 4-5x speed. He decides to try it out. The system window notifies that he is now using the Wind God as he practices with his sword, creating a huge cut design on the ground. He smiles, thinking that this sword is really something. The system window then notifies the decision on his schedule for April of the year 96 of the Heavenly Calendar, 8 by 36. The system window displays options for accepting a mission, acting as a foot soldier, and scouting the area. He contemplates that, considering his previous experiences and the potential reappearance of the status window, he is becoming weary of accepting missions. Additionally, he desires to refine his wind god technique and opts for training this time. The system window informs him that he has chosen the option of scouting the area. It then presents another option, asking where he would like to go, either home to Chinma's fourth disciple, the Garden of the Black Martial Arts Academy, or the rest area of the companies of the Dead Spirit Company. The system window notifies him that he is now traveling to the Garden of the Black Martial Arts Academy. He observes the flat terrain of the garden and realizes there is no need to worry about being spied on, making it an ideal location for training. He concludes that he is ready. The system window announces the decision on his schedule for September of the 96th year of the Heavenly Calendar, 13 by 36. Over the past five months, he has dedicated himself to continuous practice of the Wind God technique. However, despite his efforts, he has only managed to improve by 30%. He contemplates the lack of tangible progress and wonders what could be causing the issue. The system window notifies him that one year has passed and it is time to choose a new schedule. It presents several options including teaching, accepting a mission, acting as a foot soldier, and scouting the area. Intrigued by the new option of teaching, he realizes it means he can instruct someone. The system window also informs him that carrying out a mission with the company commanders of the Dead Spirit Company is unavailable. This prompts him to reflect on who the company commanders of the Dead Spirit Company are. He recalls Ganma's previous statement that he would be appointed captain of the Dead Spirit Company. He reflects on being informed that he must wait until he is ready and qualified to be appointed. He interprets this as an indication that he is ready now. The system window notifies him that he has chosen to teach the company commanders of the Dead Spirit Company, and he will now converse with Hyuku, the head of the Silver Spirit Unit. He proceeds to meet Hyuku, who expresses surprise that this day has come so soon. He mentions hearing that he completed his training for the Silver Spirit Unit's Dead Spirit Company and still can't believe that he managed to complete all that training in just one year. He acknowledges Lord Ganma's discernment in recognizing talent, affirming that he is now fully qualified as promised. He formally appoints him as the captain of the Dead Spirit Company, emphasizing that the members of the Dead Spirit Company are all outstanding warriors handpicked by Lord Ganma himself. Disciplining them is also part of his job, and he warns that if he can't keep them under control, he will have to resign from the captaincy. Meanwhile, the system window presents the option to save his progress, asking whether he would like to accept it or not. Contemplating the decision, he reflects on the experience that saving progress often foreshadows impending danger. Despite there being no apparent reason to save at the current moment, his curiosity prompts him to see the description that would accompany the save. The system window then notifies the successful saving of progress. The system window details the events of the 95th year of the Heavenly Calendar, specifically Chapter 2 or one of the three options presented by Ganma. It also outlines the events of the 96th year of the Heavenly Calendar, Chapter 4 or one of the successful Ganma's foot soldier's second year of explosive growth bonus story and the 95th year of the Heavenly Calendar, Chapter 3 or 1, successfully becoming Ganma's foot soldier three-year period of explosive growth bonus story. He finds it unremarkable, merely stating that it is his second year. 
the system window offers the option to view an episode. After contemplating for a while, he decides to choose yes. The system notifies him of the option of part one, focusing on the company commanders of the Dead Spirit Company. Yoram asks if he has already heard about it and mentions that someone has just been appointed as the captain of the Dead Spirit Company. The system window notifies him about Yoram and his details. He is the first company commander of the Dead Spirit Company, possessing a normal body. He is an awakened master, with health measuring 1,340,000. His Kai is 1,070,000, and his fighting power is 2,850,000, along with heightened senses. The window also displays related information, describing him as the longest-serving member of the Dead Spirit Company. Jioxong comments that they filled the position quickly this time. Now the system notifies him about Jioxong's details. He is the second company commander of the Dead Spirit Company, has a normal body. He is an awakened master, with health measuring 2,030,000. His Kai is 1,070,000, and his fighting power is 3,100,000. The window also shows related information, describing him as a member of the Silver Spirit Unit for six years and the oldest among the company commanders of the Dead Spirit Company. Soryong mentions that she has a feeling that this captain is nominated and the position is vacant. There are rumors that he has ties to Lord Ganma. Yoram inquires how she knows about all that. Now, the system notifies him about Soryong and her details. She is the fourth company commander of the Dead Spirit Company, with a normal body and an awakened master. She possesses coins love plus three, and her health measures 360,000. Her Kai is 1,020,000, and her fighting power is 1,120,000, along with clairvoyance. The window also displays related information, describing her as specially selected by Ganma from the Crimson Demon Palace, the central headquarters of the demon cult. If she falls in love with her, he will obtain three lives. She mentions that she can easily recognize her kind. Yongjin enters the room and declares that he doesn't care if he got the job through connections. If he knows what he's doing, people should listen to him, and if not, he'll kill them. The system window notifies Yongjin's details, indicating that he is the third company commander of the Dead Spirit Company. His body is normal, with health measuring 1,340,000. His Kai is 1,270,000, and his fighting power is 2,770,000, along with heightened senses. The window also provides related information, describing him as having the worst temper among the company commanders. Despite his fiery temper, he is honest to a fault and can only be subdued with sheer power. The system window signals the end of the prologue, and then announces the beginning. Siolhui contemplates his surroundings, wondering if this is the door to the room where the company members are. On another note, he considers various thoughts. The system window notifies that he has equipped the uniform of the captain of the Dead Spirit Company. He observes that his clothes are now different. The system window then presents the option for him to wear a mask. He considers that he might need to cover his face, possibly because of Soryong. Recalling their first meeting at the Martial Arts Academy and subsequent encounters after dying and coming back to life, he notes that he only ran into her again at the Heavenly Sun Archive. At that time, he was just a clerk working for the general manager, and he expresses a dislike for reminiscing about those days. He thinks that she might be suspicious if she saw him now, so it's better to wear a mask. The system window notifies that he selected yes and is now equipping the mask. Entering the room, everyone looks at him, and he wonders what's going on, questioning if time has stopped. The system window notifies him to try talking to each company commander. He contemplates talking to them, but finds that everything is frozen, and he cannot move. Moving toward Yoram, the system window notifies that he would like to read his mind, attempting to do so. He reflects on the fact that he hasn't learned any decent techniques since joining the Dead Spirit Company. All he is ever asked to do is patrol the area outside the barracks. He also contemplates how members of other units mock him for being a glorified errand boy. The captains of the Dead Spirit Company are supposed to teach him new techniques, but they haven't done anything for him. He desires to learn skills like night vision or scent masking water. Siolhui reflects that night vision is a technique that allows clear vision in the dark, which he learned when studying advanced tracking techniques. He wonders why the training instructor taught him such techniques and is now starting to understand. He believes that the intention behind his orders is probably for him to earn others' trust by teaching them new techniques. 
he also contemplates the feelings of the others. Reading his mind, it becomes apparent that he is weary of these mundane missions and desires something more exciting. He doesn't care about the identity of the new captain. He just wants to go out and engage with powerful warriors. He thinks that being assigned to special missions would be satisfying, and he would gladly devote his life to this job if given the chance. He believes that those individuals always stuck behind the other units might have obtained their positions through personal connections. He swears to God that the new captain better not be another incompetent individual. He wonders if he should have chosen a different disciple to work for, thinking that he might not have been humiliated like this. See all we observes that they seem to have a lot of complaints. Finally, the system window notifies the option to read Soryong's mind. The system window notifies that it is now reading Soryong's mind. Soryong sits near a window, and Seolhui stands near her. He wonders if being in this cult is really helping him at all and realizes it won't change the outcome anyway. He thinks he needs to find a way, otherwise the Lord of the Great Imperial Pavilion will kill them all within the next two years. She looks at him and says she wonders if that guy wants to escape from this hell as desperately as she does. He ponders who she is referring to. The system notifies that he has finished reading everyone's mind and is now returning to normal to continue. He sees many other warriors in the room and remarks that he is sure they have all heard about him. He clarifies that he does not intend to sympathize with them simply because he read their minds. He too spent ten years at the very bottom of the cult. He takes steps to move and says he does not know anything about them, and to be honest, he does not care. He reflects on suffering countless humiliations and injustices, which is why he knows full well how he needs to train these people to get them to listen to him. He declares that if they want him to teach them, fine, if they don't, they can just leave. Yangjin angrily asks what gives him the right. He declares that he is not done speaking. Yangjin turns and notices others. He suggests an idea, asking how about this. If anyone here has a problem with him, they are welcome to attack him right now. In fact, they can all attack him together if they like. Yongjin gets angry and moves to punch him, calling him an arrogant prick. The system window notifies that the combat style is turn-based, and the golden opportunity is that he has found Yongjin's weakness. It asks how he would like to respond, suggesting to approach the enemy. He swiftly moves back, holds Yongjin, and beats him to the ground. Everyone is shocked to see this. He remarks that now he is starting to understand why the Dead Bandit Company and Dead Emperor Company look down on them. He questions how anyone could take them seriously with a bunch of losers like him acting as company commanders. They all move together to attack him. He thinks fighting all four of them at once is a pretty big risk for him, but defeating them individually wouldn't make as much of an impression. The system notifies that the combat style is simulation. He decides to take them all out at the same time. The system notifies that it is now continuing. Soryong throws an arrow at him. He thinks to lean 15 degrees and perform a diagonal slash, moving aside to save himself. He hits her arrow with his sword, causing it to move toward Yoram and Geoxossing. Yoram moves aside, but it hits Geoxossing. He decides to take a half step backward to the left, while keeping his sword at mid-level. Siolhui quickly moves and points his sword toward Yongjin's neck. He asks what's wrong, questioning if he is surprised that a nobody like him is so strong, or if they think he just got lucky, or maybe they regret choosing this path in the first place. He reiterates that, as he said before, he does not care what they all think, and they do not have to come to his classes if they do not like him. It does not bother him one bit. He turns and thinks, to be honest, he just wants to get this over with as quickly as possible and focus on finding a way to survive. He approaches the door, moves back, glances at them, and thinks that still, there are eyes on him, so he needs to at least make a half-hearted attempt to teach them. He states, don't show up here tomorrow unless he is serious about learning, and slams the door. Outside the room, he breathes heavily and reflects on how he honestly feels. No matter how hard he has trained, he is nowhere near as strong as he wants to be. He would not have wasted his time with this if it were not for the status window. The system window notifies him that his likability among the company commanders of the Dead Spirit Company has increased. It provides information on likability among company commanders of the Dead Spirit Company. Yoram, first company, Jiaxong, second company, Yongjin, third company, and Soryong, fourth company. He contemplates likability and wonders if he is supposed to increase his likability this time. He assumes he will need to do this in order to carry out a mission with them. 
The system window notifies him that when his likability reaches 100%, the option to carry out a mission with the company commanders of the Dead Spirit Company will be activated. He thinks he knew it. After a while, he enters a room and removes his mask, examining it. He laughs and declares that this is the mask he was wearing. He reflects that, as always, everything begins smoothly, but he is certain another crisis will appear. Although this curse somehow turns crises into opportunities for him, it is designed in a way that ensures he will always have troubles to face, no matter what he does. He considers what his best option in this situation is and realizes he needs to get these people on his side and complete whatever mission they are assigned to as quickly as possible. He checks the system window, which shows that Soryong, the fourth company commander, is 10 over 100 curious. He states that he needs to find a way. Otherwise, the Lord of the Great Imperial Pavilion will kill them all within the next two years. He believes that's what Soryong was thinking when he read her mind and gets the feeling that this might be related to his future somehow. He needs to prepare himself for whatever might be coming. He believes he has to get stronger. After a while, the system window notifies that today they will begin teaching the company commanders of the Dead Spirit Company. He stands outside the room and wonders if anyone is here. He was pretty harsh yesterday. He opens the door and goes inside. Jioxong says he is late, they have been waiting for him. Yoram asks when they start. Soryoung says she is looking forward to their lesson. Seolhui laughs and looks at them. The system window notifies that on day one, they are teaching the Silver Spirit Unit's main school, the Advanced Ilwanso School. He thinks time is passing quickly again. The system window notifies that on day two, they are teaching the Silver Spirit Unit's main school, the Advanced Ilwanso School. It again notifies that on day three, they are teaching the Silver Spirit Unit's main school, the Advanced Ilwanso School. The system notified that after one month of teaching, his likability with Yoram increased by 4%, his likability with Jioxong increased by 6%, his likability with Yongjin increased by 5%, and his likability with Soryong increased by 10%. He sees the system window and reacts with a smile. It notifies that likability among company commanders of the Dead Spirit Company is as follows. Yoram, first company commander 14%, Jioxong, the second company commander 16%, Yongjin, third company commander 15%, and Soryong, fourth company commander 20%. He says this is kind of fun. He thinks it's the right time to keep going. The system window notifies him to decide on his schedule for October of the year 96 of the Heavenly Calendar and to inform the company commanders of the Dead Spirit Company. The system inquires about which area he would like to go to. The company commander classroom, the outskirts of the Black Martial Arts Academy, the joint training ground, the rooftop of the training center, and the garden behind the Black Martial Arts Academy. He thinks there are five places to choose from now, and there must be a reason for this. Nothing in particular has happened, but he bets there's a reason that these options appeared. He thinks he should try one of the new options first. The system notifies that he is now traveling to the outskirts of the Black Martial Arts Academy. He stands near a big tree, and Yoram comes out from behind the tree, asking what brings him here. He says he was just taking a little stroll and asks what Yoram is doing here. Yoram says he just came out to get some fresh air. He wonders why he is here. Yoram bows down and says anyway, he had better get going. He is looking forward to today's lesson. He moves to leave from there. Sialhui looks at him and thinks that it might be because his likability is still low. She notes that he's polite but doesn't seem interested in carrying on a conversation. She wonders why he was sent here, believing there has to be a reason, as the options he has been given so far have always had a deeper meaning. The system notifies him to choose which area he would like to go to, and he selects the company commander classroom. He looks up at the screen and thinks he might as well try each option. The system notifies him that he is now traveling to the joint training center and he is transported there. He sees Jioxong doing practices and thinks it's Jioxong this time. Jioxong looks at him and asks what brings him here. He responds he was just in the area and he thought he'd continue my training. Jioxong mentions that he sometimes trains here before class and suggests that he had better get ready for today's lesson. Seolhui thinks that this is starting to get on his nerves. The system window asks which area he would like to go to, and he selects the rooftop of the training center. It notifies him that it is now traveling to the rooftop of the training center. He is transported there and sees Yongjin. He looks at him and thinks, looks like it's Yongjin this time. 
Yangjin says, nice weather, isn't it? Yangjin looks at him and starts moving towards Xiaohui, who is sitting on a chair. Xiaohui asks why he is standing there and staring out into space all by himself. He is about to say something but stops and says, actually, never mind. He will tell him some other time. Xiaohui thinks it's another dead end. He believes that his likability appears to influence how they treat him. The system notifies that likability among company commanders of the Dead Spirit Company is as follows. Yoram 14%, Jiaxong 16%, Yangjin 15%, and Soryong 20%. He thinks he guesses they do not like him enough to open up to him yet. The system window asks which area he would like to go to, and the selected option is the company commander classroom. He thinks now there is only one place left among the two remaining options. He believes the company commander's classroom is probably the last option, so if they go to the garden behind the Black Martial Arts Academy, Soryong will likely be waiting for him there. He thinks, unlike the other company commanders, Soryong is not simply curious, she is actually interested in him. He wonders what will be different about her. To be honest, he also wants to see her. That one line that she said to him before played such a huge part in changing his destiny. He believes they will get out of this hellhole together. He knows that he is technically her superior now, but he does not care about rankings as long as he can see her in person. The system notifies them that they are now traveling to the garden behind the Black Martial Arts Academy. He transports there and sees nothing, thinking it's pitch black. Something feels different this time. Suddenly, he sees a flash of light, looks around, and says that's her he wonders what's going on. This is just like whenever he uses the AI. He confirms that it must be her. She's the only decent-looking girl here at the Black Martial Arts Academy. He sees her standing there with a bunch of people. A man says to Commander Kang that's her, that's the person who attacked them. They both look at each other. Commander Kang remarks that this worked out well. He was hoping he'd get to teach her a lesson someday. He gave her a bit of a break because she is pretty, but she has some nerve messing with the dead bandit company. He says, let's see how cocky she is after he is done with her. He sees another member and instructs him to take some guys with him and block off the area. The member agrees. She comments that she did not think the commander of the dead bandit company was such a coward. Then again, judging from the kind of people under his command, she guesses she is not surprised. Commander King says she can go ahead and run her mouth as much as she wants. Today he is going to shut that arrogant trap of his once and for all. He mentions that Commander Jayu is going to fight her himself. The system window notifies Xiaohui about how he wishes to increase his likability. Join the fight, continue watching, or ignore the situation. He sees the system window and thinks about what he should do. He believes that helping her would clearly be the best way to increase his likability, but he'd like to see how Soryong does on her own first. The system window notifies him to continue watching. Commander Jayu moves to attack her. Siolhui looks at them and thinks he's fast, but she did not respond quickly enough. She throws her arrow, but Jayu uses his sword to throw it away. She smirks, twirls and throws the arrow again toward her, and it hits Commander Jayu's back, causing him to almost fall. He gets up and is ready to attack her again, smiling. Siolhui thinks that her attack may have failed, but she's pretty good with that rope dart. The rope allows her to retrieve the blade immediately. She moves to attack him. The system window again asks how he wishes to increase his likability, join the fight, continue watching, or ignore the situation. He looks at the screen and thinks again. He believes he should probably just keep watching for now. It notifies him to continue watching. They both attack each other continuously. He observes their fight and thinks, that's Green Kai, an Ilwonso school technique, not bad at all. He thinks her sword skills are a lot better than he expected. She does not do anything out of the ordinary, but she has the kind of exceptional sword technique that he finds in people who have mastered the basics. He thinks something is not right, she's fighting a commander of the dead bandit company. Commander Jayu thinks Soryong may be strong, but he does not understand why that guy is having such a hard time beating her. He thinks it does not look like he's hiding his skills or holding back in any way. She asks what's wrong with him and says she knows he is stronger than this. The system window again asks how he wishes to increase his likability, join the fight, continue watching, or ignore the situation. Siolhui again looks at the screen and thinks this question keeps popping up. Something's suspicious here. He looks at Commander Jayu and Kang, thinking about what they are up to. Why is that guy they called Commander Kang not getting involved? 
He thinks he is sure the question will appear again if there's a problem. The system notifies him to continue watching. Commander Jayu moves his hand forward, using his power to attack Soryong. Siolhui is shocked to see this. She falls down, and he laughs at her. The system notifies that Yon Jayu, the fourth company commander of the Dead Bandit Company, has the health of 3 million, 3 lakh and 20,000, Kai 3 million, 3 lakh and 50,000, and fighting power of 2 million, 2 lakh and 40,000 with a plus 4% close combat boost. Commander Jayu once again moves to attack her. The system window once again notifies Siohui that Siak Kang, the third company commander of the Dead Bandit Company, has a health of 2 million, 1 lakh, Kai of 2 million, 3 lakh, and a fighting power of 2 million, 4 lakh. It also notifies that Soryong, the fourth company commander of the Dead Spirit Company, has a health of 3 million, 6 lakh, Kai of 1 million, 2 lakh and 20,000, and a fighting power of 1 million, 1 lakh and 20,000 plus clairvoyance. Siolhui thinks that if they were just toying with her, Soryong would not even be half as strong as they are. Commander Jayu moves to hit her, but she moves back to save herself. Siolhui sees him attack and thinks that judging from how well he uses his power and his fighting technique, he seems to rely more on physical weapons than on demonic martial arts. She thinks he is trying to inflict more external wounds than internal ones and believes Soryong can't possibly beat him. She contemplates the status window and wonders why it's not appearing, urging it to appear. Commander Jayu constantly uses his power to attack her and declares that she will be down for a while, mentioning that he twisted her blood channels and shook up the pure Kai in her body. She asks how, and he responds by asking how he is still unharmed or she questions him, asking how he managed to remain unharmed. He explains that there's something called the shifting technique which allows him to change the locations of blood channels at will. Their company differs from people like her who are always one step behind their opponent. She trembles and asks what he thinks the head of the unit will do when he hears about this. He replies that since she attacked their company first, they have every right to defend themselves. Besides, the head of the unit does not get involved in trivial matters like this. As long as he does not kill her, he won't care. Siolhui scratches her head and thinks. She asks about the captain, stating that the captain of the Dead Spirit Company will make him pay for this. He laughs and asks what she just said. Commander Kang also laughs. Commander Jayu says he must be referring to the new guy that Lord Ganma hired, but he bets she did not know that this guy used to be a lowly errand boy at the Heavenly Sun Archive. He mentions that her captains have all been fools, they always have been and always will be. Her current captain is just as useless as the rest of them. He wonders why she doesn't join their company instead and assures her they will treat her well. She rebuffs him, stating she would rather spend the rest of his life in solitary confinement than work for their people. He abuses her. She questions if he has already forgotten what he just said, mentioning that he told her the head of the unit doesn't care what happens as long as she isn't killed. He inquires and she teases him, declaring he is finished and sticking her tongue out. He places his hand on her head, saying fine, go ahead and bite her tongue. He claims he knew she still had some fight left in her, expressing relief that he blocked her blood channels just in case as she almost had him for a second there. He checks her eyes and asks if she can't move, or if she can. He contemplates what he should do with her now. Commander Jayu senses something, looks back, and asks who he is. Siolhui arrives and kills their man. She moves forward. The system window notifies him of choices to increase his likability, join the fight, continue watching, or ignore the situation. He sees them, and the system notifies him that he selected to join the fight. Siolhui walks towards them and asks them who they are. She calls him, and he wonders if he imagines that she always sounds so confident. At that moment, he senses a slight tremble in her voice. He thinks he can't stand seeing someone weak getting picked on like that. It reminds him of all the challenges he went through before. He thinks about likability, and this Gotham status window curses him with every new opportunity. He wonders if it's having fun messing with him. Siak Kang asks again who he is, and if he heard him while coming closer to him. He replies that one of them is going to die here. He states he will spare the other, not for any particular reason, but because he thinks it will be fun to let one of those morons tell their superior about this. He asks Siolhui what he is talking about. The system window notifies him, activating the combat style, which is turn-based. He thinks he won't kill him right away. Siok Kang says someone needs to teach this jackass a lesson, and attempts to punch him. 
The system window warns that Siak Kang has found his weakness and asks how he would like to respond by fighting back, defending himself, or running away. Meanwhile, he contemplates making him suffer. The system window notifies that he has chosen the option of fighting back. They begin to fight each other, attempting to block each other's punches. Seol Hui attacks with his blazing fist school skill, burning his hand, and he screams in pain. The system window notifies that he has executed a deadly strike. Siok Kang's health points are updated, decreasing to 580,000 in one hit. The system window informs them about the golden opportunity of discovering Siok Kang's weakness and asks how he would like to respond to the attack. Use martial arts, use the toolbox, or approach the enemy. He chooses to attack and punches him in the face. The system window notifies that he delivers another deadly strike, reducing Siok Kang's health points by an additional 990,000. He grabs Siok Kang's hair and tells him not to be such a baby because he is just getting started. The system window informs him that Yon Jiayu has found his weakness and asks how he would like to respond. He chooses to defend himself. Siol Hui turns to look at him while Yon Jiayu approaches and punches Siok Kang. The system also notifies him to defend himself. Siok Kang remarks that it wasn't very nice of him and asks if he would hit a teammate who's already hurt. Now, the system window notifies him of the golden opportunity that he has found his weakness and asks how he would like to respond. He chooses to attack him. He employs his powers and delivers punches to his chest, throwing him away. Seol Hui mentions that he just destroyed his energy center, so he can't use Kai anymore. He says this means Yon Jiayu is out of commission now, while Yon Jiayu trembles badly. The system window notifies about his health points falling to 1,330,000. Yon Jiayu gets up, abuses him, and runs to attack him. He slaps him so hard that he starts bleeding. Seol Hui then hits him on the head with the backside of his sword, stating that he'll keep struggling and he doesn't want this to be easy for him anyway. He taps on his head and says he is going to rip him to pieces. He repeatedly attacks his head and Yon Jiayu's health points fall rapidly, reaching an end. He walks away and thinks that he now feels a bit better. The system window notifies that Yon Jiayu's health points only remain at 320,000 out of 3,320,000. Soryong approaches him, and he looks at her, taking a moment to think. Then he says that from now on, he is going to have a lot more stuff to teach her. He turns his face to another side and adds that he doesn't ever want to see her humiliated like this again. It will be tough, but she will just have to deal with it. He states that she needs to learn to survive on her own as they both walk. She tells him she misses him. He takes a pause, looks at her, and asks her what she means, but she walks away without saying a word. The system window notifies him to congratulate that Soryong's status has changed from interested to friendly and her likability has increased to 40%. He becomes surprised to see this. The system window notifies him of the available areas and presents the option of the company commander's classroom. He says, all right, now it's time to go. The system window then notifies him that he is now traveling to the company commander's classroom. The system window provides information about part two, specifically the appearance of the captain of the dead bandit company as Byong brings their bodies to the captain. Byong mentions that he is too late and just as he is about to step in, some guy in a mask appears. The system provides details about Byong, stating that he is the vice captain of the Dead Bandit Company, with a health of 3,010,000, Kai of 2,400,000, and a fighting power of 4,900,000, plus a special technique of 7%. The captain comments that it's not Byong's fault, and he couldn't have predicted that. The system window provides information about Bigun, stating that he is the captain of the Dead Bandit Company. His health is 5,500,000, his Kai is 4,200,000, and his fighting power is 6,370,000, with Fury at 12%. Phantom observes them and thinks that the captain and vice captain of the Dead Bandit Company are very powerful. He recognizes those two lying there as Commander Jayu and Commander Kang, and this is after he fought them. Bigun comments on how pathetic it is. He simply told them to scare her a bit and then let her go because of the sudden appearance of that stranger. They didn't even get a chance to step in. He thinks they were going to step in and he thought they just wanted to scare Soryong and harass her. But now they're saying they wanted to step in and help her. Byong admits that it's his fault for not realizing how incompetent these two individuals are. 
He suggests letting him handle the situation while Big Un turns his face towards him and advises him to relax. He expresses doubt about their ability to convince Soryong to join them now. He deems it a shame that she is wasting her talent in such a pathetic unit. He believes they should get rid of the evidence. Emotional, Byung looks at both dead bodies and asks the captain what they need to do. The captain affirms and takes the dead bodies, walking out. Bigun inquires about a stranger in a mask and declares his intention to visit this person. The system window notifies him about day one, teaching them the Silver Spirit Unit's main school, the Advanced Ilwanso School. He observes that time is passing quickly, as usual. The system window notifies him about day 31, teaching them the Silver Spirit Unit's main school, the Advanced Ilwanso School. The system window notifies that he has completed this month's teaching, and the results of one month of teaching, such as his likability with Yoram, increased by 6%, his likability with Jioxong increased by 5%, and his likability with Yongjin increased by 4%. His likability with Soryong increased by 10%. Feeling excited, he reflects on the fact that his likability with Soryong has increased by 10%. The system window further notifies about the likability among the company commanders of the Dead Spirit Company. Yoram's likability is at 20%, Jioxong's at 21%, and both are interested in him. Yongjin's likability is at 19%, and he is curious about him. Soryong's likability is at 70%, indicating a friendly relationship. Siolhui arrives at his room door and questions why he was brought there. Observing that the door is slightly ajar, he opens it and enters the room. Ujin is in his room. He inquires about the person's identity, questioning who they are, what they are doing there without permission, and the reason for their presence. The individual introduces themselves as Bigun, stating that he is captain of the Dead Bandit Company. The system window provides details about Bigun, revealing him as the captain of the Dead Bandit Company with a health stat of 5,500,000, a Kai stat of 4,200,000, and a fighting power of 6,370,000, plus a fury boost of 20%. While Siolhui looks at him, Bigun asks if he can guess why the captain of the Dead Spirit Company is present, 